Block 3. And so the village sent a young man who still had his strength, and after a while, the representative returned with a single magician. Since the food delivery still hadn't been made, but the fields were cultivated, the magician told us he would try to grow provisions. But, the leaders said, these fields wouldn't bear crops well even if planted and cultivated, so they felt it was impossible. After all, the black things remained in the field, I was only vaguely aware at the time. These black things gathered when something was close to death. I didn't think any crops would grow in dead fields crawling with the black things. The adults in the village, also thinking it was impossible, bade the magician who had come to the barren fields, and the magician chanted something. Then crops grew from a field where not even a bud had appeared, and it became a field of mature wheat. The people of the village happily thanked the magician. Even if the food provisions were gone, if the fields bore properly, we'd be safe, we thought. I was also delighted to see the crops grow. But I gave the field another look and fell into despair. Because the black things were still gathered around the fields. Sir Magician, it didn't work. There are still black things in the fields. These fields are dead. Those words were the trigger. The magician realized that I was somehow able to see spirits, and recognized me as a magician. Once it was found out that I was a magician, the village was placed under the Lord's direct control. The people of the village thanked me, but some of them also blamed me internally and weren't happy. And even though their words were grateful, in my head I felt like everyone was blaming me. If you were a magician, why did you keep silent? If you hadn't hidden it, my child wouldn't have had to die. A woman told me, who had lost a child to the flu last year. Other people probably felt the same way. Apparently, I needed to go to school right away because of my age, so as soon as I'd met with the Lord, I left the village and hurried to the capital city. Meanwhile, they taught me reading and writing, manners, and many other things but I barely understood anything with such hasty teaching. When I got to the capital, I met the daughter of the greatest man in Genesis province, where I lived. Miss Katerina only gave me a few words of greeting, but she was very beautiful and a little scary. She told me in a cold voice, conduct yourself so as not to be an embarrassment as a magician of my province. I heard by rumor that she had a good head and good magic skills, and was strict on both herself and her subordinates. A girl nearly the ideal magician, and I thought her both cool and strong, but I was far from Miss Katerina's ideal of a magician, and furthermore a necromancer, so I couldn't meet her expectations. Even so, I wanted to be a cool girl like her. If only I were stronger. If only I had known I was a magician, even the children in my village might not have died. Nah, nobody needed a necromancer, anyway, because I couldn't help anyone. And when I started school, I couldn't even keep up with my classes, I still didn't even know my letters perfectly, but I was the only one who didn't know them. It was then that Miss Wu spoke to me, she was kind, smart, beautiful, and strong. She was a girl who embodied everything I longed for. Miss Wu was said to come from a pioneer village, the same as me, but she could read and write perfectly, and her manners and gestures were refined. Furthermore. According to the stories, she'd been able to cultivate fields and the make tools for her pioneer village without even the aid of magic. I soon came to love her. I wanted to be like her. When I was with you, there were always great, fun, new things happening. She also helped me get to know Miss Katerina, who was a little thorny, and she even told me she needed the power of my magic, which I had thought was useless. She said it was a wonderful power. I love Miss Wu. That said, Sir Alan also seems to like Miss Wu, and follows her at every chance, but I feel like it's bad for Alan, because he's not a good match for you. Miss Wu is amazing, if you're not a really wonderful person. For example, if you're not like Sir Henry, I don't think you're suited to be with Miss Wu. I'm just saying, if Miss Wu were to marry Sir Henry, she'd become queen. Ah, but since she's not a magician, she might only be a concubine. That's no good, but if anyone could become queen, it would have to be Miss Wu. Thus, the queen of this country must be Wu. She is amazing. If that happened, I would do anything for Miss Wu. For the queen. Because I want to be near Miss Wu. For that, I would do my best at anything. Because when I'm close, I feel like I can be as strong as Miss Wu. I want to be that strong. I want to be like Miss Wu. 
I'm sick of this. I really don't want anyone else to get hurt because I'm so weak. Today, I felt sick and had to go lie down in the infirmary. While I was sleeping, I seemed to have peered back into the events of my past. I felt a little nostalgic. Looking out the window, I saw only a sliver of orange sky and thought woozily, as I rubbed my eyes, that it was sunset. Looking at the table beside me, I saw a letter. It was from Miss Wu. It said something about her being worried for me. Since there was a sunny break today after so long, she might be out playing dodgeball right now. I also could have played if I were better. Knock, knock. There was a knocking at the door of the infirmary, but as I was the only one in the room at the moment, there was no sign of anyone answering the door. This. Should I go answer the door? I looked at the door through the partition in my curtains. Since it's the infirmary, they didn't need to knock and could just enter without needing permission, I thought, but the knock, knock sounded again. You um, it's fine, you can come in, I said, but there was no sound from the other side of the door, and when I turned my head and took a hard look at the door, I noticed, on the door, black spirits, low-grade necromancy spirits had begun to gather, was this? As I tried to think about what it could be, bang, Bang. A violent knocking erupted from the door and shook the whole room. 114. Demon Invasion 1. What can I do? When we came in the back entrance, the students who'd gathered for dodgeball gave a shout of joy at our safe return. The unconscious people had been temporarily laid out in the school building. It seemed they weren't sure if they should go get help. After confirming that all the students were safe and uninjured, except those already put to sleep by the demon droppings, we all decided to hurry to the auditorium. At first, there was talk of going to the infirmary for the unconscious students, but the principal's announcement earlier sounded like the teachers were collecting the rest of the students in the auditorium, so we went there for now. Alan in the lead and Katerina at the back were asked to take the dangerous outer positions, as the two top class powers in the magic class. Of course, great teacher Ritz also kept a close eye at the center a perfect formation. After all, given the principal's announcement, we could only assume that demons weren't just invading outdoors but also inside the school buildings. Although wary of our surroundings, we hurried to the auditorium without encountering any demons. In front of the auditorium doors, there was a night instructor stationed as a guard, who noticed us and opened the door to let us in. As we walked in, the place was overflowing with students. At first glance, none were seriously injured, but some of the underclassmen were crying in fear. For now, we needed to find instructors in the school of medicine. They might know how to deal with the sleeping people. Come in quickly, please. The demons may see you. Hurrying us along, a female teacher with short hair ushered us in. That's definitely a school of medicine teacher, professor. Um, we were attacked by a demon outside and it shot pink droppings at us that, when students smelled their odor, made them fall asleep. Understood. Please carry the children to the room behind that door. The injured are being gathered there. Hearing the teacher's words, the dodgeball player's core went to the room she had designated for the injured. It was mostly empty inside. There were cloths laid out as beds on the floor, but nobody was sleeping there. In the corner of the room, there were one or two students who were applying ointments to their own arm and leg bruises. Currently, none of the children gathered in the auditorium have been seriously injured. Only things like skinned knees while running away. Hey, mid school students, come help me. First off, we don't have enough bedding for these unconscious students. Get some ready. As the teacher issued instructions, the medical school students gave a lively, yes, ma'am and began bustling about. The Knights College students who were carrying unconscious students put them down on the currently empty beds. So, how are they? Doctor, are my children safe? After measuring the unconscious students' pulses and pushing their eyelids up to observe their eyes, she nodded. They're fine. They're just sleeping. They'll wake up shortly. The dodgeball player's core that had carried the students gave a concerted sigh of relief at the teacher's words. Thank goodness. They were just sleeping, as I thought. By the way, you didn't you inhale some of that pink mist as well? Are you okay? Yeah, I think I'm okay. I'm still a little dizzy, 
It seems like you won't fall unconscious if you have something to stimulate you before you lose consciousness. Alan looked worried, so I took the sage herbs from my pocket and shook them. I smiled to show I was alright because I chewed on these spicy herbs. Oh, you chewed that spicy medicine. That worked well. But there might still be some sleeping poison in your body. You'd better rest here, too. That's right. Alan gave a big nod at the medical school instructor's words and started spreading out one of the cloths, probably for me. It was true my head was woozy. And I wanted to rest. When my excitement died down, I'd gotten even more lightheaded. At this rate, I'd fall asleep. But, but, something was bothering me. What was it? I was in such a daze. My mind was wandering. But I was forgetting something. Something really important. Something crucial to me. With a bad feeling, I opened my heavy eyelids and looked around the auditorium again. Charlie. Charlie wasn't here. Teacher, do you know where Miss Charlotte is? Looking all around the auditorium, I couldn't see Charlie's figure anywhere. She hasn't come to the auditorium? We gathered all the students from the school building and the schoolyard here in the auditorium. If she went back to her dormitory, she might have taken shelter in the dorm lounge. I don't think she went back to the dormitory. Earlier today, she felt sick and was sleeping in the infirmary. In that case, she may still be sleeping in the infirmary. Perhaps? Wasn't that really bad? Because the demons were invading. Now, I had to go. This was no time to be muddle-headed. Wait. You shouldn't leave the auditorium. There are other teachers patrolling the school right now. She'll be fine. But, but, I was worried. But if I went, wouldn't I just be a burden on the teachers? Even if I could use secret magic, I still only knew the spell to cure my own injuries. As I was pondering dazedly whether or not to go, someone rushed into the room that had become a temporary infirmary. This is bad. Professor Carton was hit by a demon. We need medical help. The man, who was a teacher in the School of Commerce, laid the injured person he was carrying on the floor in front of the cloth beds. His red-soaked clothes made it immediately clear he was bleeding from his right shoulder and left thigh. Very serious injuries. I, I was careless. Just stopping the bleeding would be good. There are still demons in the school. I, if I don't go, the teacher, I was sure he was a magic instructor, gave a loud groan of pain. The magic teacher's injuries had also shocked the students in the auditorium, because he was a magician. The principal, who had come in with the injured magic teacher, also had a solemn face. Of course, me too. Because magicians had the power to fight the demons. How many magic teachers were at school right now? Were magician reinforcements coming, since we were near the castle? No, perhaps, or rather, probably, it wasn't just the school that the demons were attacking the whole capital, then, we couldn't rely on reinforcements from the castle, right? Principal, I've made contact with the royal palace via light spiritualism. A student, maybe one of the fifth year spiritualists, came up to the principal. According to my contact in the castle, demons seem to have invaded the royal capital. The knights and magicians in the castle are dealing with the demons in the capital and making their way toward the location of the barrier. And so, the academy. Since we have some knights and magicians here, they want us to hold out for a while. W what? Did you tell them how many demons invaded the academy? I've personally seen more than ten of them. I told them, but I haven't heard anything else. The auditorium fell silent for a moment. Nobody could say a word. More than ten demons. We were only barely able to defeat that crow demon, even with the power of Alan and Katerina combined. There were still such demons about. The people in the castle went down into the capital city to rid it of demons and potentially to fix the broken barrier. That's what was necessary. Until they had the manpower to spare. We couldn't ask them to come to the school. Besides, demons in the capital. The capital was where Mamaku was. And all the employees working in my pubs. If nobody helped them. My head was dizzy, and my body shook a little. Still. I stepped toward the door to go out. Someone grabbed my hand as I took a shaky step. When I turned around, it was Alan. Where are you going? I have to go. If I don't, Mamaku, and Charlie, and the people of the capital need help. I told Alan, but I didn't have a good image of what I should be doing now. I wanted to help Charlie, but I also wanted to go to Mamaku. 
but those two goals were incompatible. Aren't you a general student? You're not a magician, you can't go outside. The medical school instructor, who was stanching the bleeding on Dr. Carton's shoulder and leg nearby, gave me a stern look. Yes, that's true indeed. What can I do, since I'm not a magician? How could I possibly score a hit? The only reason we defeated the demon earlier was because of Alan and the other magicians. Also, I'm still lightheaded. Alan met my anxious eyes. Then the thought came to me again. Alan was a magician. What if I just left the rest to him? To Alan and the other magicians. Because this world had magicians. At that time. No, because it was such a time. I realized it. I was relying on the magicians in my mind, even as I pondered over what the hell they were. I had this feeling that somehow they'd rescue me, that they do something about it. Right, as long as there were magicians. Ah, my head was so fuzzy. My fuzzy head wanted to hand everything over to them and just sleep. But, that wasn't right. It really wasn't that way at all. There was an injured magician right in front of me. Also, the population of magicians was so small. I couldn't just rely on them to make sure everything worked out. Besides, I had magic, too. Still, I could only heal my own wounds. Ah, I've received a new message from the castle. I'll display it now, said the fifth year spiritualist student, and cast a spell. Then, in front of our eyes, shining brightly but shimmering a little, something like a letter was projected. The principal read the letter and his shoulders slumped in disappointment. We can't expect support from the castle. They seem to have been thrown into disarray from attacks by dozens of demons there, too. There are dozens? Apparently the demons who can fly tend to attack elevated structures. They seem to be concentrating their attacks on the locations of the castle and the academy. I thought there were a dozen demons here, but it's possible that even more will gather at the academy. Flying demons. That's true. The capital was elevated above the surrounding plain. So the only attacking demons were those that could fly. Still, so many demons had come. I wondered what was going on at ground level. Maybe at Ruby Fallen, too? In Ruby Fallen, where there were almost no magicians, a demon could. And if there were so many demons here, I was worried about Charlie. But Mimaku was in the capital. Even though the demons were concentrated at the school and the castle, that didn't mean there weren't any that had descended to the capital. What should I do? I can't. My head is so muddled. It's not working right. If I could only use recovery magic on others, I could heal the wounds of the fallen magic teacher now. The medical school teacher was working hard to treat him right now, but his thigh wound was deep. I didn't think he was going to be able to walk for a while. What could I do now? The second message from the castle had caused a stir in the auditorium. Anxiety spread as they heard that no support from the castle was expected. I could also hear sobbing from some of the younger students. I'm sorry, Alan. I'm feeling a little sick so I'm going to rest a bit in a corner, I said, and shook off Alan's hand. Though Alan continued to stare at me with anxious eyes, I managed to keep smiling as I walked to the corner. Then I cast a spell, in a small voice, so that nobody could hear. I recalled the list of warmth spells, whose effects I still didn't know, and cast them, starting from the top, while focusing on my woozy body. Omoiwabi sat moinokaiwaramanowo yukinatamanuwa namaden raikri. I am miserable, yet even now I live. It is my tears that flee my grief, and on the fifth tanker from the top of the list in my brain, there was a change. The light that covered my body brightened for a moment, and from the tips of my hands and feet, the light went steadily toward the center of my body. It converged around my chest. When the light finally converged, I felt nauseous. I say nausea, but it's more like there was something foreign in my body. When I covered my mouth and coughed, there was blood on my hand. The blood still seemed to shine a bit, covered in a kind of magical aura. It must have been something I spat out just now with my cough, although I'd coughed up blood. I felt much better. I had none of the sleepiness I'd felt just before. I felt like I'd spat out everything bad. Perhaps that spell just now was a kind of detoxification magic. My head felt refreshed. 115. Demon Invasion 2. Students of the Academy. The magic I could use was probably that which affected my own body. Perhaps I might be able to heal other people's bodies as well. 
but right now I could only do it to my own body. It was a kind of magic that affected the human body. If the spell and my awareness of what I wanted matched properly, the magic activated like the detoxification magic just now. Because of the magic, I'd expelled the evil substance and my head was clear. Yeah, that's right. I was better. Mamaku was strong. She wouldn't be overcome by demons. Also, that first message said that the knights and magicians from the castle were headed that way. They also said the demons were concentrating on the castle and the academy. Anyway, I couldn't make it to the capital no matter how much I sat here worrying. It would probably be difficult just to get out of the school, with demons congregating here. Now, what if I didn't look for Charlie? Charlie was a magician. But before that, she was just one girl. A girl who seemed weak, but she had a core stronger than mine in places, and was very gentle. Also, Charlie was surprisingly prone to loneliness. If she encountered a demon, Charlie would surely be scared. Even if I couldn't beat demons with my power, I wanted to be there for her. I found out what I needed to do, and when I turned around, Alan was standing a little ways off. His face was deathly pale. Are you, your blood? Why you were that sick? Not at all. I just had a little cut in my mouth. Now that I spit it out, I feel healthy and refreshed. I took out a handkerchief and wiped the blood off my hands. Well, if someone you knew suddenly vomited blood, I guess you'd be surprised. Since it's a magical cure, I wish it detoxified me in a nicer way, something that felt good like a nice shower. I hurried on, since Alan's doubtful eyes were asking, are you sure you're not sick? More importantly, Alan. Charlie isn't in the auditorium. So I'm going looking for her. She might still be in the infirmary. A, eh, for Charlotte? Alan said, and looked around the auditorium. I checked again with him, but I definitely couldn't see Charlie anywhere. Alan, you. This is bad. Char isn't here. She might still be in the infirmary. Ritz, who was apparently also searching the auditorium for Charlie, came puffing up. Ritz, we were talking about Charlotte just now, too. Ritz, I also think Charlie might be in the infirmary, I'm headed there, now, Ritz, will you? Of course, I'm coming. Great teacher Ritz said immediately, if the great teacher was coming along, I wouldn't be worried even if we happened to be attacked by a demon. Is that okay? Outside the auditorium, we might have to face a demon. I'd be happy if Ritz came with us. He was reliable, if it were just me. I might not even be able to make it to Charlie, but it felt like I might be getting Ritz involved in something dangerous. I know that. That's why I have to come. Char is my best friend, too. Ritz seemed so natural in his prompt decision. I felt embarrassed for asking. That's right, regarding Charlie. We were of one heart. Thanks, Ritz. Thank you very much. Hey, obviously I'm coming, too. Alan naturally wanted to follow us. He was a henchman, after all, if we had two magicians, even if we did come under attack by a demon, we could probably make it. I gave a firm nod and we headed for the auditorium's doors. The woman from the School of Medicine was engrossed in her treatments and didn't notice us start to run, but there was a Knights College instructor standing in the doorway like a guard. Hey, you're not going anywhere. Stay in the auditorium. There are demons outside. The teacher in the doorway was built like a rock. I didn't think he'd let us pass if we just asked him to let us through to look for a friend. But if we didn't get past, there was no other way out. Teacher, our friend is still outside the auditorium. Please, let us go look for her. Ritz implored the teacher. There are other teachers dealing with the outside. I can't let you through. You know that Dr. Carton was just carried in wounded earlier. Right? The demons are invading en masse. Can the rest of the teachers really deal with that? I'm not, but, Alan and Ritz here are magicians. They can handle demons. B but, if I let the magical students get into danger, no, I still can't. Even if they're magicians, they're still students. Even if there are two of them. Then, what about if there are three of us? A sharp voice cut off that of the faltering teacher, looking back at its owner. I saw Miss Katerina tossing her silvery ringlets and giving him a challenging glare. Of course, Miss Salome was next to her. Katerina. I mumbled without thinking, and she gave me a bold smile as she continued to stare down the Knights College instructor. Teacher, 
how about three of us, and I, the third person, am from the house of Genesis compared to the magicians around here, I'm far superior, she said as if she were going to throw out her chest and give a loud laugh at any minute, next, Alan said, if we're talking about standards, I've got the best grades in all of my magic class, Genesis house, but won't this be your first time facing a demon, I don't think, let them go, the meek looking principal interrupted the bulky teacher's words, he had drifted over, perhaps overhearing our conversation, I'm the principal, I'll take responsibility, in any case, since we have no idea when support from the castle will make it, the way things are going the whole school will be destroyed by demons, we have no choice but to rely on even the young magicians, saying that, he looked at each of us in turn and nodded, the friend you're looking for is the necromancer, Miss Charlotte, isn't it, she's also a fine magician, we can't abandon her like that, naturally, more than just a necromancer, Char is our friend, Ritz answered the principal, so reliable, he was such a manly kid for someone I thought was just a naive little boy, from now on I was going to call him Lord Ritz, the teacher guarding the door gave way with a, well, if the principal says so, he also seemed to know Miss Salome, as a student of the Knights College, and put a hand on her shoulder, saying, I'm counting on you. I was as relieved and happy as ever to have Katerina and Salome along, but I still felt like I'd gotten them involved in something dangerous, I was a little sorry, um, Katerina, Salome, I'm really happy that you said you'd come, but, um, I think it's going to be really dangerous, are you okay with that? HMMPH, if you think it's so dangerous, go wait in the auditorium, Charlotte is basically a Genesis citizen, it's my duty to take care of her, she said, and turned her face away, Miss Salome, next to her, laughed a little at Miss Katerina's upturned face, and looked at me, Mew, Charlotte is our friend, too, so if you're going, we can't very well refuse to go, you might not notice it, but we're very much in your debt compared to that favor, facing danger with you is nothing at all. A big favor? What's that? However, looking at their faces, it was clear they wouldn't think of not coming with us. Thank you. The students nearby, who had overheard our conversation, were murmuring, I I'll fight, too. I'm not scared, either. Hearing the voices and looking at the faces around us, I was surprised, before I knew it. The students who had become the dodgeball players were gathered around. When we got the messages from the castle, everyone had looked anxious, but now they looked at me with encouraging eyes and firm set faces, and their voices seemed to have reached the other students in the auditorium, and they were all gathering here, and the other students started to talk about how they weren't afraid, and wouldn't lose to demons. Somehow everyone was getting really motivated. I was overjoyed, I was overjoyed, but this was too many people to go to the infirmary, I looked at the principal, wondering what to do, everyone, thank you all, for thinking about the school like that, the principal began to cry, nope, I can't expect leadership from a principal who's overcome with emotion, too many people would slow us down, all the other students, please follow the instructions of the principal crying over here, we already have enough to get to the infirmary, Miss Katerina spoke loud and clear, and the students followed her, the principal nodded assent, as expected of Count Genesis's daughter, and her ringlets, we left the auditorium, seen off by the teachers and other students, 116, Demon Invasion 3, Miss Charlotte Rescue Operation, although it was getting a little dark, we had brought a lamp so that we could use fire magic instantaneously, the auditorium was in the middle of the ground floor of the building, the infirmary was also on the ground floor, but it was a room at the end of the building, since it was a large school building, there was a fair distance between them, as we ran through the corridor, we heard a rushing sound, like people running in a hurry, there was also a faint burning odor, I heard from Dr. Carton when he was carried in a little while ago that the demons seemed to be massing on the east side of the school building, apparently that's where Dr. Carton was injured, so now Dr. Thomas might be facing them on his own, Ritz explained, as I had noticed the burning smell and was wrinkling my nose, Vice Principal Thomas, then, 
Was this the smell of his fire magic as he burned the demons? I had given him matches, and I've heard that demons are weak to fire. Vice Principal Parted Hair had better do his best. If he came back injured and couldn't take an active role, I'd confiscate his matches as punishment. While I was, mentally, shouting motivation at the Vice Principal with a match forfeiture penalty. We proceeded carefully down the corridor. But it was quiet compared to the east wing where the vice principal was slaving away. Had the gathering demons been preoccupied with the east wing alone? Though it was bad for the vice principal, I'd prefer it if the demons stayed on the east side and he did his best to handle them over there. That would be best so we could join up with Charlie easily. But that tiny hope disappeared immediately. Just as we came to the bend in the passage right before the infirmary, we heard the bang, 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 of something beating hard against a wall, to be clear, it wasn't any ordinary sound, it stopped all of us, even me, in our tracks, and we stared at each other, thinking, what's that sound, but, exchanging glances, we all had the same thought, the sound is probably coming from a demon, and it's clearly right at the location of the infirmary, after we'd stopped, we all bolted out together. When we turned the hallway corner to the infirmary, there it was. The lower half of its body looked like a horse with wings, the upper half was shaped like a human woman. It had a single large horn on its head. It was delicate overall, only the horn and the wings seeming bizarrely big. It felt like a lot of demons had a cobbled together appearance. The disgusting demon was repeatedly hammering on the door with its human arms. Worst of all, the door the demon was banging on was that of the infirmary, that's where Charlie might be. At the thought, Ritz cast a rapid spell and a fireball flew between Alan and me. When I glanced back, Ritz was holding a fire lamp. He must have made a big magic fireball with the lamp's flame and shot it at the demon. The fireball smashed into the demon. Dr. Ritz, not half bad. You're merciless. Also, dangerous. The flame was so close to Alan and me we could feel it. Hey, Ritz, settle down. That's dangerous. S sorry, but that demon's in front of the infirmary. Char might be in there. That aside, the demon. It was blown away by that fireball just now, but it's not dead yet. Miss Sal emerged, and we looked ahead. It was blown a little away, but the demon had stood up even as its body was scorched. But thanks to great teacher Ritz's magic. Its wings were burnt. I didn't think it could fly anymore. Miss Katerina chanted a spell. I thought I felt a wind, and the demon was blown away by something, flying far back. While we have the chance, get into the infirmary and see if Charlotte is there. Miss Katerina, Miss Salome, and Alan went straight for the demon, and Ritz and I ran for the infirmary. We burst into the room, but Charlie wasn't anywhere in sight. The infirmary was silent. There was one bed that had been curtained off. That must be the bed where she was sleeping. I flung the curtains wide and found Charlie shivering beneath the covers with a pillow over her head. Charlie. I yelled and put a hand on her shoulder. She gave a start at first, but once she knew it was me, she dropped the pillow over her ears and collapsed in tears. Lady Wu, said Charlie, clinging to me in relief, and I hugged her and patted her back. She was still trembling. She must have been so scared. I'm sorry I'm so late. Char, are you okay? Ritz said worriedly beside me. W, yes. Something was. Death spirits. Banging. I was so scared. Charlie told us about what had happened, crying. I couldn't really understand what she was saying, but it sounded really scary, and I held her even more tightly. It's okay. You're safe, Charlie. Char, you're safe. What a relief. Ritz said and made a face of profound relief. Ritz was so worried that he threw a huge fireball at the demon, Charlie, big enough to nearly burn Ellen and me. R, thinking about it, I called out to Charlie first. So we hugged each other, but should I have given that honor to Lord Ritz? That was inconsiderate of me. Charlie, can you stand up? The truth is, there's a demon in front of the infirmary, and Alan's group is fighting it right now. A a demon? That thing was a demon? Charlie gave a look of surprise as her eyes filled back up with tears. She must have just thought it was some unknown thing banging on the door, with no idea that it was a demon. Yes, I think a barrier must have been broken due to the heavy rain, and the school is being invaded by demons. Then, when you said a demon, 
crash. Charlie's murmur was drowned out by the sudden crash of broken glass. It came from where Alan's group was fighting the demon. The three of us looked at each other, and Ritz said, I'm going to check on those three, and went to the door of the infirmary. Charlie and I hugged each other and watched Ritz as he double-checked, then murmured with a pale face. A wall was broken in from the outside, and another demon came in. W what about Alan's group? They're safe, the first demon is stuck with a lot of swords, and it's not moving, but I'm going, too. Ritz said, and immediately left the infirmary. I I can stand, too. I'll come, too. Charlie, still trembling a bit, looked at me with brave eyes. I supported her waist as she slowly stood up from the bed. Are you sure you're alright? To be honest, I'm a little scared, but I'm fine, as long as you're with me, Lady Yu. I feel like I'll be fine. Let's go to everyone, quickly. Once Charlie stood up, she was no longer trembling. We nodded to one another and ran from the infirmary. Author's note, we just broke 15,000 bookmarks. Thank you all so much. Really, thank you very much. So, as a commemorative bookmark party, I'm holding a popularity poll. See my latest blog post for details. I've also posted settings and backstory so I hope you'll be able to participate in the vote festival as part of the festivities. I plan to release updates on three consecutive days next week. Thank you very much for your appreciation and feedback, and thank you for your continued support. Translator's note, the author wrote a couple of short side stories on her blog to commemorate 15,000 followers. I'm not currently planning to translate them, but if people really want I might think about it. It's hard enough keeping a weekly schedule as it is. 117. Demon Invasion 4 The Two Demons' Bodies As Ritz said earlier, there were definitely two demons. First, the demon which had been hitting the infirmary door was slumped to the side, pierced by countless swords. I guess that might be the result of Alan's type of magic that turns his ore into swords. Next, the newly arrived demon was one that was like a huge hawk. Although it had been scorched by fire, it was still alive and well, spreading its wings wide and glaring at Alan's group. However, it seemed to be in pain after all. Its body was on fire and it gave a cry of distress, flapping its giant wings grandly. Wind. A strong gust of wind blew at the demons flapping, and we shut our eyes and braced ourselves so as not to be blown away. When the wind settled and we opened our eyes again. The demon was gone. Sunlight was streaming in from the wall the demon broke. It must have flown back outside. Looking over at Alan's group, I saw they weren't blown away by the wind, but the flame of the lamp in his hands had been extinguished by the gust. It was almost sunset. When the lamp went out, it got dim. For the moment, Charlie and I leapt out the window to see where the demon was. It was the ground floor, so going out the window wasn't really a problem. Alan's group also stepped over the wall that the demon seemed to have broken, and ran to chase after it. When we got outside and looked up at the sky, we found the demon as expected. It was easy to find because its body was still burning. The burning demon first flew up into the sky, then suddenly swooped down and plunged into the pond. The pond, or rather the pool that we used for physical education lessons. The demon flew back out of the pond, fires extinguished. Apparently, it had plunged into the water to put out the flames. Charlie and I ran to join Alan's group. What should we do? Since the lamp has gone out, I can't use fire magic. For fire, I think you can do something about it. I overheard Ritz and Alan talking. I ran up to them, pulling out a match. Here, fire. W what's this fire all of a sudden? Ignoring Ritz's surprise, I applied the lit match to the lamp wick and ignited it. Oh, great, Charlotte. You're safe. Miss Katerina said, pleased at Charlotte's safety. As I lit her lamp, too. Yes, I'm sorry, Miss Katerina. As long as you're safe. You're a magician of the Genesis province. No, rather, you're my friend. As Charlie and Miss Katerina smiled a little shyly at one another, Miss Salem interjected. Katerina, you can be glad she's safe a bit later. I know that she said, and we all looked at the sky. The demon was circling in the sky, considering what was happening. If it's fire, leave it to me, Ritz said and, casting a spell, 
sent another giant fireball hurtling at the demon for the fire to reach it even though it's quite far away. Great teacher Ritz's fire magic technique must be wonderful indeed, but the spell missed the speeding demon. I'll keep the demon from moving. Miss Katerina said, and cast a spell something like a whirlwind, slowing the demon's movement. Ritz promptly hit the demon with a fireball, but the fire didn't burn it much. The force of the fire might have been weaker since the demon had just taken a dip in the pond and its body was soaked. However, with Miss Katerina's wind magic and Ritz's fire magic, it was drier now. Its body should eventually dry out and our fire magic would be more effective. No, but if it was on fire, wouldn't it just go back to the pond and put out the fire again? What about luring it in and then letting it smash into Alan's dirt wall like we did with the demon who attacked a dodgeball? No, I thought, looking at the broken wall of the school building. This demon has a sharp beak. If it was able to break through the schoolhouse wall so calmly and easily, would it flinch back from Alan's dirt wall? What about making the wall thicker, I wonder? But unlike the previous demon, this bird demon is much faster. If we provoked an attack, would everyone be able to avoid it? Also, I think it would be hard to get the timing of Alan's dirt wall right so the fast-moving demon would hit it. Last time, I thought we could do it because the demon seemed slow, and it worked for this demon. Then the fireball magic took effect, probably due to Ritz and Miss Katerina's whirlwind dryer. When Ritz hit it with a fireball, the flames began to spread. But even if it's on fire, it'll just go back in the pool again. Ah, right, Charlie, you can use ice magic, can't you? Are you able to instantly freeze the water in the pond? At my suggestion. Charlie shook her head with a bitter face. I, I don't think my power can do that much. I can do it. Alan piped up from the side. I'm great at ice magic. All right, Charlie and Alan and I headed for the pond. Alan put his hand in the pond's water. Let's go. As he said the word, the demon body covered in flames broke off and dove toward the pond. Alan spoke the words of the spell. The demon entered the pond with a magnificent crash. At the same time, the pond shone a brilliant white. Before I knew it, it had frozen over. The pond. Alan gave a ragged sigh. His magic had succeeded. I looked closely at the center of the pond, where the demon had dived in a few moments ago. I could see something big and black at the bottom. The demon was sealed in the ice, unable to move or even twitch. I gave a huge sigh of my own. It may not be dead. But this way the demon should be prevented from moving. I'll ask Vice Principal Parted Hair to take care of it. Now, let's get back to the auditorium. Because our Charlie rescue operation has been successfully accomplished, I thought, smiling happily in the direction of the two magicians who had done such a great job as a dryer, and was startled. Everyone, behind you. I screamed without thinking. Because, behind them, the demon pierced by all the swords was approaching. At almost the same time, they turned around and the demon pulled out one of the swords that was piercing it and threw it at them. The thrown sword headed straight for Miss Katerina. Bang! There was a loud noise. I ran over to her in a hurry. The sword wasn't stuck in Miss Katerina. Miss Salem had gotten there just before and knocked it with her own sword. Of course, Big Sister Salome. Then more swords started flying. Miss Salome repelled all of them with her deft sword work. Along the way, Alan joined us and made a wall of earth to defend us from the thrown swords. Miss Katerina tried to rebuff the demon with wind magic, but surprisingly, it moved quickly and easily avoided it. In the school building, we hadn't noticed its speed, but this guy was troublesome. Above all, something was strange about this demon. Ritz carefully timed his fireballs to avoid Miss Katerina's wind magic but they only scorched it a little and didn't spread. Furthermore, although its body was pierced with swords, they didn't do anything at all. It pulled the swords from its body and used them itself, and there were no wounds visible where it should have been stabbed. Something's weird. It's catching on fire, but it's not spreading. Since it's moving so fast, could that be putting out the fire? I tried to freeze its feet just now, but it didn't work. How should I say it? Magic doesn't seem to have an effect on this demon. Magic is ineffective. Sure, it feels that way. My fire magic also seems like it's being absorbed. There's no response, no matter how I command the spirits. 
It doesn't spread or get stronger. Listening to the three magicians' conversation, I found the answer at last. When I was living as a bandit, I heard it from Kwama. There are some demons against which magic swords don't work. This demon might be one of those types of demon. Author's note, I mentioned this the other day, but as commemoration for 15,000 bookmarks, I'll be posting updates for three consecutive days for the first time in a while. Today is the first day. Also, as another bookmark commemoration, a popularity poll is being held. I'm pleasantly surprised that so many more people have voted than I expected. Thank you very much. The deadline for the popularity poll will be 4-5. On my latest blog is a link to the popularity poll and a little backstory slashed setting about Sleazy. Please check it out when you have some free time. 118. Demon Invasion 5. A demon on whom magic swords don't work. Grandma told me about it. The many swords that pierced the demon were magic swords made by Alan. They had no effect. In other words, this was a demon that wasn't affected by magic swords. And the effectiveness of other magic on such a demon might also be poor. I grabbed the god slaying dagger I'd gotten from brother Quamar out from where I'd hidden it under my skirt. It was a crude dagger. Its handle was too short to hit the demon with it. I'd have to get very close. The demon was preparing to dash this way. I thought Miss Katerina's wind magic might knock it off balance again, but it leapt aside and avoided her magic. In that case, it would make it over here. Instantly, I pushed Charlie down and kicked Ritz, next to me, away. In my peripheral vision, I saw Miss Salome protect Miss Katerina, throwing herself on top of her. The demon came flying at us, sword in hand. Since we were late to react, there's a chance the demon sword might actually hit us. For example, what if it throws its sword at Miss Salome, who's lying prone? Please, demon, I beg you, turn the force of your sword attack on me. I stood alone and stared down the demon. I needed to be the easiest one to aim at. No matter how wounded I got, I had healing magic hit me. So that I wasn't hit in the throat, I held the crest of Kwama's dagger there like a shield and faced down the demon. The demon's eyes met mine. The blade turned toward me, seemingly the easiest to attack. For now, I just had to make sure I wasn't fatally wounded. If everyone else got hurt, I couldn't heal it. Come straight at me. I stood and braced as if praying. But the slash I was expecting never fell. It wasn't that the target of the attack had changed to someone else. The sword the demon was holding crumbled before my eyes. That sword. Ha, I made that sword. I destroyed it just now with a dispelling spell. Ha. More importantly, why the hell didn't you try to avoid it? I understood when I heard Alan's voice. He must have destroyed it with his magic. The demon, which had kept moving a little past us with the momentum of its leap stopped and looked back at us. It gave a dispirited groan at its lost weapon. But the sword wasn't the demon's only weapon. It had a horn on its head. The demon shook the horn on its forehead up and down a few times proudly, then lunged in our direction. We hadn't regained our balance yet. Alan and I were the only ones standing. But Alan suddenly sat down. I thought he was going to use some kind of earth magic, but it wasn't like that. He was breathing heavily. Speaking of which, how much magic had Alan done today? I'd heard that using magic consumes your physical strength. The demon, lowering its aim, was clearly headed for Alan. No, it absolutely can't. Bam. I heard a sound louder than I thought possible. I thought the impact of the demon wouldn't be so bad because of its frail body. I had planted my feet and grabbed the demon's head. My body fell back a little, stinging with the impact, and the demon's horn was stuck through my side. I had intervened before it could hit Alan. Before the demon could do anything weird, I grabbed its head firmly, and as the demon raised its arms to block me, I quickly cut the tendons of first its right, then its left arm with my knife. Actually, I had wanted to cut them off entirely, but, wanting to prioritize quickly reducing its arm's power, I couldn't chop them off. Also, it was surprisingly hard, even with the handling skills I developed cutting up wild boar. It was difficult to cut through, even though the arm was so spindly. As for the demon, its arms fell as the tendons were cut. As I thought, the demon could be damaged with a god-slaying dagger, but the demon's lower body was a horse. The demon's legs held firm and it showed no decline in force as it thrust its horn into my body. Somehow, 
fighting the demon's strength, I managed to thrust the god's laying dagger into the slender neck of the demon. At the sudden pain, the demon groaned and began to shake its head. Desperately, I put all my strength into holding the head, and its motion stilled. A dull pain coursed through my body, but its pushing force had weakened. This damn neck, I'll cut it off. With a fast moving demon like this, there wouldn't be another chance to use the knife at such close range. My stomach hurt, but I had to take the opportunity. I just have to cut off this neck, but I was losing more and more strength in the arm thrusting with the dagger. Are you that? You. I sensed Talon standing up. I could hear a tremble in his voice. Though I was trying my best, my hands just didn't have the strength. I couldn't get the leverage I wanted because my stomach was impaled. My last hope was to ask Alan for help. Alan, please, lend me. Your strength, cut off its neck with the dagger. Not that, Mew. Why did you? We have to get you away from the demon. Your blood. Stop talking about that. Come on, Alan. When I turned to look, there was Alan, staring at the demon's horn coming out of my back with a ghastly pale face. Alan didn't seem like he could move further away. Miss Salome was staring at me with a stunned face. Miss Salome, you should be more familiar with handling a sword. I met her eyes. She seemed to understand what I wanted to say, and came over to me, crying. That's good. With this, we can take care of its neck. I just have to hold on a little longer. Then, if I can cast the healing spell, I'll be fine. I'm sure I'll recover. Ah. But if it didn't heal this, it'd be a disaster. Also, this demon. If its neck is cut through, it'll stop moving, right? There was also a possibility it could rampage without its head. Some demons are immortal. As I was thinking, Miss Salome ran up and I heard a voice casting a spell beside me. Before I knew it, Charlie had come up on my left and dug her nails deep into the demon's shoulder. She was crying with a look I'd never seen before. How dare you? How dare you hurt Lady Wu? Death is too good for you. Rot and disintegrate. With a stream of violent language I never thought could come from Charlie, at the points where Charlie's nails were dug in, the demon blackened and began to collapse slowly, like melting mud. With a little sigh from the demon's head I was still holding to my belly, its strength suddenly disappeared and it went limp. C.H. Charlie, awesome. When I released my left arm that had the demon in a lock, its horn slid out of my stomach. A lot more blood came out than I'd thought. And my clothes were stained red. I had to cast a spell before I lost too much blood and couldn't speak. While Charlie kept chanting, Die, die, rot and die. I quietly murmured the spell. Ow. As I finished chanting the spell, the aura appeared and concentrated around the wound. As usual. And as usual, while the wound was healing, it was extremely painful. I'd rather have been stabbed by the horn a couple more times. Maybe because my adrenaline was up at the time, the pain of that wasn't as bad. This healing magic, if you're not prepared, it could give you a heart attack and kill you instead. Not being able to stand with the intense pain, I clutched my stomach and sat down. 119. Demon Invasion 6. I'm sorry. Show me the wound on your stomach. If we stop the bleeding, maybe we can do something. That was a desperate voice for Miss Salome, who was always composed. It trembled, as a Knights College student, where injuries in practice were common. I think she understood that my wound was worse than usual. What should I do? I'll have to tell her. As Miss Salome was speaking so worriedly to me, my healing magic had already completed its job, and my body was in tip-top shape. I felt a little tired, but other than that I was already completely fine. How could I fool them if the wound had already healed? No, if it's a party member, maybe I don't really have to fool them? Should I just tell them about my healing magic? But I'm afraid the fact that ordinary people can probably use magic is something that could shake the whole country. Maybe everyone will take it calmly, but the royal family also wants to keep it hidden. There may be side effects to this magic. Sharing it with everyone would be making them share the responsibility. Mew. We need to stop the bleeding. Come on. Alan said with a pale face, trying to yank at my clothing. Wait, stop. Th that's lewd. I shoved Alan, clutching at my clothes, as hard as I could. Enough. I'm alright. I'm not wounded. Th that can't be true. Isn't there a hole in your uniform? 
Aren't you covered in blood? It's fine, just show us the wound. Miss Katerina said, pointing at the hole in my uniform. Everyone was staring at me. They were worried for me. I'm sorry I caused you all trouble. Feelings of wanting to tell everyone about the healing magic and wanting to keep things as they were without telling Ward and me. When I had discovered the existence of healing magic, I was simply surprised and happy at the new discovery. But as the days passed, I grew very afraid, feeling like I was carrying a heavy burden on my back. People who until now were supposed to not be able to use magic probably were able to use magic after all. Honestly, it was more serious than I could bear. If I told everyone about it, could things continue as they were? How sure was I in my feeling of wanting to tell everyone, that I didn't just have a deceitful desire to lighten my own load by sharing the burden of the secret? I guess I have no choice, I said, grabbing the hole in my clothes and tearing it open, exposing my side. It was red and slick with blood, my blood that I'd lost earlier. But the wound had already closed over. It's bloody, but that's all blood from the demon. It splashed me with blood. I said, taking the handkerchief from Miss Salome, who had probably taken it out to staunch my blood. When I wiped off the blood, my side appeared whole and unmarred. Healing magic is wonderful. The clothes are a loss, but I twisted my torso so that it didn't hit my body. I said and stood up cheerfully, giving off a look. I'm unharmed. Appeal. No way. Ah, really? B. But there's definitely no wound. Miss Salome and Miss Katerina stared at me in open surprise. Lady Yu. You're safe. You're really safe. Charlotte slammed into me from the side and clung on. She was surprisingly powerful, so I staggered for a moment but managed to recover and embrace her back. That's an amazing ramming attack, Charlie. Although I'm good since my wound is already healed, I'd appreciate kinder treatment as I'm still weak. Thank God, Lady Yu, thank God. Charlie cried and clung to me. I'm sorry, I worried you, didn't I? Charlie, thank you for helping just now. Your magic is amazing, huh? That demon melted away to nothing in an instant. Looking at the place where the demon was a few minutes ago, its remains were no more than a black puddle. Sob, the demon. Seems like it was already dead, sob, so as long as I could touch it, I could decompose it, sob, that's how I did it, sob, more importantly, I'm so glad you're okay, Lady Wu. Charlie wailed, the demon was already dead, but I was sure it had some kind of immortal constitution, the magic of Alan and the others didn't work well, but Charlie's magic was surprisingly effective, Charlie, don't cry, it was really nothing to me. I put my hand on her shoulder to encourage the crying girl, and a sharp mass of ringlets entered my vision. That's right, Liu. I'm not convinced. You're unharmed. That's impossible. Miss Katerina bellowed angrily. Miss Salem was nodding next to her. Although I agree with you, it's true that there's no wound. What we saw must have been an optical illusion or something. Miss Katerina fell silent with an unwilling face. Lady Katerina, she really is fine. I'm sure of it. Lady Yu is healthy. Because there aren't any death spirits around her at all. Looking back and forth between Charlie and my side, Miss Katerina finally gave a sigh. Well, certainly there's no wound. I'm not really satisfied, but it must have been an optical illusion, as Yu says. So saying, Miss Katerina lost the gleam of the hunt in her pupils. It seemed like I'd somehow been able to fool everyone. Because looking at the fact that there was no wound, they could only accept that it was an illusion. I was really anxious. But I'm glad everyone's safe. Since we were able to get Char from the infirmary, let's make our way back to the auditorium. Sure, that sounds right. It would be rough if yet another demon came. At Ritz's proposal, the conversation about me was over. Everyone switched to return mode. All right. I managed to make it through. There may be some doubt left but they wouldn't pursue it too deeply. Let's hurry back quickly. Let's get to the auditorium. I didn't want to spend even one more second out here on the school grounds where demons might be congregating. I went to catch up with everyone as they went ahead, but Alan, next to me, stared at me without moving. Mew. I saw it right in front of me. That horn went right through you, Mew. Because you stepped in front of me. There's no possible way you didn't get stabbed by that horn.
I had indeed stepped in front of Alan back then. Since he was looking right at it when the horn stabbed me, he didn't seem to be fooled like everyone else. You say that, but I don't actually have any wounds, right? I said, hoping he wouldn't connect the dots, and smiled as wide as I could. Mew, I don't know what, but you're hiding something. Alan moved closer to me and put his arms around my back. As he hugged me, my face rested against Alan's shoulder. I hadn't realized. Had Alan grown taller than me? We had been about the same when we entered school. Stop being so reckless. I'm begging you. Don't try to protect me. I couldn't take it if something happened to you. you. You're important to me. Alan said, tightening his arms around my back. His hands were still trembling. I felt guilty. Alan. Me too. I feel the same way. I don't want to see Alan or anyone hurt or wounded. Sir Kane had told me to take care of myself, back when I was a maid. Compared to back then, I am taking better care of myself. Even I was surprised at how reckless what I did just now was, but probably if something like that happened again, I would do the same thing, I'm pretty sure. Because I discovered healing magic. Needless to say I can just heal my wounds whenever I want. So, I'm sorry, Alan. I can't grant your request not to be reckless. Instead of answering him, I slowly ran my hand down Alan's back. I hoped I could stop Alan's trembling just a little. I wanted to give him at least a little relief. Alan, I'm sorry for being such a selfish boss. The final day of the three days of consecutive updates. Next time will probably be next Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Professor Thomas is scheduled to appear. Also, thank you very much for your participation in the popularity poll. It got many votes. I was really encouraged. Popularity votes will be accepted until 4-5, so you still have time. TN, 2016. I just noticed while looking at the calendar. I believe I posted the first chapter of this novel last year on the 2nd of April. Surprisingly, that's a year ago today. I'm glad I got to post an update on its first anniversary. Thank you all so much for always reading. And thank you extremely much for your appreciation. Best wishes for the future. 120. Demon Invasion 7, Return to the Auditorium. We were headed for the auditorium. On the way, we heard the footsteps of other people. It sounded like two or more people's footsteps from around the next corner. Was it patrolling teachers? No, it might be demons. We pulled to a stop and waited for them to come around the bend, ready to fight if it was demons. But though we waited tensely for a moment, it was someone we know who turned the corner. As always, not a single hair was out of place on parted hair's head. Vice Principal Thomas. You. You're safe. No, you're in tatters. What happened? Vice Principal Parted Hair was visibly horrified at the sight of my torn and blood-stained clothes. A. Is Lady Yu of certain victory safe? From behind parted hair, some students whose faces I knew peered at me. One of them was the fifth year senior from the Knights College that played dodgeball a lot. Why are they out here with the teachers? Surely they should have all taken refuge in the auditorium. We encountered a demon and had to fight. By the way, I'm not wounded, so don't worry. That aside, why is everyone here? Professor parted hair answered me. Is it really true, you're fine? Well, you certainly do seem healthy enough. I've been exterminating demons with fire magic. And since the Knights College professor who was out exterminating the demons with me was injured, I'd temporarily gone back to the auditorium. I was looking for another teacher to come with me. But since we were short-handed the Knights College students came with me instead. I'm not sure why, but the students are very motivated. Ah, when we left the auditorium, all the students there were getting pumped up for some reason. That must be it. Oh, right, Vice Principal Thomas. There's a demon sealed up in ice in the community pool used for swimming lessons in the schoolyard. It'd be nice if you could finish it off, please. Don't worry about that. Didn't a big bird demon come over here? How many were you fighting against? If it's a big bird, the one we sealed in ice was a demon like that. We encountered two demons including that one. By the way, we managed to defeat the other one together. Ooh, did you come across that one? It's good you're unharmed. A bird demon that big ought to be a very strong class of demon. I was originally fighting it over on the east side, but it managed to escape. 
Did that bird come here after running away? It was certainly a demon with excellent flying skills, so it might be hard to burn it to death, but it was the one horned demon that gave us the most trouble. Magic wasn't effective against it. Parted hair looked at the faces of Alan and the others who'd accompanied me with relief. It must be Alan who was able to freeze that big bond. Good job sealing it away. Eh, no. Well, yes. Alan, suddenly being praised by the vice principal, looked more surprised than embarrassed. You should all get back to the auditorium quickly. You're already ragged. You need to rest. Thank you very much. In fact, I was feeling tempted to keep helping, but we're pretty tired from that unfamiliar battle, so we'll continue heading to the auditorium. R, please do. Also, do you have any spare matches? If you do, I'd like you to pass them out to the students in the auditorium who can use magic. That's my plan, are you still okay, professor? I'm fine. After all, I've got a whole bag. He held up his handbag proudly with a huge smile. If so, that's great. R, hold on a moment, please take this as well. I took three bottles of ruby fallen marked alcohol out of my bag. This is alcohol. It's very flammable. Magic swords didn't work on the demon that we all defeated back there. The spread of fire magic, or rather its effects, were also bad. If you encounter such a monster, please douse it with alcohol and set it on fire. I think it would be more effective than not doing anything. There was a demon that magic swords didn't work on, too? I'm glad you could beat it. Normally when such a demon appears the royal family has to call the army to battle to fight it. Because you need a special sword to fight it. Since it's an emergency right now, there's no guarantee we could come up with a special sword even if we reported it to the castle. I'm really glad you made it through such a disaster safely. As I thought, a demon that's resistant to magic is dangerous. No, I really thought we were going to die. Just like that. Rather, if it wasn't for me. We would be dead. We barely made it. Also, if Charlie wasn't here, it would have been even more serious. Charlie's amazing after all. I mean, I was terrified. They say you shouldn't make a quiet kid angry. I found that out for real. I will absolutely never make Charlie angry. Yeah, well then, we'll head back to the auditorium, Professor. You teachers be careful as well. I said to Vice Principal Parted Hair and the students behind him as he stowed the alcohol in his bag, and their party moved on. You know, Vice Principal Thomas has changed a bit. If it were the usual Vice Principal, I think he'd never have praised me, hearing I used ice magic. Alan murmured, looking at the teacher's back, Ritz, next to him, nodded agreement. That surprised me, too. If it was before he would have made a face even hearing about ice magicians. Somehow it feels like his character has been rounded out. But even in recent classes, I got the feeling he's been kinder. The four students who took magic classes looked back at parted hair with curious faces. No, I, too, thought parted hair's personality had rounded out some. Yeah, he'd mellowed out. No but it may in fact come from his sense of security over having plenty of matches. After all, he's an honest-to-god match addict. If his matches were cut off, he might actually go on a rampage. I shuddered as I headed for the auditorium, imagining Vice Principal parted hair as rampaging hair, not even worrying about his hairstyle. After a while, the door of the auditorium came into view. When we first took shelter there, it had guards, but now there were none. I wondered what happened, did it have a lock? I wondered, putting my hand to the knob and opening the door, it wasn't locked. It opened easily. A, eh? what happened? It couldn't be. I envisioned the worst case scenario, but when I looked inside the scene was of students running boisterously to and fro. Ah, it's like normal. Oh, you're back. Great. Come on in. The magic students have set up a magic barrier around the room. It's arranged to prevent demons from getting in but it has no effect when the doors are open. A teacher from the School of Commerce told us. So we hurried inside and closed the door. I get it, so they must have gotten rid of the lookouts because they set up the barrier. Goodness, don't frighten us like that. When we stepped into the room, everyone celebrated our return. Some of the kids looked pale when they saw my tattered and blood-soaked uniform, but they shouldn't worry, I wasn't a zombie. 
and with the teacher's gift of a spare uniform, I changed my clothes. According to the story we heard then, the motivated students had put together a let's protect the school from demons movement, and were doing what they could under the teacher's instructions. More specifically, the magicians had worked together to place a barrier around the auditorium, and volunteers had been recruited from the students to venture out around the school with the teachers to collect food and other necessary supplies. The Knights College students we'd run into earlier following parted hair had also been selected that way. We'll protect our own school ourselves. I felt that kind of spirit from them. Alan, Ritz, and Miss Katerina were pretty tired, since they'd used a lot of magic in their battle with the demons. As soon as they arrived in the auditorium, they lay down and were now fast asleep. Charlie was working with the magicians erecting the barrier, and Miss Salem had also volunteered her help. Professor. Have you heard any news about the capital city, how many demons attacked there? I'm also going to work hard with everyone. I got fired up, and as I helped a school of medicine teacher to mix medicines, I asked about the thing I've been most anxious about. Right now, there hasn't been any news. Oh, I see. I wonder if the fact that we hadn't heard any news meant that the castle was still in a hubbub. Mamaku. I was worried. I wanted to make sure Mimaku was safe right away. But I couldn't go out now. My recklessness didn't go that far. I knew it was reckless, or rather absurd. Just when things quiet down a little. No, it was fine. Mimaku was strong. There shouldn't be many demons attacking the capital city. Besides, people from the castle were on their way to reinforce them. She was safe. I was sure she was safe. There were other students besides me who had left their families in the capital to live at the academy. Charlie, for example. But even though I was sure Charlie was worried about her parents in the capital, she wasn't complaining right now. Everyone else was working hard to keep their pessimism at bay. I'd do what I could, too. I was sure. She was fine. Author's note. Thank you for participating in our popularity poll. How the heck were there so many voters? The results you've all been anxious for are posted on my blog. 121. Demon Invasion 8. Together. In the meantime, the school's demon extermination was going well, due mainly to the great effort of Vice Principal Thomas. In addition, at school there were magician students, and Knights College students that had studied swordsmanship with their powers combined. They were able to safely get rid of the demons. It was also huge that the other students, myself included, were little by little getting used to fighting. Since all the demons could fly, our core were students who could use bows going on shooting raids alongside the magical students. Bows and arrows were mass produced by means of our fantastic magicians. If we lit them, we could use them as fire arrows, doubling their effectiveness. As we exterminated the demons, the barrier's area of effect increased and so did the safe zone living area. However, that didn't mean the demons were completely gone. If you walked the corridors outside the safe zone, you could still come upon demons before you knew it, and if you went to the schoolyard or someplace easily seen, you'd be attacked. It seemed like demons were still slipping through the broken barriers, and new ones were heading our way, so we were getting nowhere until we dealt with the source. There had been several messages from the castle since then. Apparently, they had nearly annihilated the demons attacking the castle. Thanks to the deeds of Prince Henry the Great, then, some of the castle knights and magicians formed a demon subjugation party and went off to the magic forest to repair the wards. The rest of them were dealing with the demons attacking the capital city. As for damage to the capital, since the demons concentrated on the academy and the castle, there was little damage to the surrounding neighborhoods. Although there were rumors that some demons had landed in the outer residential district to the southwest, Mimaku lived near the academy and castle, so her area was relatively undamaged. I felt a little relieved, but a little uneasy still, since I hadn't yet confirmed that she was safe. Charlie, whose parents also lived in the capital, paled a little at the report, but cheerfully told us everything would be fine. I guess my uneasy feelings had been plainer on my face than I'd thought. Although she should have been just as anxious, I let Charlie care for me. I needed to follow Charlie's example and act cheerful. Even if I was worried, there was nothing I could do from here. 
We had some idea what was going on outside from our communication with the castle, but even so, our lack of information was undeniable. Since we'd worked out a system to deal with demons within the school efficiently, we decided it would be a good idea to put together a unit to venture outside and check on things. However, since the castle had asked us to endure until they sent support, some of us thought we should maintain the status quo. So we hadn't been able to deploy the unit yet. They didn't think it was a good idea to extend ourselves since it was still possible a large number of demons could attack. The school had settled down since the day of the demon attack, but we were still filled with tension. And so, in the early morning of the third day, I quietly made ready and hardened my resolve. I was going outside because I couldn't take it any longer. I was worried about Mamaku. I had told myself, Mamaku is strong she'll be fine, and tried to wait as patiently and obediently as I could, but the impossible was impossible, and this was really impossible. I had volunteered to be part of the unit that would go check things out, but there were so many conservatives drawing out the debate that it seemed like it would be a while. So I started my own arrangements to venture out quietly, right, I'd done what I could, but it was no good, nothing for it but to steamroll through, I was going outside. I gave my bags a final check, there were a bow and arrows, knives and matches, plus alcohol, smoke bombs, pepper bombs, binoculars, and also, also, Alan's and Charlie's faces appeared, what would everyone think of me if I tried to leave quietly like this, if our situations were reversed, and my friend tried to go outside without telling me, I'd probably be very worried, sad, and angry, but I still had to see Mamaku. After all, I had to make sure she was safe. Should I tell everyone, if I spoke up, they might be able to stop me, or perhaps they'd say they were going with me, but that would be putting everyone in danger because of my selfishness. It was just my own selfishness to go see Mamaku. It was different from when we went to get Charlie from the infirmary. We were all friends with Charlie, so we all took the risk of running from the auditorium together. But this was different. It was my selfishness. Would it really be okay to get everyone involved? Moreover, I had the ability to heal myself. If I was on my own, my resolve faltered. I think the old me wouldn't have been troubled with such concerns. I felt like I was somehow getting weaker. I wasn't sure what had made me weaker, but I'd never vacillated like this before. I'd thought I was growing up. Just a little, after learning so much from Mamaku and my friends. Or could it be that growing up meant becoming weak? I shook my head to shake off my doubts and double-checked my bag to make sure it had everything I needed. First, I should go to the bell tower, the building with the bells that signaled the start and end of classes. It was the highest point in the academy. Due to Vice Principal Parted Hare's achievements, the barrier had also been extended to this vantage point and it was a safe zone. I should first check on the situation outside with my binoculars from the top of the bell tower to see if I could get out of the school without any problems. Then I'd decide whether to tell everyone. I made up my mind and headed for the highest place in the school. I crept along until I reached my destination at the top, next to the hanging bells, where I quietly equipped my binoculars. The sun was just beginning to rise, and it was still dim outside, but there was enough light to be fine. Yeah. A strike on my shoulder fell with a wild voice. I was so surprised I couldn't help roundhouse kicking whoever had accosted me. I really think talking to someone so suddenly is bad. Alan, please don't yell at me out of nowhere. Alan, whose ability to sneak up on me was still master class, was crouching, holding his stomach that I'd kicked. Ouch, that looked really painful. See could I have hit him in a man's most important part? S sorry. B but you were the one who crept up on me and yelled all of a sudden. Ah, are you okay? Alan, I really don't think you should speak to a lady so suddenly. I told him elegantly and held out my hand. Alan looked a little resentful, but took my hand, muttering, a lady. As he rose. He was still holding the spot where I'd kicked him with his other hand, and it was directly in the boy's vitals. Oh god, I really did. I hit him right there. It wasn't on purpose. In my mind, I bowed to him furiously and apologized profusely. A hey, anyway, are you? Alan, still looking like he was in pain, tried to take a firm stance. W what is it? What the hell are you doing up here with your bags all packed? N nothing, 
Really dot I just wanted to breathe in there. Beautiful outdoor air. You're averting your eyes. You're too sharp, Alan. The pain seemed to have subsided, and Alan folded his hands with a pompous face that said, This henchman will not tolerate his master's selfish behavior. Outside, you're going to Ku's place, aren't you? Alan said, reproaching me. As I searched for words to describe my henchman's threatening aura, Alan continued. Why aren't you saying anything? I could tell that his words were full of anger. My henchman was not happy, more so than ever before. And when Alan has that look on his face, it was usually my fault. Is it because I'm too weak? Are you leaving me because I'm unreliable? Alan's face that had been angry earlier distorted into one near tears. I remembered a time I'd felt awkward after first coming to the academy with Alan. Alan, who hadn't seen me for a long time before coming to school, had turned into a stalker, but that had been because I'd convinced myself that nobody cared about me, and hadn't thought about the feelings of those left behind. That's right, hadn't I realized it back then? If I left without saying anything, the people I left behind would surely be sad. I already had someone grieving for me. I knew that. That's right. Of course he was angry. I would be angry, too, if Alan tried to go outside without telling me. Alan, I'm sorry. It's, I said, then shut my mouth. The excuse, it's just my own selfishness, going to Mamaku's place, was about to come out of my mouth. I was sure Alan didn't want to hear such an excuse. That wasn't why Alan was worried. It's just that, once I saw how things looked out here. I was going to tell everyone. I looked up and put on a smile. Okay, I wasn't lying. I had been hesitating a little. Yeah, I was even thinking of talking to them. Also, I don't think you're weak, Alan. At my addition, Alan looked taken aback, and then a little embarrassed. W what? If you were gonna do that, you should have said so earlier. That's what's wrong with you, Ryu. And it's not just me, Salome, Katarina, Ritz and especially Charlotte would be really angry if you left without telling them. Alan was so embarrassed he'd started listing the other kids' names, saying they'd also be worried. It was true. I'm sure everyone would be very angry with me. I'd just learned the other day how scary Charlie was when she was angry. I didn't want to rot and die, okay. Not only that but if I went alone without permission, Mamaku would probably be upset with me for running off alone. Mamaku. I still needed to get outside as soon as possible. I know it's dangerous, but I have to see what it's like outside no matter what. Then, I stopped speaking. Because I felt like I needed a little courage to say the next word, I'd be getting them involved in my selfishness. But if the situation were reversed, I'd want to be asked. Um, Alan, will you come with me? When I'd summoned up the courage, Alan looked at me and nodded. That's what I... Eh? Eh? I was confused at his sudden eh, but then I realized that Alan's surprise wasn't at me but at the sky behind me. I turned around. Whoa. I said without thinking, from the direction of the magic forest. A black dot hung in the air, like a flock of birds coming this way. I really wished it was a flock of birds, though. I lifted my binoculars. Even with the binoculars, I couldn't get a detailed look at them from that distance, but from their general shape and size, I knew it was a pack of demons. Alan and I looked at each other, nodded, and ran to deliver the bad news to where the students were probably still asleep. I posted a short story to my blog. The story of how feverish Alan gave you a request he normally wouldn't it takes place around a time just before demons attack the school. There. When you're free, go ahead. 122. Demon Invasion 9, The Great Demon Battle, The Flame Throwing Magicians Unit, The Matches Unit, The Magic Attack Unit, The Magic Defense Unit, The Archers Unit, The Supple Lee Unit, The Guardian Knights Unit, and The Medical Unit. We made sandbags with magic to serve as protective walls and got fully prepared to receive the demons. During the preparations, a report came in from the royal castle. Apparently, they'd finished repairing the break in the barrier around the demon forest. However, when they did, there were many demons near the barrier, as if stuck in it, so they had lured them away to repair the barrier. But the demons pulled away were more numerous than expected, and the troops on site couldn't contain them, so the flying demons had gotten through. 
The message from the castle included a strict order to attract as much of the demon horde as possible to the academy, as reinforcements would be sent there soon. Although everyone at school felt disturbed, the academy forces, who had already grown into the image of veteran heroes who'd faced many demons, resolved to intercept them as instructed by the castle. Anyway, the barrier repairs being finished meant that this must be the final battle against the demons attacking the capital. In order to lure demons away from the capital, we made signal fires with the smoke bombs I'd made earlier. I still wasn't sure that it would work, but demons did converge on things that stood out. That's why they gathered at the castle and academy, which were built ostentatiously on rises in the capital. Furthermore, if my guess was correct, I thought there was a division among the demons, with some giving priority to magic users for some reason, while others targeted those who couldn't use magic, and by far the majority of the demons attacked magicians first. That, I felt, was why they attacked the castle and academy, where there were many magicians. I kept watch on the flock of demons with my binoculars, but as I'd hoped, none of them descended on the capital. A lot of the demons were headed for the school. In fact, they were coming in large numbers than I'd thought. A, eh? was this okay? It was more than I'd imagined. I mean, we hadn't even gotten the reinforcements from the castle, yet. Vice Principal Thomas, there are more of them than I'd thought. Too many? I gave Vice Principal Thomas, who commanded the flame-throwing magicians unit, and also currently the leader of the Academy Demon Response Force, the rough numbers of the demons I'd seen with my binoculars but there's nothing we can do, besides, reinforcements from the castle should be here soon. Are the fire preparations done? Vice Principal Thomas turned round and conferred with a teacher from the School of Commerce behind him. The matches unit was bustling about, building some campfire-sized fires and stoking wood. The School of Commerce teacher, who commanded the matches unit, nodded his readiness broadly and gave a thumbs up. To use fire magic, you need a spark but because of the possibility the fires would be extinguished by winds, we were well prepared with large fires that wouldn't easily go out. Even in the worst case scenario where demons extinguished our fires and lamps, we had matches. Our fires could be relit any number of times. The match squad was largely composed of students from the School of Commerce, who had proven good at striking matches. The matches unit was also stationed near the archers unit, since they used fire arrows. I too, was attached to the archers unit, I watched over the various units, and once the battle started I'd use my bandit upbringing archery skills to utterly destroy the demons. As soon as the demons invading the school were within range of flamethrowing magic, the flamethrower magicians unit began their attack. The attack was successful, and the demons whose wings were burned lost their balance and fell to earth. The magic attack unit and the guardian knights unit stepped forward to finish off the fallen demons. The archers unit shot arrows at the demons that had dodged the flame throwing attack. We had been able to score the first attack, so far, so good. The enemy, however, was flying demons that could fly through the air in all directions. They rose to the sky, coming around our sides, surrounding us as they approached. But this was within our expectations. We had made plans to divide our units into two groups, one on the front line and one in charge of our left and right flanks. Also, we would take care of them with preemptive strikes, keeping them at a distance where they couldn't attack directly. However, there were some demons that had long-range shooting attacks. For those attacks, the defense magic unit, to which Miss Katerina also belongs would defend us with wind magic and repel them. With a strong defense and a strong ranged attack, the demons fell like locusts, but among the demons were a large number with invulnerability. Although we'd gotten by without casualties until now, I thought it was very possible something could cause our system to collapse and become a rout. Furthermore, the distance between us and the demons, who at first we'd been able to knock down with ranged attacks before they'd even got close, was shrinking fast. But all we could do was keep attacking continuously, without rest. If we took even a small break, the demons would draw close. As I was shooting fire arrows at the approaching demons, I saw several demons working together to carry a large rock. They were pretty clever for demons. At the command of the Knights College's teacher who led the archers unit, everyone was to attack the demons with the rock. 
If such a big rock fell, it wouldn't be possible for the magicians to fend it off with wind magic, obviously. However, the demons instead used the boulder as a shield and our arrows couldn't hit them. Fire magic was also basically a straight line attack, so the boulder prevented it. I shot my bow in an arc, and where the arrow fell a shout let me know it had hit a demon. None of the knight's college students who were originally unfamiliar with archery could easily perform such a feat. However, several fire arrows managed to find targets and students who were good at fire magic were able to maneuver their fire at the last second, avoiding the rock and hitting demons, causing serious injuries and felling them. Our joy was short-lived, though, as some of the demons who seemed to be able to learn copied them, grabbing rocks with their feet or something to shield the other demons. Even though they were demons, they worked together to carry rocks. While we were busy dealing with these irregular demons, the onslaught from the other demons hadn't slackened. The more we had to deal with the troublesome demons, the closer they got to us. Hurriedly, I expanded my targets of attack, prioritizing demons that had gotten close. But if things kept on like this, we wouldn't last. Just as I thought that, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something rise. I gave a quick glance and saw that the earth in about a three meter radius had risen several dozen meters in an instant. And unless my glance had been mistaken, I thought there was a person up there, the ground had already risen high enough to be a blind spot, so I couldn't see who was there, however, something fell from it as if thrown, as they fell, they looked like red hot, swords, the swords shot from the tower of earth that had risen even above the flying demons, the red hot swords streamed across the defenseless demons backs like meteors, the swords pierced the demons so powerfully that they fell, burning. After wiping out the large force of demons in the direction of the demon forest, the flaming swords continued on, scattering the demons on our left, near the raised ground. The same way, we were stunned, and before we knew it, a group of strangers had gathered around us. As they were dressed like knights, I knew immediately who they were, and a certain person came running to confirm it. You, are you okay? You made it. I didn't think the students would be fighting as well. Lord Kane, who was wearing official Knight of the Realm armor, put a hand on my shoulder with a relieved look. Sir Kane. So the state reinforcements have come. Kane nodded and added, Sorry we're late. We made it. I had thought we were doomed. Seriously, Kuki. Who's here? As I stood transfixed by Lord Kane's dashing appearance, like a hero of justice. He called out an inconceivable name. K. Kuki, was it? While I puzzled, a huge thumping impact came from my left. New U U U R, thank God. You're safe. I'm so happy. MMMM Mamaku. Mamaku continued to hug me and exclaim her relief at my safety. No, that's my line. Mamaku, I was so surprised I let out a noise like a chicken. I confirmed Mamaku's temperature and checked her for leg or arm injuries. Yeah, no injuries, just the cheerful as ever Mamaku. Mamaku, you're safe. Why are you here? I came here because I knew you'd be doing something reckless. The reinforcements from the castle have just set out for the school, so I asked Kane and secretly followed them here. Eh? She said she followed them secretly, but she wasn't disguised as anything but Mamaku, so how could she follow secretly? I'm glad to see you're safe, Mew. And Alan seems safe, too. Kane looked relieved at finding Alan, who was a little ways off shooting long distance magic. The demons won't give up until we finish them off. I've got to go. Lord Kane said grimly, running off to impale a demon that had fallen after being shot down from the sky. That's true. It's too soon to relax our guard. Although the vast majority of them had been grounded thanks to the reinforcements, they were still around. I aimed my bow at a demon still flying above. Author's note, I posted a continuation of the short story on my blog. Again, I hope you'll read it when you get the chance. It's a story about you and Lord Gain. Thank you very much. 123. Demon Invasion 10. Henry the Great. It seemed that the school's greatest crisis had been averted. Looking at the clear, demon-free sky, the academy students hugged each other and rejoiced. Meanwhile, the earth that had suddenly risen shrank. On the raised earth stood the person who had shot down most of the demons with their magic. Everyone watched the person coming down with bated breath. 
wondering who the hero was who had saved us. I watched, too. But when I saw the way the knights of the reinforcements were kneeling and bowing their heads, I guessed who it might be. Even as I thought that, I strained my eyes to see our Savior. And then the Savior descended from the earth, attracting everyone's awe and envy. Their light blonde hair, so different from mine, fluttered picturesquely in the breeze. They had long hair, so when it fluttered in the hair, it seemed to glisten in the sun. The women of the school let out a chorus of admiring sighs. He appeared in front of us with his usual shady smile. Lord Henry. At someone's exclamation, cheers filled the school. He strolled over to us, seemingly unconcerned at the crowd's cheers of Lord Henry. Lord Henry. That's the first time I've been so high up. I thought I'd adjusted somewhat, but my ears were hurting. He removed the cloak he was wearing and passed it to a nearby knight. As the cheering continued, the principal and vice principal, representing the school, came up to Slee, Henry and bent their knees. While he had been at school, they were teacher and student, but now Lord Henry was royalty and a VIP magician. The other students also knelt with a start of realization. I took a knee as well. After all, he certainly did save our lives. Besides, although his smile is still shady, there's a good possibility that he's changed. Touched by Sir Kane's kindness, I'm late, I know, I've been exterminating demons in the capital city, and just when I thought I was done, the king suddenly told me to head to the academy, I meant to hurry here, but was some distance away, so I was late. No, Lord Henry, we didn't suffer any serious damage, thanks to you, I can't thank you enough. Henry turned his gaze from the principal to the school and its buildings. There were some places that had collapsed due to demon attacks, and some walls that had fallen, but they could be quickly restored with the power of magic. There's less damage than I thought. Also, if I'm not mistaken, it appears that not only the teachers and magical students but also the commoner students took part in the battle with the demons. There was a hint of censure to his words a tone that doubted whether it was a good idea to let those who couldn't use magic take up the sword. The upperclassmen spontaneously rose to the occasion in the academy's time of need. Thanks to them, we were able to make it through these nightmarish three days without much damage. Henry raised his eyebrows in displeasure at the bowing principal. I understand that the Knights College students would fight. That's the role they're planning to shoulder, after all. However, Henry's gaze shifted to the supply matches, and medical units. Those teams were mainly composed of students from the School of Commerce and School of Medicine. I don't think it's a good idea for those who can't fight to be let outside the walls. His face was smiling, but I could somehow tell that Henry was a little angry. If I may speak, your highness. Without their help, we couldn't have made it so far against the demonic forces. The situation was such that we couldn't have managed on our own. Vice Principal Thomas of the Parted Hair said clearly, still bowing his head. Henry pierced Vice Principal Parted Hair with a glare, still smiling suspiciously. At the rather uncomfortable silence, one of the matches unit students looked up and shouted, Please excuse me. To break in there took great courage. Lord Henry, we are all very glad you're concerned for us. It is true that we cannot use magic. However, we still wanted to do our part for the Academy. Therefore, even though we are weak, we were able to fight alongside the magicians and protect the school. The leader of the supplies unit, a fifth-year student from the School of Commerce, crisply agreed. He was an active schoolboy who was active in dodgeball. The other students also agreed with big smiles. Smiles that seemed to say, don't worry about us, gentle Prince Henry, we'll be fine. For a moment. Henry's shady smile disappeared. But it was only a moment, and soon that stinking smile was plastered on again like nothing had happened. He looked around slowly, left and right, as if looking for someone. I got a bad feeling, so I hid behind a teacher who was in front of me. Somehow, somehow let nothing happen. After a while, Lord Henry said, Huh, I see. Great. It seems the Academy students have gotten much braver since I've been gone. Was this? perhaps, someone's influence? At those words, I felt the glances of many students for some reason. Stop. Wait a minute. Don't look at me. If we've been influenced, I'm ashamed to say it was one of my juniors. They're called certain Vi, 
No, I'm sorry, their name is Ryu, the student. The fifth year who'd spoken earlier said that, stop, please stop it, and for a second there, he accidentally started to use my embarrassing nickname, didn't he? When I timidly raised my head to look at Henry, he was looking back with a beautiful, terrifying smile. I've found you, it seemed to say. Is that so? I see. I was also close to her when I was at school. It's been a while, we should have a chat. The people around me pushed me forward, saying, please, please. They'd apparently decided Lord Henry and I needed to have a heart-throbbing conversation. While the teachers, other students, and people from the castle were busy getting rid of the fallen demons, Henry, the saviour of the school, and I took some tea in a relatively clean room in the school building. What's more, the knight who served us tea left the room as if to say, take your time, so it was just Henry and me. What the hell was this? I watched Henry the saviour carefully. He sipped his tea gracefully and relaxed. I waited a few minutes, wondering what he wanted, calling me in here. There was no response from Henry, just leisurely tea drinking. I finally lost my nerve and spoke. Lord Henry, there was something you wanted to talk about, right? He looked at me as if to say, oh, you're here? Wow, I wanted to punch him. Ah, that's right, I forgot. It's been a while, chicky and he gave me his shady smile. I had a bad feeling about this. I shouldn't have spoken. That's no good, Ryu. I couldn't think of that foul smile as a bad omen. After all, he did save the school. I had to hope for a miracle, that in the time I hadn't seen him he'd been reborn into a nice young man and become a good person. It has indeed been a while. Lord Henry, you've managed to remember me, that said, since you went to the trouble of preparing a room, what is it you wanted to discuss? I answered Henry's smile with a fresh smile of my own. Eh? Something to discuss? Nothing in particular. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of all the fuss. Ah, is that so? Huh. You wanted a quiet place? Huh. In that case, my business here is done. If you'll excuse me. Well, hold on. There's no rush. We haven't talked in a while. It wouldn't hurt to have a chat. No, I'm fine. I already had a bad feeling about this because I owed him my life, I wanted to keep thinking that he was becoming a nice young man, less sleazy. What can we talk about? Right. Come to think of it, it looks like you've been doing some extra training of the school's livestock while I was out. Oh no, scary, that face is really scary. I, I didn't do anything extra. Um, also, instead of the school's livestock, just say the students. Well, how can I put it? I could already clearly tell by his words, he was still sleazy after all. Sleazy, sleazier, sleaziest. Rather, the grown Henry might have leveled up to sleaziest. Give me back the part of me that tried so hard to believe, as a huge benefactor of the school. He can't be a bad person. I let out a big sigh. No, it's not that I really ever thought he'd have left the sleaziness behind. But I thought at least some of Sir Kane's wonderful aura might have rubbed off and he'd act like a wonderful nobleman. Lord Henry, you're the same as always. You as well. Hateful Sleazy said and took an elegant sip of tea. What do you mean by extra? And what livestock? As far as I'm aware, there aren't any farms at this school. I couldn't be bothered to keep acting respectful, so I put my chin in my hands, my elbows on the table, and turned away. I couldn't help but sigh. Whatever are you saying? The whole school is a farm, isn't it? All the livestock looking at me just a while ago. Didn't you see? Poor things, completely oblivious to the fact that they're livestock. No, they're not livestock, they're people. Please call them students, not livestock. All the students worked together to fight for the school, isn't that a wonderful thing? At a question that would normally elicit sympathy, Sleazy's eyes widened as if saying, What? Calm down, Sleazy. I didn't say anything crazy. Are you serious? If so, you and I have very different values. Of course, they were different. I'd known that forever. Now I was the one who couldn't hide my surprise at Sleazy's ignorance. We've had a difference in values for some time. Is that right? Well, your livestock, too, you can't help it. But I'm surprised I almost thought I could get livestock to understand how I felt. I wonder if that's what it is about you that ruins the other livestock. 
I didn't ruin anyone, though. That's why I feel so sorry for you. Unlike other livestock like pigs and cows, humans are very sensitive. If you start believing you can stand on a level with us magicians, despite being livestock, you're the ones who get hurt, eventually. If that's the case, wouldn't it be less of a shock if you just accepted your fate as livestock from the start? Disgusting, seeing Sleazy acting like he's so kind with that smile on his face. I wanted to go home. Well, it'll be interesting to see how the livestock react to the shock. Are you doing it because you want to see the spectacle? You're wrong. At my emphatic denial, he hummed and looked at me with emotionless eyes. A little chill ran through me. Maybe you're a pest after all. Thinking of the other livestock, maybe it'd be better if you disappeared. It felt like the atmosphere had changed a little. Sleazy had lost the shady smile he'd worn until now. I gulped and involuntarily checked on Kwama's god-killing dagger, where it lay hidden under my skirt. 124. Demon Invasion 11, my first time title. If that mouth of his started forming the words to a spell, an uncomfortable silence enveloped us. I couldn't tell how much time passed, but eventually, Sleazy's face suddenly softened. Then he said, this is a first, and plastered another nasty smile on his face. I exhaled slowly, feeling the threatening atmosphere fade away. I'd told myself not to panic. I knew if I let my guard down here. I'd get in some kind of trouble. Then he opened his mouth again. Two thoughts are warring in my mind, that I should get rid of you, and that if I get rid of you, I can't have any more fun with you. What to do? I haven't been able to make up my mind. You're the first person who's been able to annoy me this way. Along with his shady smile, he gave me a first time title I absolutely didn't want. I managed to keep my cool by imagining myself rolling up that first time title I'd received into a ball and slamming it into a trash can. No good, it'd all be for nothing if I lost my self control now. R, don't look so scared, it'll ruin that lovely face. No, well, I suppose it's my own fault for frightening you. Don't worry, I won't do anything to you. He put his hands up as if to say he was going to do anything but I couldn't be too careful because this was sleazy. It's hard to believe you'd say those kinds of things and then not do anything. Don't worry, I won't do anything for the time being. You may just be a pest to my lovely little livestock, but you're also a really amusing creature yourself who might be able to give me some excitement. I still want to observe you while you think you're moving around freely. He pasted on a gentle smile that made him look even sleazier than usual. The ominous atmosphere was gone, and he relaxed and took a sip of tea again. He felt like a different person than a moment ago. The tension left as suddenly as it had come. I felt like I shouldn't provoke him any further. However, I did have a few things I needed to say. For example, he didn't especially need to observe me. I just wanted to be left alone. But it would be a disaster if I went on a rampage here and got myself in trouble again. Let's just get the heck out of here while things are calm. I finished off the tea in my cup. I'm afraid it's time for me to go. You should take it easy. If it's your tea, I'll have them make you more. It's really not half bad chatting with you. Oh, dear. There's that difference in values again. When I talk to you, sleazy, it makes me sick. No, I'd like to know how things are going in the capital, and I'm sure everyone is still busy with the demon cleanup. I can't be the only one taking it easy. Then, without saying anything more, I made my way to the door. As long as Sleazy didn't use any weird magic, I'd be fine. I quickly grasped the doorknob, heart pounding. Well, in that case, I won't force you to stay. I had a pretty good time today. I turned my back on Sleazy sipping his tea and left the room. As the door softly closed, I involuntarily relaxed. Relieved to be free of the sleazy room. Thank God. I made it out alive. Glad to be alive. I eased the oil container out of my bag. I quietly dribbled some oil on the hallway floor in front of the door and polished it with a cloth. The hallway took on an extremely shiny, waxed appearance in that part only. I'm counting on you, hallway. I want that bastard sleazy to have a great fall. I'm leaving it to you to make him go slammy. I managed to put my mind to rest by imagining Sleazy slipping and falling as he left the room. 
and ran off to see where everyone else was. Everyone was still in the schoolyard. It seemed they were busy cleaning up the great masses of demons. First, I looked for Mamaku. She came to school, so I was sure she was here somewhere. She couldn't have gone back to the capital, could she? According to the people from the castle, the demon forest barrier had been repaired and the demons in the capital defeated, so it should be safe to venture out. But she didn't leave me here, did she? Searching frantically, I caught a glimpse of my favorite dusky red head of hair, Mamaku. I ran up without thinking and hugged her from behind, and that beloved voice said, Oh, you, you're back already, are you? Yep, I said, looking up at my beloved Mamaku. Thank God, I knew she was safe, it wasn't an illusion. Delighted, I felt stares from the side and turned to find Alan and Sir Kane watching me cling to Mamaku like a koala. Oh, no. I glummed onto Minmaku without thinking about the situation. I forgot we were out in public. That's embarrassing. I cleared my throat and adjusted my posture. Mew, did you want to go down to the city? I already got permission from the principal. Alan came up, holding up a kind of permission slip, embarrassed. The capital city. By the way, have you guys heard anything about the other territories? No, not yet. They're collecting information now with the light spiritualists. I see. Ruby Fallen, I hope you're okay. At any rate, I couldn't help what I couldn't confirm. For now, we'd check on the situation in the capital. I knew Minmaku was safe, but I was worried about the taverns I ran, Josh, Millers, and the employees. I'd like to go down to the capital and see how things are. Minmaku. I'll go with you, Mew. Minmaku replied easily smiling with Mamaku along. I could go anywhere. Then, we're off. Are there many people going down to the capital? I said, looking around a bit. It felt like the number of students was decreasing. There are many students whose families live in the capital like you. Since the demons are gone from the capital, they're saying it's safe, and a lot of students are going down. You have to be accompanied by a castle guard, though. After Alan explained, Kane chimed in. Looking up without thinking, I found myself face to face with the ever fresh young noble Sir Kane. If I couldn't go down to the capital without a castle guard, does that mean Sir Kane was coming with us? I'm happy. Sir Kane, are you coming with us? If you don't mind me coming. Of course, by all means. And also, thank you very much. With the castle reinforcements earlier, we were able to get through earlier. Well. That was mostly Prince Henry's work. That's not true. I felt way more secure when Sir Kane appeared than when Sleazy came. Well you also brought Minmaku, so thank you. You were able to bring along a member of the general public. As a rule, I thought you couldn't freely do such things. No, it's generally not allowed. The knights around me didn't mind, so I got away with it. Eh? They didn't mind? When I tilted my head in curiosity, Minmaku spoke up. The knights who work at the castle are rather corrupt. They'll keep quiet if you pay them off. Ah, of course, you're different, Kane. You noticed my feelings and brought me along. Hearing her, Sir Kane laughed a little, embarrassed, and continued. No, ah, it's embarrassing to hear that kind of talk about knights of the kingdom. Aren't they motivated? I already learned about it when I was assigned there, but it surprised me. Perhaps because there are a lot of great magicians at the castle. They got in a habit of relying on them for everything. Is that so? Speaking of which, looking around again, it was almost all academy forces taking care of the demon cleanup. The people dressed as knights were all chatting and resting. Well, because of that, I was able to come up here, too. Ah, but Kane, you'd better not go rotten like that as well. Minmaku said giving a sisterly wink. Alan jumped in praising his brother's greatness. Big brother Kane wouldn't go rotten. He's super amazing. As Minmaku and Alan continued their conversation on the side, Sir Kane came close and murmured, It's possible, though. I'd be rotten too if I hadn't met you, you. Eh? Why me? Kane looked down at me with a gentle face. You saw Lord Henry's magic, right? Honestly, watching him from up close. It feels like there's nothing for me to do. I know exactly how it feels to lose your motivation because of that. But you taught me what to do. Even if you can't use magic, there are still things you can do. And it seems I'm not the only one who learned that lesson from you, 
New. Kane turned his gently smiling gaze on the students working hard to clean up the school. Since I'd been under Sleazy's nasty smile recently, Sir Kane's gentle smile was extra healing. Also, when I'd already been thinking I'd had enough, Sir Kane's dashing appearance was really cool. What an influencer. His timing on gaining followers was divine level. As I dreamily clasped my hands and enjoyed Sir Kane's angel smile, Alan suddenly interposed. Come to think of it, Charlotte's parents live in the capital, so she went out earlier. Ah, is that so? Charlie went to the capital first. That's right. I heard before that her parents were in the capital city. She was wondering whether to wait for you, you, but thought you wanted to spend some downtime with Lord Henry, and left. Charlie, you really didn't have to be so uselessly thoughtful. I didn't want to spend any time at all with him. Is that so? And Katarina, Salome, and Ritz. Katarina's group said they were going to clean up demons, and Ritz went with Charlotte. Hey, I see. Goodness, Ritz just casually went with Charlotte like that. I bet they're an item after all. Those two are definitely an item. Setting that aside, I somehow felt like Alan was in a bad mood. The tone of his voice had felt angry for a while now. When my moody henchman caught me staring at him, he turned his head away with UHMMPH. Anyway, Mew, what the hell were you and Prince Henry talking about? R, don't remind me. Livestock, a ranch. That kind of talk. We didn't talk about much. Um, we talked a bit about the school. As I spoke evasively about my conversation with Sleazy, Alan put on a bitter face. But those guys around. Guys around? I prompted Alan, as he seemed hesitant to speak. And he drew in a big breath. Those guys around him said Prince Henry would marry you when you turned 15. Wha? Hold on, who'd say such a thing? Who? It was too shocking, and when I stopped, dumbfounded, Alan looked uneasy and said, W what is it? No, all sorts of things. What are you talking about? That's absolutely impossible. Next time you say something so weird, I'll get angry, okay? My henchman looked relieved at the threat for some reason, and changed the topic with a. Then, let's get down to the capital quickly. He's a quick change henchman. As for me, that image was too bad for my body, my heart was still pounding. I took hold of Mamaku's arm for security, and we headed down to the capital city. I didn't mind being labeled a spoiled brat anymore. Sleazy and thud sound similar in Japanese. 125. Demon Invasion 12, the principal's speech. Although that's not to say it was completely unaffected. When we came to a residential area away off from the school, I could see a collapsed wall and a hole in the roof of a house. As for the taverns I ran, only one location had part of a wall collapse, but I was relieved to hear there were no injuries. We spent a while cleaning up rubble with the people of the capital and helping Mimaku treat injuries. I was glad I'd brought Alan. His earth magic could restore collapsed houses instantly. He was a magician indeed. After we'd stayed and helped in the capital city for a while, we got a summons from the academy. As they'd learned the state and future plans for each of the territories. It seemed they were gathering all the students for a discussion. When Alan and I returned to the school, Miss Katarina, Miss Salome, Charlie, and Ritz were already in the auditorium. Mew, it's been a while. Oh, did you get a bit dirty? Miss Katarina started right in on the insults. Meeting after so long. Since I've been working hard in the capital city, was there some way I wouldn't get a little dirty? I even put on a clean uniform for now. That's Miss Katarina for you, Miss Katarina, your curls are glistening as brightly as ever. I can't help it. I've been working hard cleaning up and restoring the school. Me too. I'm glad you're doing well, though, I said, and we hugged, smiling. Miss Salome and Charlie were also nearby. So we happily greeted each other. Charlie, by the way, was your family okay? Actually, our house collapsed. But that's fine. My father and mother were hurt a little, but they're safe. A sorcerer should be able to fix the house. We're on a waiting list for one now. She laughed, but her face looked a little tired. It seemed they had it rough after all, but it was good they were safe. When things calmed down, I'll come visit your parents. Ha ha, it's fine, please don't go out of your way. They're back on their feet already. That said, 
I feel like it's been a long time since we were all together like this. It sure had. Although it had only been several days since we'd been unable to meet, I felt a strong nostalgia. R, that's the principle. Let's find out why they called us together. At Ritz's call, our group, ecstatic over the long-awaited reunion, turned to focus on the auditorium stage. The rest of the children also began murmuring, noticing the principal's arrival. Looking closely, not just students were assembled in the auditorium but also some night types wearing the livery of the castle. What was that about? It was kind of a nasty atmosphere, like we were being watched. Everyone, thank you for coming, and for fighting in the emergency a few days ago. It made me very happy. It's due to everyone's hard work that we're all able to see each other safe like this. Really, thank you. The principal bowed. Although the principal seemed unobtrusive, when the demon attacks came, he'd been able to properly take command and get the frightened students to follow his lead. If anything, he felt more like a comrade in arms. So when I saw the principal bowing to us, I felt like saying, Oh, come on, you're right there with us. Well, I guess we weren't really that close. However, it seemed I wasn't the only one surprised at the principal's thanks and the students in the auditorium made a little stir as well. Now, let me get right to the point. We've received information on the territories, and also orders from the castle. I need to give you all some important information about your futures. The principal began his speech with a description of the situation the country currently found itself in. It seemed the situation of the country was more serious than I'd thought. The barrier around the capital city's forest hadn't been the only one to break. Since the capital city had a large population of magicians, it had relatively minor damage, but that couldn't be said for the other territories. It seemed that damage from demons had occurred in every territory, big or small, and many requests for aid had reached the castle. To sum up, whether to defeat the demons, repair the barriers, or undo the destruction, they needed magicians sent out. The castle seemed to be responding to as many requests as possible, but, apparently, they couldn't dispatch that many magicians. There may be some among you students who wish to return to your territories, as well. Especially, many of you magical students. Furthermore, even if that's not the case, there will likely be students who wish to return and check on your territories. Therefore, although there's still some time until vacation, the academy will shut down from today until the beginning of the new year. Of course, you may continue to use the dormitories as usual, since some students will likely be asked not to return as their territories are too dangerous, they will be welcome to stay in their current dormitory rooms. Furthermore, for those students planning to return to your territories, the castle will provide a carriage and small escort to deal with any demons you may encounter along the way. The principal suddenly made a bitter face. Then, the feeling of the magic wind that had been flowing from the principal's direction changed. There was a little ringing in my ears. Did the magic being used just change? His voice should only be audible to the students. Ritz let out, and soon after, I heard the principal's voice directly in my ear. To be frank, the country's response. No, the royal response has disappointed me. Although they say they can't afford to send magicians to the territories, the country is actually just unwilling to send magicians to the territories while they're still exposed to the threat of demons. They don't want to let them go, saying they're necessary for the defense of the castle and capital. The king has abandoned his duty. The castle knights are corrupt, and while it's said that knights will escort the students who return to their territories, few of them are willing to take part in the dangerous journeys around the territories. So the escort from the castle will also be small. Still, I know there are some students who need to return to their territories. While I pray for the safety of your territories, the journey, enduring the threat of demon attacks along the way, can never be called easy. But I am convinced, the students of this academy, who repelled the demon menace a few days ago, will surely be the salvation of the people still frightened by the threat of demons. It doesn't matter whether you can or cannot use magic. Every one of you has the power. The students in the auditorium fell silent at the principal's words. I, too, instinctively held my breath. Um, the slightly unreliable principal just did something really cool. However, after the principal's speech, 
A few of the knights from the castle noticed the strange situation and came up to seize the principal. The students also started up and were about to spring at the interrupting knights, but the principal stopped them. I'll be fine. I'm leaving the rest to Vice Principal Thomas. Please follow his instructions. After saying that, the principal was restrained by the knights and taken out of the auditorium. Principal, the people in the castle will be angry. Won't he be accused of a crime? I couldn't even remember his name. I thought it was something like Principal Borjana. Why did a principal with such a thin impression, and head of hair, suddenly do something so cool? It is as the principal has explained, those going to your territories, please speak up, tell someone from the castle, and they'll arrange a carriage and knights. With that, you're dismissed. R. Also, New Ruby Fallen, please come see me afterward, there seems to be a message from the castle for you. And so the vice principal, who had gotten up on stage in place of the principal, ended the first school meeting in a while. And, for some reason, I had been summoned. No, I'd had the feeling I would be summoned. It was probably about the matches, before the official unveiling. We'd used them all up. Even though there was no choice, since it was an emergency. Now that the existence of matches was known, I guess the castle would say something. Once the school meeting had dissolved, the students grew noisy, talking about the principal and consulting with their friends about the future. For the time being, I'd been summoned, so I had to go. I heard a big breath and Alan's voice beside me. You were called up. Will you be all right on your own? I'll be fine, I said and gave Alan as big a smile as I could manage. I noticed Charlie and Miss Katerina were also looking at me with worry. Thanks, everyone. It's probably about the matches. I'm not sure what we'll talk about, but, I can work out something good. I said and gave everyone another smile. Right, it's fine. It's my first big business meeting, probably something like that. I broke away from everyone and headed over to the vice principal, leaving the auditorium with the castle knights. 126. Demon Invasion 13, The Matchmaking Girl. The proud knight with a bushy beard and the timid young knight sat across from me, while the vice principal sat next to me. As I was trying to decide how I could start the conversation, one of the knights quickly jumped in. I'd like to hear about this. This match is a tool that you prepared, right? The proud, bearded knight said, holding a matchbox in his hand. He gave me an intimidating glare that made it clear what he thought about a child being able to make such a thing. How unpleasant. That's right. I made those, and distributed them to everyone to help against the demonic threat. Really? You, not he even a magician but a child, did that? Isn't that a lie? He finally expressed his doubt not just in attitude, but in words. Or should I say, I was more surprised he'd been circumspect with his displeasure for so long. Could this guy be a bigwig among the castle knights? It's not a lie that I gave them out to everyone. If things got emotional, they were almost sure to receive it harshly. So I tried to answer dispassionately. You know, lying won't help you. I'm not lying. Little brat. Well, fine. If you claim you prepared these, make some more for the castle. We'll use them to protect the castle from the demonic threat. Eh? What did he mean, for the castle? I didn't mind making some for the castle, but not for the whole castle, right? Rather. Since we'd already taken care of the demons in the capital, shouldn't we send them to the people in the other territories? The castle has very powerful magicians. So for now, I don't think they need matches. Never mind that, girlie, you just need to prepare the matches without making a fuss. We'll buy them properly, so no complaints. The bearded guy said and put a big leather sack on the table. From the sound it made, I guessed it was money. Quite a lot, it seemed. No. Most importantly, did that bearded guy just call me girly? Wait, wasn't that crossing over into rudeness? Why should I have to be called that by this bearded guy? Besides, if I gave my matches to the castle, would they be distributed to the people of the territories via the castle? Do you intend to distribute the prepared matches to the territories? Well, we'll share a few of them, but the defense of the castle is our top priority. It's only natural, the bearded guy face as proud as ever, said. I thought I got it. This was a nasty guy, but he was easy to understand. If I produced matches for the castle, 
he had little intention to distribute them to the other territories. Assuming matches were made in the castle, someone would need to make long, dangerous journeys to deliver them to the other territories. Would the knights, who wanted to stay snugly in the castle, take up that job? The government only cared about the defense of the castle and royal capital. Maybe they didn't have the leeway to think about it, but it was just too much. But if I refused to make matches here, there was bound to be trouble later. This order to prepare matches came from above. Maybe it'd be smart to prepare the minimum number they'd need to use in the castle, and then quickly return to Ruby Fallen. With a word of permission, I took a look in the bag. It was full of gold and even platinum coins. More than I imagined. I wonder how many matches they wanted to purchase with this amount. Incidentally, what quantity are you looking for? A lot. A lot? I'd like to go back to my territory after I make the matches, so I can't work with such vague instructions. Nah, you don't need to go back to your territory. Make matches in the castle. Lend us a hand. So he wanted me to keep making matches for the castle, without ever returning to my territory? What nonsense. I'm afraid that's not going to work. How were you going to use a lot of matches in the castle? It's only when you're out combating demons where your fire might suddenly go out that matches show their true worth. If you're somewhere there's no wind, why not just light a lamp? When I spoke a little harshly without thinking, the bearded face guy started for a moment and averted his eyes. What's with the scary face? You won't need to make a dangerous journey to your territory. Aren't you from Ruby Fallen? If you go back there, where no magicians are born, you'll just die. Quite the opposite. Aren't you lucky you don't need to go? Other provinces have requested help via light spiritualists, but we've heard nothing from Ruby Fallen. They might already be destroyed. Ha ha. Eh? He laughed just now, but I heard nothing funny. I was worried that there was no contact with Ruby Fallen. But that was probably because they didn't have any magicians who could handle light spirits. Be safe. Ruby Fallen, be safe. More than that, this guy. I really don't like this guy. The people of Ruby Fallen are stronger than you all think. They're safe. I need to confirm their safety with my own eyes, so I can't stay in the castle. What a weird girl you are. Yeah, in that case, just write out how you make them. Teach it to someone in the castle. That'll be fine. Absolutely not. I wouldn't know how they'd be used. Not only that, but matches could become gunpowder with one mistake in the recipe. I wasn't going to entrust them with something like that. Unfortunately, I can't do that, either. What? Are you going against the country? I have no intention of going against you. However, while it's true that I prepared and provided the matches, I don't know how to make them. It's a secret research project in Ruby Fallen. I had a special agreement with the Count. That's why I can't stay in the castle and make them, or provide a recipe. I smiled, and the bearded guy's face went red. What's that? Are you kidding me? If you can't make it yourself, you should have said so from the start. I believe that was something you misunderstood on your own. Besides, did you seriously think a child had the technology to make something so big? He'd been looking down at me as a little girl from the very beginning. Don't be rude, little girl, don't you want to serve your king? Honestly, not really. Or rather, everyone at school joined forces to attract the demons, so I think we've already contributed plenty. I want to do what I can. Of course, I even want to provide matches. So, how about this? I'll return to Ruby Fallen as soon as I'm ready. Please send some knights with me. You can ask how to make matches and return to the castle. Hopefully, everyone can endure a dangerous journey to, and life in, Ruby Fallen. I gave a huge smile as if to say, what a great suggestion. And the knight frowned reluctantly. He turned to the young knight next to him. Fine, you go. Go with this little girl and get the match technology from Ruby Fallen. Shaken by the words, the young knight who'd been silent until then was visibly dismayed. Eh, that's too sudden, Captain. It's not fair, such a dangerous. Apparently, the young knight was displeased as well. She was talking about how much she hated Ruby Fallen. Well, whatever. I already expected as much, Sir Knight. I gave my best smile of the day. The smile of a sweet little girl. It was the smile that made me look the most beautiful, which I determined after much research with Mamaku. I turned my face on the bearded guy. 
The look on his face shifted when he saw my exceptional smile. Ooh, looks like this guy just noticed I was pretty cute. Excuse me, Sir Knight. I'm sorry for bothering you people working in the castle. When I reach Ruby Fallen, I'll tell the Count about the situation so he can deliver matches to the castle. Well, it wouldn't just be the castle we'd offer matches to, but also the other territories, and rather than sending matches to the castle, I'd offload my rejects there. I held my cute little girl smile at the bearded guy so he wouldn't realize I was secretly thinking such things as though I were a devoted maiden wanting to do her best for her country. The bearded guy, whose feelings toward me seemed to have improved radically, gave a grin and nodded. Right, that will work. When you get a ruby fallen, start making matches immediately and send them to the castle. Yeah. Yes, yes. Then let's adjourn. I couldn't breathe the same air as this guy anymore. Ah, but I had to say the most important thing, first. Ah. I'll take the payment for the matches in advance. He he, I gave a playful smile for good measure, grabbed the leather sack full of gold coins off the table, and left without giving them time to stop me. Leaving hurriedly, I didn't hear any voice commanding me to stop, although it was just a verbal promise, the castle sure was generous to give me such a large sum of money. Or perhaps the bearded guy just didn't understand. He might believe it's just naturally an honor and a duty to give things to the magicians and royal family, and may not have even considered otherwise. I seared the face of the bearded guy into my blacklist, but somehow he seemed a little pitiable. Well, he was still going on the blacklist. Mew, are you alright? The parted hair magician who'd left the room with me said anxiously, Do I look alright? I feel terrible, I said over my shoulder still walking, and parted hair apologized. No, it's fine, it's not your fault, vice principal. And thank you for not interrupting my story about not knowing how to make matches. Naturally, I don't like the way the castle does things, either. I was a little surprised at the vice principal's words and looked back at him. He'd really changed his ambience, hadn't he? Vice principal, is your reserve of matches secure? I don't have the ingredients on hand anymore so I can't make them right now. But do you seem to have enough? I stopped and checked my bag to see how many matchboxes I had left. I'm fine. Besides, I've been ordered by the country to defend the academy. And honestly, I don't think we'll be fighting demons anymore, so it wouldn't make sense for me to have them. The only thing I can do is try to make sure the principal isn't charged with a big crime by the castle. So, I'll be passing on some matches to students returning to their territories who are good at fire magic. Is that so? No, wasn't the vice principal too calm? Would he be okay when he ran out of tranquilizing matches? As I was wondering if parted hair had been replaced by a fake, he took out three boxes of matches and gave them to me. If you're going back to Ruby Fallen, take these matches. Gloria is in Ruby Fallen. Give them to her. Gloria? Gloria must be Bash's wife. One of Ruby Fallen's few magicians. Although she was sickly and I rarely saw her party. Professor Thomas, do you know the lady? Why give her matches? Gloria is my younger sister. And she's also an excellent fire magician. Ha! Huh. The Lady Gloria was a fire magician. I didn't know. What? Parted hair's younger sister? Then, since I'm nominally Gloria's adopted daughter, does that mean Vice Principal Thomas is my... Professor. You were my uncle? Well, something like that. Oh no. So I was unknowingly doing black market deals with my own relative? Anyway, I want to be sure those matches get a Gloria. I'm sure her power will help the territory. Thank you very much. However, I still have some of my own matches left, and I'm supposed to have a lot of ingredients waiting at Ruby Fallen, so I can make as many as I want. So, is that okay, um, Uncle Thomas? Uck. No, I said it myself, but it was really hard to call him uncle. Now, you can still call me Professor. That sounds weird. That's right. I felt the same way. But I want these matches delivered to Gloria, Vice Principal Thomas said and forced the boxes of matches on me. What was that all about? Well, if he insisted, I wouldn't push back. I put the matchboxes in my bag and said, I understand. 127. Demon Invasion 14. The place where everyone was. Of course, 
since I was also part of the returning group. I also made my preparations. I distributed the remaining few matches, keeping some for myself, and also made and distributed smoke bombs. If we encountered demons on our way, we could ignite the smoke bombs to send a signal. It was a trivial thing, but every little bit would help avoid danger when facing demons. As soon as I was ready, I made to leave, but the entrance to the capital from school was packed, and I had to wait my turn to exit. Outside the school, carriages loaded with our luggage were lined up. While I waited, I heard that Ritz was leaving via the relatively vacant north gate, and went to see him off. More people than I'd imagined had decided to return to their territories. For every territory other than Ruby Fallen, there were bound to be magical students. Many of the provinces had assembled a single group centering on the magical students, who would return to their territories together. After all, if something happened and there weren't any magicians around, their safety would be compromised. Ritz was a magician from Golbatendor, in the northeast. Since the students from that territory had already prepared to return together, they were departing early today. Since I'm the only one from a territory north of the capital, I'll have to part with everyone here, Ritz said, a little lonely. Ruby Fallen, Rainforest, and Katarina's Genesis province were located south of the capital. In particular, the Genesis province was at the southernmost tip. Our south side team planned to travel together part of the way. However, great teacher Ritz from the north side would have to leave us here. Ritz, be well. Alan, you too. The two shook hands firmly. Was this male bonding? Well, if it was great teacher Ritz, he'd be safe. When it came to reading the atmosphere, great teacher Ritz had a talent that surpassed us all. After great teacher Ritz's manly handshake with Alan, he turned to the three girls of Miss Katerina's Genesis province. Katerina's group, when are you leaving? We'll be out by today, but since it's a long way to the Genesis province, after all, we're bringing a lot with us, and it took time to prepare. Katerina sighed, her face worn. She was tired even before she left. Miss Salome, watching her with concern, turned to me. You, what will you do? Didn't those castle knights say they didn't want to go to Ruby Fallen, and wouldn't accompany you? Will you be okay? Miss Salome said, after some difficulty. Right. The castle knights weren't interested in a territory like Ruby Fallen with no magicians, and they wouldn't be sending anyone with me. However, they did lend me a carriage. I wished they'd at least have sent a coachman along with it, since Ruby Fallen and Rainforest are next to each other. The plan is that I'll be able to go with Alan's group most of the way. At Rainforest I can hire a spare coachman and get to Ruby Fallen that way. Yeah, if I can hire one. At worst, since Mamaku and I were traveling together. Is that so? Then are you the only student returning to Ruby Fallen, you? Yeah. Yes. Some of the Ruby Fallen students talked about going home together. But since I don't know how things are there, I decided to go first. And I can't bring too many people since it'd be a bother to Alan's group on the way. Miss Katerina, who had been nodding agreement while listening, looked down and then back up as if she'd decided something. If you'd like, I'll see you to Ruby Fallen Manor. Genesis Province is also next to Ruby Fallen, just further along the way. Looking at Miss Katerina's serious eyes, worried about me, I felt a little happy. Thank you very much, but although you say it's along the way, coming to Ruby Fallen Manor would still be a detour for you. Katerina, you're a Genesis Province magician. For the sake of those waiting on your aid, please go straight home without delay. It would certainly be easy, safe, and fun if she saw me home. But, after all, I can't let myself be spoiled like that. That's that's true, it's as you say, Ryu, what I need to give the highest priority to is protecting Genesis province. Miss Katerina, after a moment looking pained, gave a troubled laugh and said, thanks. I'm the one who should be thanking you for your concern. You be careful on the way, too, Katerina. Well, since you have Salome and Charlie, I'm not worried. Miss Salome, standing next to Miss Katerina, winked leave it to me. Big sister Salem is so cool, and Charlie took my hand with beautiful, watery eyes, Miss Ryu, you have to be safe, you absolutely must. I looked back at Charlie, who seemed about to cry, 
and put my hand over hers, with a smile. I'll be safe. I don't die that easily. I have recovery magic, anyway. I'll probably be fine. It'll be lonely after all. Miss Katerina muttered, as Charlie and I were saying our reluctant farewells. We'll be good for now, Miss Katerina's group. After all, the southern group will be together for a while. I'm going to go say goodbye to everyone now, Ritz laughed. Right, Katerina. Anyway, Charlotte and I are also coming to Genesis province. So don't look like you're about to cry, hee <laughs> hee. You can't cure a cry baby. When Miss Salome teased her a bit, Miss Katerina spoke in a rush. I am not crying. I'm not a crybaby, either. I just, a little, thought it was, just a bit, lonely, just a bit. Apparently, she got shy, thinking she was being teased. That said, seeing Miss Katerina saying things in such a dear way, I thought it was Miss Salome's plan to try to cheer her out of her loneliness and lethargy, flustered, her face crimson. Miss Katerina let out such a flood of Tsundir style talk that I was afraid she wouldn't be able to speak to anyone for a while. I'd miss her, but we couldn't afford not to return to our territories. That was true for everyone. Even I needed to go to Ruby Fallen to make sure the territory was safe. The knights in the castle had somehow decided Ruby Fallen was done for, but there was hope. I put my hand on the shoulder of Miss Katerina, who said, I'm not crying. Huffily. It will be fine. It's just for a bit. We can see each other next school year. It wasn't like we were parting forever. Everyone would reunite when the next semester began, next year. At my comment, Miss Katerina stopped sniffing and said, Right, it's just a little while. I'll see you all again next semester, nodding rapidly. Suddenly, we heard a voice in the distance calling, Sir Ritz. Looking at the voice, a student beckoned, calling to Ritz. Apparently, Ritz's group was already leaving. I felt somewhat sorry to part with him, too, but when I tried to send Ritz off, Miss Katerina said, wait a minute. We looked on as Miss Katerina searched through her bag and took out a beautiful box. When she carefully opened the box, it held six beautiful shells of light pink. Katerina took out one piece. It shone with a pretty gloss. This is a cherry bloss shellfish of the highest quality that can be found in my province. As you probably know, it's a specialty of our territory. I sent away for it recently. Miss Katerina suddenly started boasting about her hometown and drew herself up. As we waited for her next words, she hesitated a little with a red face, then said, L look, earlier, when Salem gave me a beautiful shell, and I told everyone I'd had it made into a necklace, you were all envious right? So I decided to make them for you, and had these ordered. No, I don't recall being especially envious. Yeah, that said, Miss Katerina seemed to have prepared seashells in consideration for everyone. She was pretty cute, talking about it in such a shy manner. Also, her ringlets had started looking more and more like dog ears. Miss Salome next to her had the look of an owner gently watching her cute dog's efforts. Although it's come to this before I could make them into accessories. And Miss Katerina passed out seashells to each of us. As the shells were of the highest quality, their color, size, and shape were all exquisite. A. Eh? I wasn't really looking at the necklace envious. Ow. Alan almost butted in uselessly, so I stamped on his foot with all my strength. Looking carefully, Miss Salem was stepping on his other foot. Alan, who'd hurt both his legs bent down and rubbed the tops of his feet, sighing. Foolish henchman. I turned from my silly henchman to Ms. Katerina. Thank you, such a beautiful cherry bloss shell. Can I really keep it? D don't misunderstand. I'm not giving it to you. Because I haven't made them into accessories yet. I'm just depositing them with you. So, when we get together next year, give it back. At that time, I'll make accessories. So that, that's why we have to all come back. Saying that, her face turning redder and redder with embarrassment. Miss Katerina gave you HMMPH, and turned away. I had wondered why she'd suddenly passed out the shells, but now I saw, she wanted something like a good luck charm. Certainly, it was a dangerous journey. We didn't know what the territories were like, and the chance of encountering demons was extremely high. I understood Miss Katerina's feeling of wanting a promise. I understood, but in my previous world, this would be called a flag, 
No, let's stop thinking about such things. Let me also be complicit in this luck charm Miss Katerina went to such lengths to prepare. He he, I understand. Then, when the new semester starts, I'll have you make me a brooch with my seashell, Miss Katerina. Miss Katerina threw out her chest as if to say, leave it to me. Miss Salome, watching with amusement, also spoke out. In that case, I'll have a pair of earrings. Charlie and Ritz, who could read the atmosphere, continued the flow. I'm fine with a bracelet. I think I'd like a tie pin. Finally, Alan, looking at everyone's faces, noticed what was going on and spoke, looking at his hair. I, I guess I'll have a decorated hair band. We all laughed as we made promises for the future. I knew it would be a dangerous trip, but I felt at peace. I wouldn't think about leaving everyone now and departing on a dangerous journey where there might be demons. But, more so, I felt that everyone would be okay. The principal had also said, it doesn't matter whether you can or cannot use magic. Every one of you has the power. I thought back on my life at the academy so far. Being stalked by Alan, and Miss Katerina's HMMPH. S. Getting heartburn from Sleazy's sleaze, and annoyed at the vice principal's attitude. There were miserable things, too. However, I'd reconciled with Alan, and made friends with Charlie and Ritz, Miss Katerina and Miss Salome, before I knew it. Sleazy was still sleazy, but vice principal Thomas had softened, somewhat. It was strange. Before I knew it, people who were complete strangers had become strangers no longer. I'd been sure I couldn't get along with Miss Katerina or Vice Principal Thomas. They were completely different from my first impression. I wondered if everyone had changed, or was it me who had changed? I looked to the southern sky. I'd return to Ruby Fallen, to the territory where magicians weren't born. I thought there was something only I could do there. And then I had to come back, to this place where everyone was. Part 2, The Reincarnated Girl's Youth and Author's Note. So, the second part of the school arc is done. Thank you for reading. And thanks to everyone who's read up to here. Really, thank you very much. I'm thinking the third part will be subtitled The Reincarnated Girl's Rescue Period. And, I apologize, but I'm planning to release the next update in two or three weeks. When I begin, I think I want to do a starting sprint with continuous updates. I'll post updates on my blog, so that's all for now. Well then, thank you very much. I look forward to your continued support. 128. Prologue. The Lady Knight who longed to be a hero. I was guarding the castle, although really there was nothing to do, so I was killing time with my fellow castle knights as usual, when a huge shock resounded as if a wall had been destroyed. Although panicked by the uproar, we managed to gather intel that apparently a large number of demons were attacking the kingdom. I couldn't believe it. This was probably the first time that demons had ever attacked the royal capital. At least, such a thing had never happened in the three years I'd served in the castle, and I'd never heard of it in my history classes at school. After all, the demons were supposed to be sealed off by the magician's barriers, though there were many knights like me guarding the castle. Nothing dangerous had ever happened before, because the magicians always did something about it. I didn't think my rushing around could do anything about the demons, but we got a sortie order to a place being attacked by the demons, so we raced over. As I ran, I reviewed what I remembered about demons. I'd studied them in books, but I had no further information on them. Of course, I had never actually met a demon in practice. In a country protected by magician provided barriers, I'd heard stories of demons that sometimes made it out between cracks, but that almost never happened. At least, not in the 25 years I'd been alive. But now, they were attacking in large quantities. It was a national emergency. And I was a knight of the realm. As I ran and thought about such things, perhaps because I got a second wind, my feelings strangely rose and I remembered back before I served in the castle. I was actually arranged to marry a man who was a mid-level merchant, but I was completely against it and complained to my parents until they gave in and let me take knighthood. As the only daughter among five brothers, my parents coddled me. I'd longed to be a knight since I was little. As a child, I'd fallen in love with the heroes from the stories. I decided I wanted to be like that. But when I'd actually taken that path, 
I'd been disappointed at its current situation. Working in the castle sounded good, but all I did every day was idly chat with my colleagues. Knights of the Realm had a grand name, but nothing to do. However, it was an honorable job, and my merchant parents had invested a lot of money to give it to me. Besides, I'd become accustomed to that safe castle work, and hadn't the courage to overturn it, but just killing time with bad company every day. But today was different, different from usual. Finally, I felt like I could do my job. I found my old passion bubbling up, to be the strong knight I'd longed for in the past. To be an aide to the magicians and a protector of the common folk. And one of the heroes from the tales. When we arrived at the place with the demons, there were things like creepy toads with wings. I wasn't good with frogs. And because they had human faces on the frogs' heads, I felt even more disgusted. As we tried to make out the demon's appearance, another knight's figure caught my eye. He was already injured. Had he already challenged that creepy demon? Amazing. A wound of honor. My knees shook. But if I shrunk back here, I wouldn't be fit to be called a knight. I'd go. Because I was a knight of the realm, I pulled out the sword at my waist and clasped it with all my power. I'd do it. Me. This might be what I was waiting for. To be honest. I wasn't confident in my abilities, it was thanks to my wealthy merchant parents money and connections that I'd been able to become a knight, but even so, I thought I could contribute, so I stepped in and tried to charge the demon, but the demon had already been skewered with a sword before I realized it, it gasped and went rigid, transfixed by the sword, what had happened? My stunned sight met the figure of a person wearing soft, loose clothing, I focused on him. He tilted his head, with a bored look. Why are the demons? Ah, could the rain have ruined the barrier? What a hassle. He said and chanted something at the demon, which had already stopped moving. I couldn't tell what he said, probably a spell. Then flames flared up from the lamp he held and enveloped the demon. It burned quietly away. He was a magician. Furthermore, this was the current king's younger brother Henry rumored to be our next king. Why was such a noble? As I stood dazed at the sudden situation, Sir Henry looked at me. No, if anything, he looked behind me. Just as I realized it, Sir Henry threw something like a stone at me. The stone transformed into a sword and flew right by my head, and I immediately heard an indescribably creepy cry. When I turned around, panicked, there was a new winged demon with a sword stuck into its head. It seemed a demon had crept up behind me before I knew it. As it made a pitiful whine, a new sword sliced into it and it stuck, unable to move, and the flame flew out and burned it again. It was so quick, I couldn't do a thing. Somehow I lost strength and fell to my knees. No, it wasn't that, I was in front of Sir Henry, a magician of the royal family. It was only natural to kneel. It was natural. Right. This was natural, but I felt like my knees, which were shaking in front of the demon just a moment ago, still had some power. At this rate, there'll be even more demons, Sir Henry said, thinking out loud. I, however, was silent. There was nothing I could say to a magician of the royal family. Hey you, you're a knight? If so, how about you clean up the demons? Thanks. I heard his voice as I bowed my head. After I somehow gave a quick assent, Sir Henry left. Off to deal with the rest of the demons? I got up slowly and looked around. The fire that had been burning the demons had disappeared, leaving only ash. I had to clean it up. The other knights also began moving sluggishly, perhaps to clean up. I noticed I was still holding my sword in my right hand. What on earth had I been thinking? A while ago. Defeating the demons? Like a hero? What an idiot. I already knew such a thing was impossible. I wasn't a magician. The sword on my waist was purely decorative. When would such a thing ever be useful? Indeed, a broom would be more useful, at the very least. If I was just working to clear away the demon's ashes, I could actually use the broom as opposed to the sword. As we cleaned up the demons the magicians had defeated, before I knew it. Thanks to the magicians, the demon threat had been repelled. After all, with magicians, it would work out somehow. The magicians also went down to the capital, and they defeated the demons. We were just cleaning up. 
As usual, when we met and repelled the final attack at the academy, I was surprised at the determination of the non-magical students, but to be honest, I thought it stupid. I didn't get the point of getting so worked up. After all, the magicians would take care of things. Doing anything was pointless. Knowing that the barriers weren't broken only around the capital, some of the academy students decided to return to their territories. It seemed we were to lend them carriages and some of the country's knights. I was also assigned as an escort. I was supposed to have a cushy job at the castle, but I've got no luck. However, many of the returning students were magicians. If I was attached to some magicians, they'll be able to take care of it. Only, that true be fallen. If I went to such a cursed region where magicians weren't born, I probably wouldn't make it back alive. To begin with, since there weren't magicians there. I was more likely to die on the way back to the territory. That was the one place I didn't want to go. Hey, as you get over here. As I was considering my future, my captain called me over. The captain was always drunk. Since about a year ago, when the price of alcohol fell so dramatically and anyone could buy delicious, cheap liquor, he'd carried a bottle everywhere. Yo, big merchant's girl, you're good at math. Sorry, but count the money in this bag. He held out a leather bag, it felt heavy, it contained gold and even platinum coins. THTH. This, how did you get this? So much money. I said excitedly, I guess the country wants us to buy matches or something with it. Right, you come too. You're a merchant's daughter, you're good at that. No, I don't really know anything about business. My big brother is the one who learned all about that. I said with a salute. But the captain ignored it and gave me a look. Come on, it's fine. Since it was a command from my boss, there was nothing I could do. I followed him dejectedly. Speaking of which, what were these matches? The time came to meet the person who made the matches and discuss business. Surprisingly, the other party was an underage little girl. Apparently, she was an academy student in the School of Commerce. However, she seemed to be examining us calmly with a grown-up face unlike that of a child. It scared me. Somehow, listening to the girl's conversation with the captain, apparently matches referred to a box that could light fires easily. It was a mysterious box that the academy students had used to defeat the demons. Had this girl created such a magical box? She couldn't be a magician. Could she? Not only that, but to my surprise, this girl seemed to have come from Ruby Fallen, the daughter of the Count of that place abandoned by magic. Together with her earlier unchildlike attitude, it was extremely eerie. Furthermore, the moment the captain said that Ruby Fallen had already been destroyed, she looked really scary. My captain really was an idiot. He might get puffed up when he's drunk. But why would he say such a thing? In the end, it felt like the captain had been cajoled somehow and she took the gold coins. The captain said, All right, that went well, what do you think? I can do this kind of stuff, too. Even though I brought you along, you were useless. He laughed, but no matter how I thought about it, it hadn't gone well. We just lost the gold coins. Come to think of it, I'd recently heard from my father that Ruby Fallen and Rainforest had been working on some big things together. The alcohol coming into the capital came from a rainforest company so it was thought to be produced in rainforest, but it was actually from Ruby Fallen. I glanced at the liquor the captain was holding. By this point, alcohol had spread among the people regardless of class. If it originated in Ruby Fallen. How frightening. How could that be possible? Because no magicians were born in Ruby Fallen. Its only future should have been going to ruin. But this alcohol, these matches with these two, it might become a wealthy territory even without magicians. But. That was impossible now, because the barriers had broken. Indeed, if demons attacked a territory where no magicians were born, it would be the end. Because there was almost no way they could fight demons. When the captain said that Ruby Fallen had already been destroyed, he'd been thoughtless, but also correct. Even if we didn't say it, everyone knew it. But, still, the girl's eyes looked as if she hadn't given up. After that, she borrowed a government carriage and left the academy holding the reins of the carriage herself. The original plan was for the country to assign knights as escorts, but all the kingdom's knights assigned to Ruby Fallen had fled, so she had no coachman. So a red-headed woman, 
or maybe a man she seemed to know alternated taking the reins with her as they returned to their territory. Reckless. What was the point of doing such reckless things for a territory that had already fallen? Not only that, but she left the other ruby fallen students behind at the school since it was dangerous and unknown. I was assigned to escort the carriage to Rainforest Province. The carriages of the school students formed a line as they traveled. Since Rainforest and Ruby Fallen were neighbors, they would be following the same course for a while. I took guard duty behind the carriages headed to Rainforest. From there, I could see that you of Ruby Fallen girl if I looked back. The Count's daughter who took the reins herself. Her luggage was also fairly light, with only one carriage. No. She might have had no choice but to do that to an onlooker. The idea of a noble woman doing that was wretched. But after all, in her eyes was no resignation, no civility, no wretchedness at all. Rather, a great beauty. For some reason, I remembered the heroes of the stories that captured my heart as a child. 129. Homeward Journey 1 Red smoke is a sign of demons. Mamaku and I sat on one carriage loaded with all the luggage we were taking to Ruby Fallen. Although it was only the two of us sitting on the driver's seat, there were many other carriages around, so it was quite crowded and noisy. It turned out that somehow, or should I say, as expected, although even my carriage was supposed to be escorted by a knight of the realm, there were no knights with the guts to defend us on our journey to Ruby Fallen. So frankly this school group situation saved us. Because it would indeed have been hard for me and Mamaku to return home along a path full of roaming demons. However, as we progressed toward our territories, it felt like everyone was branching out toward their own territories. So it became more and more a two-person journey, just Mamaku and me. Scary. Or rather, Common sense says just two people can't make the journey, so we were planning to hire someone new in Rainforest before we continue to Ruby Fallen, though I wasn't sure whether there'd be anyone to hire, but if we couldn't hire anyone, no way, this is really tough. I couldn't help but raise my voice while consulting with Mamaku about our future plans, however, Mamaku seemed to have the same feeling, nodding deeply, it really is. Perhaps we'd better get rid of the carriage and ride the horse together. With no luggage, we'd be faster, so we'd have less chance of meeting demons, and even if we were attacked, the horse might be fast enough to escape. Yeah, but there's a lot of important stuff in our luggage. I want to bring it if we can. That's true, too. As Mimaku spoke, there was a hubbub outside the carriage. Poking my head out the window. I saw red smoke rising into the blue sky at the front of the line. That smoke was from a colored smoke ball I gave the students in each carriage just in case. A red smoke ball indicated a demon attack. It's red smoke. Looks like some demons appeared. Mamaku, I'll be right back. Wait, Mew. I can't let you go alone. I'll come, too. Eh? But if so, who's going to drive the carriage? Ruby Fallen was the number one least popular territory since there were no knights up to escort us. We were even doing the coachman's job ourselves. E even though I was a count's daughter, I can't let you go alone. Ah, wait. You over there. Come here. Mamaku called to a knight riding a little ahead. She was a female knight with bluish black hair in a ponytail. The group of carriages in front of us were people from Rainforest. Alan's group of carriages was just ahead of them. So the knight looking person riding parallel to them should be a knight of the realm assigned to guard the students of Rainforest. Yes, yes. You, right there. Can you come here for a moment? Mamaku wriggled even more than usual at the knight. The knight turned to face us, surprised at the sudden address. She seemed totally scared of what we Ruby Fallen people might do. She didn't need to be scared of simple wriggling. I think. Hey, come on. Get over here. There's nothing to be afraid of. I only need you to take over this carriage for a moment, and we'll borrow your horse in the meantime. Mimaku said it in a gentle voice, but the propositioned knight still gave us a suspicious look. At last. Mamaku grew stern, tired of waiting. Really? Do you have no self-respect? Come on, it's fine. It's just for a minute. It's an easy coachman's job. Look, gold. Do it for gold. She said in a threatening voice. Ooh, scary. The knight she'd invited over turned pale, but dismounted and climbed into the coachman's seat. Huh? 
This was a night from before, sitting next to that nasty bearded guy who approached me about making matches. She became a rainforest escort knight. Mamaku gave the money to the knight. Then we mounted the horse the knight had been riding. Mamaku and I rode double on the horse. That took me back. Somehow, when we rode the horse up to where the smoke was coming from, the demon had already been defeated. Apparently, magical students nearby had defeated it with their magic. It was covered with flames and surrounded, including delighted knights of the realm. But we couldn't let our guard down. Yet, a demon appearing like this was proof that a barrier had collapsed nearby. There was a high chance that there were other demons around. I looked around carefully, looking left and right. There were no demons, nor were there any flying up in the sky. And then I noticed something while looking down and thinking. The ground under the absent-minded knights of the realm was trembling. No way, it cracked. Were they coming through? There, get back. I said, jumping off the horse. I slammed into the knight, who was frowning in confusion at my words, and knocked him down. Ow, but a hair's breadth from where the knight had been. An arm sprouted with thick, sharp claws like a mole's. The arm waved around to catch what was above, but no one was there. So it sliced only air. Borrowing the finely wrought sword of the knight I had knocked down, I thrust it with all my strength into the ground where something seemed to be. I heard an ah, or rather the indescribable groan of a demon. However, it didn't feel like a fatal wound, and it felt like the ground moved a bit again, so I jumped back from where I plunged the sword. Another mole-like hand came out where I'd just been. Wait, you. Don't rush out by yourself. It's dangerous. Mimaku said, picking me up and putting me on the horse she was riding. Mimaku was a muscle man. Then a magical student cast a spell and the ground where I stuck the sword rose the demon appearing from the earth as though being pushed out. The sword had pierced its left shoulder, but it could still move its arm and dug into the ground in an attempt to hide. So to stop that arm from moving, I took aim with an arrow and shot that part of the mole's arm. Other students were also attacking bravely, throwing swords at it. Meanwhile, one of the students lit a match and passed it to a magical student, who hit it with fire magic. The demon which had already been attacked in various places and couldn't move, let itself be taken by the flames. All right. I looked all around to see if there were any other demons. I saw neither hide nor hair of any demons. No demons, but from the other carriages, a crowd of students surrounded me, calling, a demon? Is it safe? What promising school spirit. Ultimately, no more demons appeared after that, but since demons had appeared, it was likely that a nearby barrier had collapsed. We had to go repair it immediately, but if we halted the progress of the whole school group, their time of arrival at the branch territories would be delayed. So the students from the superior province and the knights assigned to escort them, among whom the demons had appeared, went to restore the barrier. Work hard. Best of luck. The students of the other territories would continue together. But it was really painful to think that our group walking together would soon branch off the same way. When Mimaku and I returned to our carriage together, the Knight of the Realm we'd requested earlier said she could keep acting as coachman, so we gratefully accepted. She still seemed a little timid, but maybe she had her good points after all. Back when negotiating about matches, she'd been sitting next to the rude bearded guy, so I thought I'd blacklist her, but I couldn't blacklist her just yet. Okay. 130. Homewardry Journey 2. The Kindness of Mamaku. Extra. The release of Volume 2 of Resume of a Reincarnated Girl has been confirmed. Few. For details, please see the postscript and blog. Mew. Why do you keep fighting so recklessly? Seriously. No matter how many lives you have, they're not enough. No, it wasn't reckless, it's just that, um, I was confident I could make it. That's enough. Yes, mom. I was currently being scolded and thumped by an angry Mamaku. I'd been fighting a demon just now, but it had been covered in such thick scales that bows couldn't penetrate them, and there were no magicians nearby. So I held my bow to the last second to take it down on my own, waiting for the demon to come right up to me before loosing my arrow. The point-blank arrow shot went straight through the thing's head, and when it slowed its charge, I stuck a sword between its jaws to stop them from moving and got the other students to stab it with swords, bringing it down, I thought it would work, so I did it, 
but I guess from an outsider's perspective it looked like I recklessly approached the demon and threw myself into its fangs, I defeated the demon, who, as I was soaking in that sense of accomplishment, Mamaku, riding her horse, looked down at me with a terrible expression, I thought her glare would shoot me dead, Mamaku was really scary, no, I definitely didn't go in there intending to get bitten, I was only planning for it to bite the sword, but even if my arm was bitten, I figured I had healing magic, so I took the plunge, but that was something I couldn't talk about at the moment, Mamaku was furious at my behavior, she thought that I'd been throwing my life away, not just now but previously as well, so currently she was bringing me back to the carriage and using the time to scold me, Mamaku was scary, from the start, I've honestly been against the idea of returning to the territory, it's too dangerous, but you really wanted to go back, Mew, and I understood your feelings, I was also worried about Bash, so I thought we'd go back together, but whenever there's danger, you stick your neck out, if you keep fighting so recklessly, I'm taking you back to the capital, no more discussion, why you can't, I clung to her, begging, but Mamaku wouldn't soften her hard glare, just now, she barely used her big sister tone, when she's seriously angry, she starts speaking like a man again, when that happens, it's as bad as it can get, our two person carriage was shrouded in a strange tension, Mew, what's happened to you, you've been reckless long before this, but recently you're going too far, I had a feeling that Mamaku, seeing through everything as she does, was starting to suspect something, I looked down, thinking, I wasn't sure whether I should tell her, about my healing magic, if I told her, she might be able to see why I've been going a bit too far, if I leave things as they are, I might be taken back to the capital, but, if you don't talk to me, I can't protect you, Mew, Mamaku said, putting a hand on my shoulder, when I looked up again, her face was serious, I couldn't turn my eyes away, but what would Mamaku think if I told her about my healing magic, I might be getting her involved in something dangerous, after all, it's a national secret, so it'd be better not to tell her, for her own sake, if I obediently apologized and said I wouldn't be reckless anymore, I should be able to continue the journey, besides, it'd be dangerous returning to the capital, too, since we'd been repairing barriers and defeating the demons that appeared along the way, it may be unlikely we'd encounter any on the way back, but it wasn't 100%. Mamaku must have realized that, too. Yeah, I'd apologize here, and not make a big deal out of it. From now on, I'd suppress my recklessness as much as possible, to keep my healing magic a secret. So, but my words wouldn't come. I'm sorry. I'll be careful from now on. I won't act dangerously. Even though that's all I had to say. I couldn't form the words, Mamaku's earnest face was right in front of me, I couldn't say something so much like a lie, she was just worried about me, and because of me, for me, really, Mamaku, at last, the only thing I could get out was her name, just the shape of it on my lips was reassuring, right, I, I honestly felt heavy hearted, thinking about healing magic, it was painful being attacked by demons and worrying about our territory, but it was just as painful concealing my healing magic, and it was scary, it was scary that I might be the only one who knew what the country was hiding, at first, when I learned about magic, I was delighted, excited and curious at finding something amazing, I tried so many things, but that didn't last long, I became afraid of my knowledge, I was nervous that someone would find out, I was scared to cast magic spells whose meaning I didn't understand, nothing seemed to have any effect, but thinking that something terrible might actually be happening to my body, I could barely sleep at night, above all, it was painful that I had nobody to talk to, nobody to understand my feelings, I was afraid that the government would find out and didn't want anyone to know, but even more so it was hard and painful that I had no one to share my feelings with, also, I was afraid to imagine how, if this secret were known to those close to me, they'd look at me differently, would everyone see me as they had before, they might be creeped out, or someone might sell me out to the government, I didn't want to imagine myself doubting my loved ones, I really just hated the whole thing, by now, I would have been better off not knowing these things, therefore, although I knew that I should be doing various experiments and unraveling the magic, 
that such useful magic might benefit everyone. I'd been procrastinating. When my response stuck in my throat, Minmaku smiled. It's okay. Whatever it is, I'm on your side. My eyes burned at her calm voice. But, Mamaku, if I tell you about it, you might regret it. Because I think it's a big problem. You might get really scared, and wish you'd never asked, and even come to hate me, Mamaku. I would never. Really? You? You really think so little of me? I'm offended, she said, giving me my favorite smile as usual. You? Thinking of you alone being hurt? Hurts me. My vision blurred. She was so kind. Minmaku was too kind. When she said something like that, really, what could I do? Because I was already at my limit. It was so, so heavy I couldn't bear it, someone. Mamaku had to know. With Mamaku, I could believe it would be okay. Besides, if I told Minmaku, even if a lot of people found out, I surely wouldn't regret it. I spoke in a low voice, still sobbing. So the coachman wouldn't overhear. You see, I, um, discovered some magic. Some magic that even we might be able to use. I found it. Then I told her everything, with my tears still pattering down. That I'd found some magic at school that even non-magicians could use. That the effects could only be activated on oneself. That the country might be hiding the magic. And how afraid I was. Minmaku stroked my head, saying nothing, the whole time. My story was incoherent, I think because I kept crying and just spewing out unconnected thoughts, and I couldn't really explain how I knew about the healing spells, but Minmaku listened silently the whole time, without saying anything or digging deeper. When my voice finally wound down to just sobbing, Minmaku pressed my head against her chest. Mew, you've had a hard time, thank you for telling me. Relieved by Minmaku's gentle voice, I burst into more tears. Those were the words I'd wanted for so long. I'd wanted her to say, gently, as if speaking to a small child, that it was hard, that it was painful, and for her to accept me. How could Mamaku always give me exactly the words I needed? That night, I'd cried so much I fell into a deep sleep, which I hadn't done in a long time. I already wrote this in the foreword, but the release of Volume 2 of Resume of a Reincarnated Girl has been confirmed. The release date is June 30th, TL, of 2016. I was only able to release two volumes because of your readers. Everyone's impressions and reviews gave me the encouragement I needed to do my best. Thank you so much. I have nothing but gratitude. Me, that's funny. My eyes are getting worse. The only thing I can see is my gratitude. Feels like that. Really? Thank you very much. I appreciate your continued support for both the web and book versions. 131. Homewardry Journey 3. Happy Magic Study Group. Casting the spell in front of Mamaku. I instantly healed, with tingling pain, the cuts I'd received in the battle with the demon. Mamaku looked surprised, touching and rubbing the former wounds to confirm it. How surprising. They healed instantly. Yes, but when they're healing, I feel pain. The more serious the injury, the sharper the pain. Also, that spell you chanted just now. I felt like I could make it out. Somehow, when a magician casts a spell, I can never understand what they're saying at all. That spell just now, I could almost understand. Maybe that means you could learn that spell, Mamaku, if you work hard at it. Mamaku's body gave a start at my words, and stopped moving. I guess she was surprised. I'd wondered what kind of reaction she'd give to actually seeing my magic. I felt a little nervous. Ha ha. It's funny. We might be able to use magic. If Alex found out, I think he'd faint. Like, we hated magic so much, but we were actually magicians ourselves. Mamaku gave a somewhat lonely laugh. I'm sorry, Mamaku, it's my... After all, I couldn't keep the magic to myself. So I told Mamaku. I took advantage of Mamaku, but it seemed like it would be a burden after all. What are you apologizing for? You, you haven't done anything wrong. If I must say, you were rather too slow in telling me. You, you've been carrying everything yourself so far. I wish you'd rely on me a little more. Okay. I almost started crying again, and couldn't say anything more, so I clung to Mamaku's arm holding back the tears that threatened to spill out. Funny, after meeting Minmaku, 
I feel like I've become a terrible crybaby. I barely ever recall crying in my previous life, and when I was sold in Garigari village, or when I was abducted by bandits, or rather, boss, I didn't cry. Really? I couldn't keep relying on Mamaku anymore. I was already 13, I was racing down the path. Mother Complex Road. I knew it was no good to keep going like this, but I couldn't help it, Mamaku spoiled me so much. Anyway, in this country you're said to be an adult at 15, so until the last minute, as I was making excuses for my ongoing Mother Complex, Mamaku turned to me. Mew, is that the only spell you found? No, there are others. There are some spells that I don't know what their effects are, um, hold on a moment, I said, rustling around, and took one of the books from my bag. My handmade spell book, the magic that we can probably use is written on these papers here, I said, handling the bundle of papers to Mamaku. These are spells? Somehow it seems like I can read them, but when I actually try, I can't read them. What a strange feeling. I also feel like there's a difference in readability depending on the spell. As she spoke, my interest grew. I thought the difference in legibility from person to person maybe be related somehow to the effect of the magic, w which ones seem easy to read, and which seem hard to read. I leapt on the topic instinctively and wrote what Mamaku had said in a note. After that, I asked Mamaku how she felt when she looked at the spells. It's completely different from being alone after all. Bringing in other people's perspectives, there's a whole new perception. Also, I felt better after confiding in Mamaku after all, and my desire to simply learn magic became stronger again. This was fun. After that, I asked Mamaku a lot of questions about how she felt about the spells and how easy they were to read. Maybe if Mamaku could also learn the spells, she might be able to use magic. However, the work of staring at the poems on paper to memorize the spells seemed to be quite nerve-wracking, and since the carriage was also moving, we'd probably need a little better environment to focus. I'd heard from Alan long ago that it seemed to take six months to a year for a magician to learn a spell, even if everything went well. Since then, I'd felt refreshed for the first time in a long time and I spent every day exploring magic. Mamaku also became a fellow researcher, and it was happy and kind of fun. If the red smoke went up, I went to defeat the demons as usual, but most of the time we spent secretly studying magic in the carriage. I assumed that the magic I could use was magic acting on my own body since that matched the magical effects I'd somehow worked out, so I decided to try for it, a form of magic to raise my attack power. I'd already thought it likely. I wondered if I could feel my muscles flex. However, it was scary to think that my cute girlish proportions might be lost if I get too muscular. Well, I could also get a sort of flexibly muscular body. I liked Mamaku's muscles. All right. First, I pictured in my head my power becoming stronger. Spells didn't work just by chanting them. They just made my body glow. I felt like something like a prayer like this was necessary. Also, I didn't necessarily have to say it aloud. If there was a wound, and I noticed it, the magic would activate because I naturally disliked the wound. Conversely, if I didn't recognize it or didn't want it to happen, any spell would just be magic that glowed dimly and made me feel warm. I kept casting spells, thinking about crushing the walnut I held in my hand. After chanting a few, not a single person pities me, I think, my own folly obliterates me, I felt a little uplifted when I recited the tanker. Somehow, I felt like I could crush this walnut. When I gave it a little effort, the walnut shell broke with a crunch. I tried crushing more walnuts by putting them in my left hand, making a fist with my right hand, and hitting them. The walnuts broke. Amazing. How fun. Wait, Mew. What are you doing? Mamaku said hurriedly. Eh? I looked at Mamaku, who was staring at my hands with a pale face. Eh? What's the matter? When I looked back at my hands, I saw the walnut shells scattered in pieces, and my hands were covered in blood. Huh? Was my finger broken? But it didn't hurt at all. I was having fun. Just as I thought that, the shining aura that had been surrounding me faded. And at the same time severe pain rushed into my hands. Ow. In a panic, I recited the healing magic. That was painful, too. 
although I was worried about the broken finger. Thanks to the healing magic, it healed beautifully without gaining a strange shape. T the broken bone was also healed. Amazing. And I tried to divert the mood with my new discovery. But Mamaku wouldn't let it go. You. What are you doing? So suddenly. S sorry. I, I didn't understand it well. I just got carried away. Really, no matter how much magic you have, you can't do things that hurt your own body. Am I going to have to tie down your wrists and ankles so you can't move? I'm sorry, all I can say is please forgive me. I, I wasn't trying to hurt myself. I thought it was a spell that would give me strength, and when I tried it, I could crush the walnuts. So I was happy. And that happened. You. Minmaku scowled at me. Yes. I'm sorry. I really couldn't have prevented it. I'm really sorry. I gave an earnest apology, and it somehow ended without further incident. And so from then on, when I did magical experiments, I was required to report on the purpose and content of the experiment before carrying it out. Yes. I'm sorry. R. Right. Mamaku. That spell from before. I cast it with the image of improving my strength. But I think it's a type of spell that improves my mood rather than my muscle strength. I think it's a kind of thing where, by hyping yourself up, you can draw out your full potential, and your power improves as a result. I was just now scolding you, and you're already talking about spells again, you. Oh well, it's good that you're thinking of reporting it properly. Minmaku said with a troubled laugh. Sigh. Sorry. He he. Somehow when I think of being with you. It makes me happy somehow. Because I'd been studying spells all alone until now, I got all choked up. But now Minmaku was with me. Even knowing there was just one person who understood me made me this happy. So, what will you do with the spell? Are you going to cast it again? No, the fact that there's a spell that enhances your mood implies that there's also one that calms you down. So I'd like to chant spells with that image. May I experiment? It does seem like that'd be unlikely to cause any danger, so that's fine. You told me properly, I'll watch you do it. Thank you very much. I cast the spells starting from the top of the list. Watched over kindly by Mamaku. I make Kamuto Ahishibakarini Nagatsuki no Arie Kanatsuki Womachaya Detsaru Kana. You'd come soon, you promised. Just for that, the longest night's dawn moon hangs awaiting your arrival. There was a change when I cast this spell. I felt the aura surrounding my body gather towards my head, and accordingly, my mind settled down. Or rather, I felt sleepy, my eyelids grew heavy, and my body weak. Due to my weakness, my posture slumped and I leaned against Mamaku. And I felt like I heard Mamaku's frantic voice calling, Mew. A rumble jolted the carriage, waking me up. Huh? Was I? I think I just took a nap. Eh? No, that's not it. I was definitely experimenting with spells, remembering? I sat bolt upright from where I was leaning on Mamaku. Mew, are you awake? Nothing's wrong with your body? Ah, yes. Um, did I? Midway, you fell over suddenly. I thought there was something wrong, but you were just asleep, so I let you sleep as you were. Ah, but I'm glad you woke up. You didn't seem to wake up even if I called you, so I was a little worried. I'm sorry, I keep making you worried over and over. I tapped my forehead with the back of my hand, and Minmaku looked relieved. That's for sure, but this time you told me about the spell in advance, so that gave me a little peace of mind. Somehow my chest felt full. Even now, I was a little happy that someone who cared about me was by my side, and a little embarrassed. I looked down, flustered, and decided to steer the conversation back towards spells. Maybe. But, um, that spell, it seems to be a type that calms the mind, or rather, it calms it too much and puts you to sleep. That might be it. It might be possible to adjust it somewhat by what you picture when casting the spell. If you could put other people to sleep, it would be easy to find uses for that spell. But there's not much use for putting yourself to sleep. No, I think it would be a big success on nights you couldn't sleep. Well, whatever, for now. I found out the effects of two spells in one session. Let's pound out experiments at this rate. After that, I experimented in various ways but didn't discover any new spells that day. Speaking of recovery magic, I thought of defense power-up. 
but casting with that image just activates the spell that enhances my mood. When I tightened my muscles while in a mood enhanced state, it appeared to harden them, so I guess there was some rise in defense potential with that. It wasn't what I'd imagined, but whatever, it was fine, but using the mood enhancing spell seems to take a toll on my body, and it always hurts when the effect times out. It was like muscle pain or strain, and the muscles were damaged. Therefore, after using this magic, healing magic was essential. 132. Homeward Journey 4. The Lord's Children. While we traveled, demons often attacked along the way. Times like these when the demons rampaged were hard. And at the same time, the students in the group returning to their territories quickly split off. Or rather, since the students in the Yamato and Cerberus territories had already gone their own way, the remaining group members from school were Katarina's Genesis Province Group, Alan's Rainforest Territory Group, and Mamaku and my squad. I felt a little lonely, thinking of how the school group members were whittling down, little by little. But I didn't have time to be lonely. I wanted to continue, but the exhaustion of our horses, who had been working hard every day, seemed to have peaked. So we decided to set up camp by a village near the road. I looked over the village while preparing our camp. This one seemed to be a pioneer village on the edge of the Cerberus territory. There didn't seem to be any damage to the barrier in the nearby demon forest, and thankfully they didn't appear to have been hurt by demons. But the rain had ruined their crops. When we first arrived at the village, the villagers looked lifeless. Of course, they'd be unable to grow not only the crops to pay their lord, but likely also those they'd eat themselves. So, at the moment, some kind-hearted student magicians from the school group who'd seen their haggard appearance were preparing the soil and growing plants in the field with magic. Faced with the fantastic magicians, the formerly apathetic people of the village were happily making merry. Magic is great. Really? How lucky. For this village. New. The villagers told me we won't all be able to sleep in the village houses. What are we gonna do? Alan had come to where Mamaku and I had pitched camp. Apparently. The village had opened its houses to the school group, probably some kind of reward for the magician's fantastic powers. We're fine, we've already pitched our tent, I think it's a reward for the magic that the magicians did, so your group should take advantage of it, Alan. Your magic was a big success in the battles with the demons, it's a power we'll need from now on, you ought to sleep in a proper bed and relieve your fatigue, I said with a smile, but Alan gave a small frown. You, you seem a little low. No, I suppose it'd be hard to be energetic in such a situation, but, talk to me if there's anything I might be able to help. A little. Eh, low? I put my hand to my face. I'd been trying to smile. Did I really look so dispirited? But, just now, when I'd seen the magicians reviving the fields with magic, I'd thought about the villages of Ruby Fallen. Ruby Fallen had very few magicians. Without that miraculous power, they wouldn't be able to avert disaster in an instant. Thinking about it, my heart ached. However, for Ruby Fallen, I'd consulted with Bash earlier, and he should have taken measures against the heavy rain. I'd like to think they'd be able to withstand all but the worst situation. Mew, there's a beautiful field of flowers on the far side, why don't we go over there? Although Alan was a henchman, he said that with a pretty mature face. I guess this was him showing concern for his boss, taking me to view flowers to cheer me up. As you'd expect from a henchman of long experience, he'd gotten good at treating the boss well. This boss does like flowers quite a lot. I nodded, taking Alan up on his proposal. He escorted me toward the forest, and we came upon the field of flowers he described. It was bigger than I'd imagined. Short flowers like dandelions and white clover spread in every direction. Taller flowers were probably also in bloom, but they seem to have been beaten down by the heavy rain. But looking at the edges, some of the tall flowers had also survived. Flowers near the massive trees seem to have been sheltered from the rain by their branches. It's so pretty, I said, kneeling down and enjoying the soft touch of the dandelion petals. Yeah, I'd relaxed a little. I should bring Charlie and the others here later. Alan, thank you very much. This was a good find. Such a place. I'm feeling a little better. I smiled at him, but my henchman looked embarrassed and hurriedly mumbled, A actually brother Kane found it. 
I see, that was very like Sir Kane. Actually, Sir Kane had come along as a carriage escort to Rainforest. It was rumored he'd been originally supposed to stay in the castle, but come along anyway. It was very like Sir Kane to find a beautiful field of flowers on a trip where demons were appearing. There was no way he'd neglect his search for leisure spots to please girls. He's the perfect image of an influencer. Brother Kane told me, he said women like flowers. And when you look at flowers, you feel better. Seemed like he was just mimicking Kane, but I was a little happy to think that Alan brought me here especially to cheer up his boss. I suppose I'd got a pretty good henchman. Alan, actually, a while ago, I was thinking about Ruby Fallen. The territory only has one spiritualist who can use plant magic. So, thinking of how miracles that revive the fields in an instant won't happen quickly in that region, I felt really helpless. When I returned to my territory, what the heck could I even do? I thought for a moment, Mew, you're not helpless. I looked up, surprised by Alan's sharp tone. You've always, ever since you were little, You've easily done things I couldn't do. Even the guys at school rely on you, Mew. I'm sure Ruby Fallen is waiting for your return. Alan. Alan had a serious expression. I blinked at him for a moment, and he bit his lip and looked down. I watched my henchman's sudden deflation, but with difficulty he resumed speaking. Really? That's what I think, Mew. You're amazing. So I wanted to send you off to Ruby Fallen happily. But, I... He faltered again, then began speaking as though he'd made a decision. I know that. But, Mew, you're so important to me. Of course I also feel like I don't want you to go at all. I know that, rather than Rainforest, you absolutely have to go to Ruby Fallen. I still don't want you to leave. I don't want to spend my time afraid of what might be happening to you. I was momentarily stunned, surprised at Alan's words. Alan. He'd been thinking so seriously about his boss's safety. I felt my heart warm at his ardent chivalry. This guy, when it counts Alan can really lift his boss's spirits. Certainly, I couldn't use magic. From a magician like Alan's perspective, it may have been giving him anxious thoughts. But I'd be fine. Alan, believe in your boss. I was a pretty tough boss. Alan, thank you for your concern. I'm really happy you said I wasn't helpless, but I have to go. Just like you consider Rainforest important, I have an attachment to Ruby Fallen. Even if I may have a difficult time, I still have to rush over there because there are a lot of people important to me there. At my answer, Alan looked a little sad but soon gave a half-hearted smile. My bad. I understand. That was selfish of me. Just now, I knew you'd respond that way, Mew, he said looking a little lonely. I was sorry I couldn't respond to my henchman's passion. By the way, we've had a long relationship, too. You've been my follower for, what, eight years now? Not counting time spent apart. I remembered the bratty Alan I'd first met, thinking of how Alan the brat had grown so much. I was somehow moved. He was an ideal henchman. I wondered if it was time to let him set up his own organization. But, about, my feelings. I think you understand from what I just said. I'd like you to think about it for a bit. Eh? Eh? Think about what? No, I rejected him just now. I said I was going back to Ruby Fallen, and Alan replied that he understood. What? Had he forgotten our hotly chivalrous conversation just now? Isn't it fine? What do I have to think about? As my henchman's face turned red, and I struggled to think of what I should be thinking of. I heard a girl's voice speaking in hushed tones a little ways away. A, no way, he doesn't feel like he's confessed with just that, does he? Yeah, I'm sure you didn't even notice at all, right? Miss Katerina, Miss Salome, please keep your voices down. We're going to be found out. Charlotte, you're the one being loud. I heard some familiar voices and looked over. They came from among the tall flowers under the massive tree. I strolled in that direction and looked down at the source of the voices. What are you three doing here? Miss Katerina, Miss Salome, and Charlie looked up at me, lying among the tall flowers. They'd been hidden by the flowers, and I hadn't noticed them until just now. They stared at each other with blinking eyes. Lying on the ground like that, won't your clothes get dirty? Wasn't that improper for a young lady? 
Miss Katerina reddened and stood up forcefully. Th these clothes are supposed to get dirty, so there's no problem. Miss Katerina, who had gotten petals and leaves all over her clothes, asserted, with hands on her hips. That's right, you. It's been a long journey, and these clothes are already worn. There's no point fixing them up by now. Miss Salom also stood up, shedding flowers and petals from her clothes. Charlie, too, gave an apologetic smile and said, Mew, sorry. It turned into us hiding and listening, patting the dirt from her clothes. Really? Did you have to say we were hiding? It's because he was trying so hard. Wasn't he? Miss Salome gave a meaningful glance behind me. Looking back, Alan was sitting with his head in his hands. What's wrong, Alan? Alan, is something wrong? Do you have a stomachache? He glared at me and stood up forcefully, going up to Katerina and the others. Why you guys have really bad taste. We simply got here first. Then you brought you here to cheer her up with your slack face. So we paid attention. Well, excuse us. Miss Katerina made a nasty face I hadn't seen in a while and her curls sharpened. Yeah, Sir Alan, we were just being tactful. It's not like we were hiding here because we thought we'd see something interesting. Miss Salome grinned at him and Alan scowled back resentfully. Really, Miss Katerina, Miss Salome, you're being cruel, not only with Sir Alan, there are already rumors about Sir Henry and Miss Wu. Well, no matter how you think of it. Sir Henry is wonderful, so honestly Sir Alan is a bit, but he's still trying to do his best without thinking about it. Somehow, even though Charlie was desperately making some kind of excuse, Alan's shoulders drooped even more at her encouragement, that said, what were they even talking about? They were having a conversation I couldn't follow right in front of me. It's hard when everyone was getting excited and I was the only one who couldn't. But from the topic of conversation just now. N no way, they thought Alan and I were in a relationship? No. Of course not, there's no way, since they'd experienced Talon and my boss henchman relationship on a daily basis. Well, we're only teasing you a little, Mew. Miss Salome, who had just been grinning, said with a straight face, I'd also prefer you didn't return to Ruby Fallen. After all, it's dangerous. On the way here, We've seen that demons are majorly escaping the barriers. I don't want to say it, but Ruby Fallen, with so few magicians, is having it tough, I think. I got what Miss Salem was trying to say. Tough was a bit of a euphemism. She probably thought Ruby Fallen couldn't be saved anymore. Previously, I'd been told the same thing by the Royal Knight Bigwig. None of the other students had said anything to me, but perhaps they all thought so, too. You already refused me before when we left school, but I think that even if I'm a bit late returning to my territory, I can take you to Ruby Fallen, that said, I must be the worst Count's daughter ever, but although I'm a Count's daughter, I also consider myself your friend, Miss Katerina declared, and Charlie nodded many times with moistened eyes. With these kinds of friends and henchmen, I was really blessed. Everyone, thank you, but I had to refuse after all. Thank you. I also consider everyone my important friends, but because of that, I can't take advantage of you. Up to then, Salome was about to say something, but she mastered herself with a smile and I continued. Also, I'm not so pessimistic about Ruby Fallen. Before the downpour started, I asked the Count to take measures against heavy rains in the territory. If the measures went well, I believe there will be no serious damage there. I stared at everyone trying to convey the impression that I was refusing to budge, as if grasping my strong will. Miss Katerina gave a big sigh and raised her head. I understand how you feel, Mew. I won't say anything more. Let's all work hard. Katerina held out her hand with a smile, and I clasped it firmly. 133. Homeward Journey 5, to each our own way. The villagers seemed like they wanted us to stay a little longer, but... We couldn't take the time, we kept moving with a single purpose, and the rainforest group led by Alan at last reached their branch off point, I was going to stop by the big town in rainforest later in order to hire a coachman, so I'd be following Alan's group for a little longer, so I'd also be parting here, that said, we were only parting with the Genesis province group, the far southernmost territory, 
Since the Genesis Province group was large, when we split up, it gave a strong impression of branching off. The school forces convoy was separating, and accordingly, Miss Katerina, Salome, and Charlie came over to say goodbye. I didn't think you'd come to see us off. Thank you very much. Naturally, you're our friends. Miss Katerina put her hands on her hips proudly. Miss Salome laughed next to her with her usual sexy smile. Miss Ryu, we have to meet again at school. Charlie jumped at me and hid her crying face in my chest. Yes, for sure. As Charlie and I were reluctantly parting, Miss Katerina turned to Alan with her hands on her hips. Alan, take care of you. I know. I'm worried that it's you. What for? I'm kidding. You're the only magician in our grade who can compete with me, so I trust you. Miss Katerina gave a brave smile and slapped Alan on the shoulder. You guys too, stay safe, Alan said and turned with a smile. Those two, I wonder if they were rivals in the magic classes. I wanted to linger saying goodbyes, but we couldn't take much time. We had to hurry and return to our territories. Finally, promising to meet at school again, we went our separate ways. Afterward, as I was feeling a little lonely in the carriage, Mama could put her arm around me. I leaned against her shoulder. Ryu, you've made a lot of good friends. I'm glad, she said and stroked my head, leaning on her shoulder. I cried a little, leaning against her in the carriage. Spending time in the carriage, and dealing with the demons that appeared, we made it to the big town. This was a town in rainforest that had the personal referral office. In this big town, we'd procure some horses with stamina and hire a couple of people as coachmen at the personal referral place. I said hire, but I should have said bye. Seriously, I never thought I'd be buying people, but we really did need coachmen. In order for Mama Ku and I to ride alongside, keeping watch for demons as guards, making a formation to protect the loaded carriage, it was essential that we had coachmen able to drive the carriage. For some reason, the royal knight assigned to Rainforest was now serving as our coachman. What would she do? Would she just casually come with us? I approached her asking, So, what are your plans for later? Huh? And rubbing my hands together but for some reason, she just quivered in fear and didn't answer. So I didn't think she intended to go to Ruby Fallen. Rough. I wasn't sure if there'd even be anyone at the personal referral place who'd consent to come to the cursed Ruby Fallen territory. Well, I wouldn't know if I didn't go. This is the biggest town in Rainforest. Leenzult. It also has a personal referral site. Alan had come to acquaint me with the city, as well as to say goodbye. I was here to hire men to go to Ruby Fallen, but Alan and the Rainforest group were going to the Count's mansion where Iron was staying. This was where we parted. Are you really only going to hire two people to go to Ruby Fallen? I nodded at Alan's anxious words. Mamaku, who was sitting next to me, looked at me and shrugged. Sorry. Alan, this girl is stubborn. Don't worry. I'll watch over her so she doesn't get do anything too rash. Mamaku threw a wink at Alan, but his anxiety didn't seem to fade. We have to go to our mansion, but I can speak with some of the knights errant there. A lot of people know you, Mew, and I think if I talk to them, they'll come along, Alan suggested in a small voice. I'm super grateful for his words. But, I'm desperately grateful, but, after all, how many demons had appeared up until now. Furthermore, Ruby Fallen had barely any magicians. Even if there was a break in the barrier, there were few who could fix it. If there was even one break, all sorts of demons would come crawling out and run rampant. I was sure I wanted the power to protect myself even a little, but I couldn't take Alan up on his indulgent proposal. The Knights of Rainforest were Rainforest's knights. Even this place wasn't undamaged. No. The Knights of Rainforest defend their own territory, anyway. We're planning to race for Ruby Fallen without rest, so rather than hiring too many people, I want to lighten the load and maximize our mobility. The fewer people we have, the less likely we are for demons to notice us. That's true, Alan muttered, looking a little sullen. He looked like he wanted to say something, but didn't. It's no use. I'm probably not cut out to be a count or a lord. I still feel like I don't want to let you go. Henchman, you're ten years too early to worry about your boss. I'll be fine. 
it's more important for you not to thoughtlessly trouble all the rainforesters. Please support Dame Irene. There are a lot of people here important to me, too. Please protect them, Alan, I tried saying, but Alan's hesitation remained. He looked down as if thinking. Kane, who had been silently watching the exchange, put his hand on Alan's shoulder. Alan, I'll take responsibility for getting you safely to Ruby Fallen. How about that? Brother Kane. Alan slowly looked up at his big brother. I also looked at Sir Kane, surprised. I spoke in a hurry. B but that, I'd feel guilty. Sir Kane was a super talented warrior. A super warrior. It would be inexcusable to borrow him. Alan's magic is absolutely necessary for rainforest, but Alan won't be able to concentrate with this on his mind. So I want to take on Alan's anxiety. Ultimately it's for the good of rainforest. Therefore, Mew, I'll go with you. Alan, will that give you peace of mind? Alan stiffened in surprise, but after looking back and forth at Sir Kane and me, he nodded. Brother Kane, please take care of you. Alan managed to squeeze out. Sir Kane gave a little smile and patted Alan's head. Leave it to me, Alan. And I'll leave our territory to you. As always, they had a close brotherly bond. Although I felt guilty for tearing them apart, honestly, Sir Kane coming along would save us, since we were in such a tight spot. Besides, when he said it was for the rainforest territory, too, it became the kind of atmosphere I somehow couldn't refuse. If he went as far as to take that into consideration, Sir Kane's influencer level must have reached godlike proportions. Sorry. Thank you so much. I'll happily accept your kind offer. I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I bowed deeply to express my deep gratitude. 134. Homeward Journey 6, You and Me, the underscore underscore combo. After transferring Sir Kane's luggage to the Ruby Fallen carriage. We separated from the rainforest convoy led by Alan. They set out for the rainforest mansion. Sir Kane came with us, making it much easier to plan our coming journey. Emotionally, too. However, I still wanted a coachman position. And since we'd now got more than just two people, it became easier in various ways. I came to this town in order to hire people. So I decided to go with Mamaku to the personal referral service, leaving Sir Kane to guard the carriage. I intended to hire anyone who was still willing to come after I told them the job description and the dangers involved in going to Ruby Fallen. We arrived at the personal introduction place I'd been looking at and headed inside, though I was a little fidgety. Although Rainforest's personal introduction service wasn't as luxurious or beautiful as the one in the capital, it had a clean and reliable feeling. When I gave them my desired human resources and budget at the reception desk, I was told it would be a while, so we waited in the waiting room. Looking at the state of the place, it was surprisingly busy and prosperous. The threat of demons hadn't hit this town yet, but the story that demons were getting out of the barriers had spread, and there seemed to be many people looking for guards. In that case, I doubted anyone would be willing put themselves up for the ruby fallen job offer. But after a while, someone from the business came up to us. We've found an appropriate person for you, allow me to guide you to them. A, did someone actually agree to go to Ruby Fallen? I replied involuntarily. After all, I thought it'd be impossible, thanks to the matches. We had a lot of money, so I'd offered a large amount to the service. I only realized after offering it that, because of it, the shop might forcibly refer people to me who disliked it. So I asked in order to make sure that the merchant wasn't lying and the person knew we were going to Ruby Fallen. But the clerk didn't seem fishy when they answered. Yes, they've agreed to go to Ruby Fallen. If anything, they were rather enthusiastic about it, saying they knew someone from the territory. It's a boy of 15 or 16. And he's had some experience as a coachman, so he fits the bill. The shopkeeper didn't seem to be lying. It seemed like there was someone who really wanted to go to Ruby Fallen. Looking at Mamaku, I nodded with a smile. Great, if we can get even a single coachman, we'll be saved. I wondered what kind of person he was. If he was 15 or 16, he was about Sir Kane's age. And then we were ushered into the room by the shopkeeper. In the room stood a slender young man. This was probably the person who the shopkeeper had matched to my job offer. When I saw his face, I froze. He looked familiar. Strange, I've seen him before, 
As I was told earlier, he was about a 15-year-old boy. He gave me a cheeky look. He had the same blonde hair and eye color as me. He looked like my brother Sabru from Garagari village, but that couldn't be. My older brother Sabru should have long passed the age of 15 by now. He also looked surprised to see my face. This was the first time I'd seen him in such a strangely long hairstyle, but I still remembered his impudent face, as though he were about to pick his nose. Brother Shun. I said the name of my brother that had been three years older than me. The guy, who apparently was my elder brother Shun, gave a look of surprise and took a step back. No way, you. My little sister. That surprised face was, indeed. My brother Sha. Why was he in such a place? Was Sha sold like I was? Brother Sha, whose face had gone from surprised to troubled, at a loss for words, spoke again. It really is you, um, Q? It's you. Hey, he wasn't at a loss for words just because he'd forgotten my name just now, was he? You and me. We were the full stop combo, weren't we? Right, right. You. Sorry, sorry, it's been a long time. I was only seven or eight when you left. Ah, uh, how are you? Have you been doing well? Somehow, though it should have been an abrupt reunion, Brother Sha didn't seem to be especially impressed or moved. He was smiling brightly. I wonder if he was really sold. Oh, do you two know each other? The shopkeeper said, looking a little confused. Yes, a little. Ah, uh, I'll take this person. I said and bought my brother chef from the personal referral place. I heard what you said earlier. Is this kid your brother, you? After we got out of the personal referral place, I introduced brother Sha to Mamaku again. Mamaku compared brother Sha and me in surprise, saying we were certainly a little similar. I didn't think I'd be reunited with my brother in such a way, and my head was still spinning. Yes, it's my brother. From Garagari village. Yeah. I'm Sha Yu's big brother, nice to meet you. He said with a friendly smile, shaking Mamaku's hand. He looked kind of proud, also impudent. Baba Sha, brother Sha, why were you in the personal referral place? Were you sold like me after all? I wondered if they ran out of the money they got from selling me, and what happened to the fields. Nah, Garigari village was too small for me, so I got out of there on my own. I was fine part of the way but I got separated from the peddler I was with. So I went hungry for a while and when I tried to pinch some food from a store, I got caught and brought here. You know, the usual, he said, laughing, but it wasn't the usual. What was that about stealing? Furthermore, his reason for leaving the village was like a band member coming to Tokyo from the countryside. Brother Sha. I muttered with a sigh. As expected from Yu's brother, that's amazing. How spirited. Mamaku said, looking at him like an enfant terrible, but saying she expects it from my brother. It's like brother Sha and me are alike. Stop, we're not alike at all. I heaved a giant sigh and set aside my feelings. I had to calm down. I was a little surprised, but yeah. Shall we go to the carriage for the time being? We'll need to introduce you to Sir Kane as well. Introduce him to Sir Kane. I felt heavy for some reason, thinking about it. Weren't Brother Sha and Sir Kane the same age? When Brother Sha lines up next to wonderful brother champion Sir Kane, wouldn't the difference be thrown into sharp relief? No, I didn't want to think about it. Yeah, by the way, Brother Sha, you can handle the reins of a carriage? Yeah, leave it to me. After I left Garagari village, I traveled with a peddler. That's when I learned how to pull reins. For pulling reins, there's nobody better than me. W was that so? He had a lot of confidence. Amazing. Somehow, even though it had been a long time since Brother Sha and I had seen each other, it felt normal. To be honest, I thought there'd be more if I met one of my brothers from Garagari village. For example, at the time, I'd hated that I was sold but my brothers weren't, so I thought those negative emotions would be rekindled. However, I felt no such thing. Although that didn't mean that I wasn't deeply moved by our reunion after such a long time. I felt very strange. Was it because Brother Sha didn't seem to think much of it, either? Even now, I noticed that he gave the impression he was about to pick his nose. After we walked for a while, the carriage came into view. Alan's group had already left, so it was just Sir Kane there. But I could see another figure for some reason. Who could it be? As we approached, 
I saw that it was the knight of the realm who'd been serving as our coachman until now for some reason. Sir Kane, sorry we kept you waiting, I have a lot to tell you about, but first, this person? When I glanced at the royal knight, for some reason she straightened her posture. Um, if it's all right. I too, would like to accompany you. I became a knight of the realm through my parents' connections, so to be honest I'm not good with a sword, but as a coachman. She was so nervous, her voice cracked. W what was happening? When I invited her before, she was so scared she couldn't say a word. Her knees were shaking as she spoke. A, hey, is that okay? Honestly, we'd be happy to have you. By the way, I, your name my name is Azure. I couldn't think of her name and when I tried to say so, the knight covered for me by giving her name, her face was so anxious I was a little worried if it was really okay, but she had still waited for us and spoken to us, so I guess she must have resolved to do it, anyway, we couldn't afford not to, I'd obediently accept the woman's offer, I'll accept your kind offer, as you're, I look forward to working with you, yes, ma'am, her voice rang out, and the company journeying to Ruby Fallen was decided. Mamaku, Sir Kane, Brother Shun, Azure, and myself. Even though it was a small group, we'd make it with these five people. Somehow, character list name, Sha from Garagari village, the fifth son of the household in which Ryu was born. Three years older than Ryu. When we lived in Garagari village, he was around seven or eight, and in Ryu's personal opinion, picked his nose often. Furthermore, in this chapter, I described him as looking like her older brother Subaru, but I was just referring to his appearance in the book illustrations. So I wasn't sure if anything was written about that in the Garigari village arc, but upon reading it again, I'm sorry to say there was no such description. If you're interested in the illustrations, you can read the first half for free on Pixif novels, and since you can see illustrations of the faces of all her brothers, please refer to that when you have some free time. Remember, Sha and Ryu together form the Japanese word for stop, as in stop having children. Translator's note, chapter 134 is special to me in that it marks the point where I've done as many chapters, 67, as were translated before I picked the story up, so it feels like the translation is now mine. It's been a lot of work and I'm a very poor translator, not really one at all since I don't speak Japanese fluently and rely on machine translation to get the basic meaning before editing it for context. But I really didn't want to see this story languish, and I hope a few of you have enjoyed it. As part of taking over the translation, I want to codify and update some terminology, especially the references to magic and magic users. Very specific terms are used in this story, in a manner different from general usage. Here's what I've come to rest on. Japanese term literal meaning translated term description, explanation, Mahatsukai magic user magician This is a general term for all, known, magic users in the story, it also, rarely, refers to sorcerers specifically, if contrasted with spiritualists in context, you could also call these wizards, but that has gender and contextual connotations I didn't want to introduce. Shari Aotsukai Spirit of the Dead User Spiritualist These magicians call upon spirits to perform magic and are best at rough, large-scale magic. However, despite the literal translation of their title, there's no indication in the story that these spirits are specifically dead people. Most of them seem to be elemental spirits like fire and water. Majatsukai, Majatsushi Sorcery User Master sorcerer these magicians manipulate mana to perform magic and are good at fine details and shaping. Previously, these were also translated as simply magician, but I will be separating them for clarity from now on. I've also gone back and updated previous chapters. Kizashi Zuri Umahatsukai Decay Death Spirit of the Dead Magic User Necromancer This is a specific type of spiritualist who works with death, corpses, and decay. I use different terminology from spiritualists to reduce confusion, since spiritualists in this story don't actually work with dead spirits, and because they're set apart within the story itself, Yu's newly discovered magic doesn't have consistent terminology yet, she sometimes calls it healing magic, but obviously it can do more than that, if she does settle on a term for it, I'll add in a note. Also, here's the illustration the author was referring to. Shu is bottom left, 
and Sabahu is middle right. Thanks for reading. The original story is at nearly 300 chapters, so there's lots more to come. 135. Homeward Journey 7, Brother Sha. On my last update, I meant to put it in the forward but forgot. Sorry. So I've suddenly thrown a daily update party all on my own. Therefore, since I updated yesterday and today, and will update tomorrow, please note the chapter numbers. Thank you very much. As you and Brother Sha were primarily in charge of the carriage. The plan was for the rest of us to ride alongside on horseback and act as guards, but for the first shift, Brother Shaw and I were appointed to manage the carriage. This was thanks to Mamaku, who thoughtfully said, Don't you want to hear about your hometown after so long? To be honest, I had indeed wanted to ask Brother Shaw various things, so I was glad to be able to sit with him in the coachman's seat of the luggage wagon. Brother Shaw held the reins. Our motive was to quickly confirm his driving abilities. His, there's nobody better than me line was a little shady and I was suspicious, but fortunately, he managed the reins normally. That said, I thought that probably there were quite a few people better than him. I don't think it's good to put yourself out like that. Okay, um, brother Sha, when did you leave the village? About a year ago. By the way, what's this brother Sha? Acting all proper. Just call me the same as when you were little. You're calling me best brother like you used to in your heart, right? Ah, uh, I'm not. So, I'll keep calling you brother Sha like I used to. Although I gave such a prompt reply, brother Sha scratched his nose awkwardly and told me not to be so reserved. No, I wasn't holding back. I'd never called him that. If anything, what I called him in my heart was nose-picking boy. I stared my brother in the eyes with a somewhat disappointed look. Sure, he'd given off a cheeky vibe ever since he was a kid, but I never thought he'd grow up to be this disappointing. I was worried about the fate of gentle brother Mario who took good care of us. Brother Mario was the only one of them I wanted to grow up healthy. Garagari village. How was it? Garagari village. My old garden. Well, at the time, I was plowing the fields. Yeah. I knew you'd be plowing the fields. Was it too rough? Did my brother have it too rough? I knew they were plowing fields. It was obvious I'd assume they'd be plowing. That wasn't what I wanted to hear about. I cleared my throat. I had no choice but to take the lead in the conversation. How is everyone? Ah, I heard that brother Jerry went off somewhere soon after I was sold. Did he come back? Everyone's fine. Brother Jeru did return. Is that so? Brother Jiru, really, where did you go? Hey, don't look so disappointed. He's fine. It all worked out. Yeah. By the way, what have you been up to until now? Ah, that's right. I hadn't told him about myself at all. Where do I start? Should I start from the beginning? First, I was bought to be a maid in the noble house of Rainforest, but later I was kidnapped again and eventually it worked out that I was adopted by the Count of the Ruby Fallen House. Then, up until now, I've been able to attend the academy, but since the barriers broke due to the heavy rain, I took time off from school for the relief effort. Although I'd summed it up fairly well, Brother Sha tilted his head in confusion. Huh? In other words, you've been living well, but now you've got yourself in major trouble. Is that it? Maybe he hadn't understood it well. Brother Shari summarized the story that I'd summarized. Well, yeah, that seemed fine. Ah, yes, something like that. By the way, Sir Kane is a scion of the Rainforest House, and the woman wearing armor over there is a knight of the realm of fairly high status, so please don't be rude to them. Leave it to me. When it comes to not being rude, there's nobody better than me, he said, giving a proud thumbs up, but he wasn't exactly trustworthy. I stared at him in scorn, but he didn't notice my glare and kept talking. Well, but going to Ruby Fallen is perfect. Do you remember Tagasaku, the village chief's son? Apparently, he's made it big in Ruby Fallen. So I thought I'd go to Tagasaku and get a job. Why yeah, that might have been a good idea, but compared to Tagasaku I'd made it even bigger. Since I was the adopted daughter of the Count, it seemed like he hadn't really understood what I'd just told him after all. I guess there is plenty of work for you at Ruby Fallen, we're short on manpower, though since the demons appeared, I don't know what's going on now. Eh, demons? Is that what's going on now? 
you came along without knowing that the personal referral service was booming, offering guards against the demons, weren't they? Ah, is that right? I thought they were making a fuss, but I figured it was just about me. After all, there's nobody better than me as a reinsman. W was that so? Brother Sha was amazing, somehow, seemed like he was enjoying a great life. As I stared at my brother, slightly stunned over his serious optimism, Mamaku drew her horse up to the carriage. Mew, it looks like there's a city up ahead, should we stop or keep going? Let's keep going for now, we won't sleep tonight. One person can rest in the carriage, so I want to continue while taking breaks in turns. I see. Mamaku spurred her horse up to talk to Sir Kane, who was in the lead. Hey, you keep calling him mother but that goo- Ow, why are you stepping on my foot all of a sudden? Hey, you almost called her a guy just now? If you say that to Mamaku she'll kill you. You should value your life more. Even so, that's a man, right? Mamaku is Mamaku. She's no more or less than that. This is a matter of life or death. That was dangerous. I needed to train him well. I could have lost my big brother as soon as we'd met. <laughs> Mamaku, then. Well, ever since you were a kid you've acted like you wanted parents to take care of you. Brother Sha said that with a blank face like it was nothing. Eh? When I was little. Did my brothers think that about me? Brother Sha turned and smiled at my surprise that even my brother, as a snot-nosed little boy, could see throughout my inner thoughts. I'm glad you're happy now. Yeah. Brother Sha. I thought he was only interested in his nose, but did he actually worry about me? By the way, our father and mother in Garigari village? They're relaxing at home. Looks like they've still got money left from selling you. Oh, is that so? A weird silence ensued. That wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. But whatever. Yeah, whatever. After that, we didn't talk much about Garigari village, but about the future, my time at school, and Ruby Fallen. 137. Homewardry Journey 9, in a village of Ruby Fallen. Wait here, I'll go get it. With an OK sign, and ran out of the stable. The stable immediately went quiet. S. Sorry. Sir Kane. My brother's rude. No. He's rather fun. When I'm working in the castle, we can't speak freely like that. Sir Kane, always the angel. If you take being an angel any further, you're seriously gonna grow wings. Seeing an angel like this in front of him, I'd like to hope that even Sleazy might start to think. I felt like he had an absolute purification effect just by being around. Come to think of it, I heard from Azul Slino, Sir Henry resisted you when you tried to return to your territory. Sir Kane. R. Yeah. Actually, he told me not to go. At first. But I somehow pleaded with him and he let me go. Sir Henry said he hadn't thought I was so stubborn, so he might have been a little disappointed. How on earth could Sleazy be disappointed in Sir Kane? Bastard. Somehow, seeing Sir Kane giving off a slightly depressed air, I got mad at Sleazy. It serves him right, being disappointed. What he wants from us is really infuriating. If he takes a few knocks, he might get a little decency. Sir Kane made a little noise of surprise and then pealed with laughter. Ha 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 ha, you're tough, you. Yeah, that may actually be true. I'll think that way, too. I seem to have really hit Sir Kane's funny bone, because he laughed for another minute, and then looked at me, wiping tears from laughing too much. I believe His Highness Henry will soon become this country's king. Others are working with that intention as well. I don't want His Highness to become a king who treats commoners who can't use magic like objects. If that continues, I have a feeling the country will collapse. So I want His Highness to recognize their distress. I want to at least support him while I'm in the castle. As his friend. Such cane-like earnest eyes hurt my heart. Sir Kane's friendship. Was too good for Sleazy. Really, too good. I remembered the day of Sir Kane's graduation. Even then, Sir Kane had said he wanted to be friends, knowing the Sleazy part of Sleazy. He hasn't changed since then, has he? Please also tell me if there's anything I can do. I'll support you. On the day of his graduation, I couldn't say these words to Sir Kane, thinking it was too late for Sleazy. But the angelic Sir Kane wouldn't give up and abandon him. Just maybe, it wasn't impossible after all. Thank you, Mew. 
Sir Kane gave me his usual angelic smile. After staying overnight in the inn, the Ruby Fallen party set out early in the morning. Even after sleeping in a proper bed for only one day, the condition of our bodies was completely different. Let's race straight for Ruby Fallen. Full of energy and strength and luck question mark we crossed the border into Ruby Fallen without encountering any demons. Yeah, we crossed pretty easily. Rather, as we got closer to Ruby Fallen, it felt like the rate at which we encountered demons was decreasing. This, could it be, my thoughts were moving in a good direction. Although we'd entered Ruby Fallen, our goal was still to get to the Count's Manor just run for it. After a while, racing through Ruby Fallen, we came to a small village. One of the pioneer villages along the way. Rice paddies spread out all around the village. I could see some parts of the fields and rice paddies that were probably ruined by the rain, but it didn't seem like they'd been attacked by demons. Villagers were also working hard in the fields. Having something I needed to confirm, I got everyone's approval to stop by this village. Just inside the ruined field, a bearded old man with a hoe in his hand stood looking foolishly at the carriage, so I decided to talk to him. Um, excuse me, I'd like to ask you a few things, is now a good time? Wah, eh? To me? Yes, that's right. I wanted to ask how things are going. How things are. Why would you? Are. Do you mean you want to know if this field was destroyed by the rain? Young lady. Are you an official? I've never seen you. Besides, the knight who manages this village should have already brought the Lord's House a report. Was there some mistake? No, it's nothing like that. I just wanted to check it out a bit. Ah, have your fields taken a lot of damage? I asked, surveying the crops damaged by the rain before us. The old man seemed to have been in the process of restoring the field. Oh, well. That's just because it rained so much. This field in particular was ruined. I'm taking care of it now. The fields that were ruined have to be redone from scratch. He gave a sad look over the ruined section of the field. Things were strewn about by the rain, and although it should have had ridges, they looked to have been washed away or beaten down by the rain. The potatoes got ruined in the mud, but the rice growing in the paddies were safe. I'm sure you can tell from looking. But although we'd already converted some of the fields into rice paddies, a huge amount of water washed out of the river, and there was a big flood. When I saw it, I thought we were done for, but we managed to survive, since we have a crop that grows in water. Anyhow, with this much rice, we'll be able to escape starvation. I was surprised when we suddenly had to switch to rice paddies, but they saved us. Our Lord really took care of us. It's all thanks to you oi. Oops. I'm not supposed to say that. The old man shut his mouth and started looking around in a panic to see if anyone was there. Huh? What in the world was the old man about to say? You oi, I got a really bad feeling. B but before that, I had to check about demons first. Um, by the way, did any demons come around or attack? Jeez, demons? There's no way something that dangerous came around here. Cause we're protected by the magician's barriers. The old man said uneasily, adding, what nonsense are you saying suddenly? Demons coming out? The demons hadn't come here after all. Thank you, uncle. Um, don't worry about the demons. I was checking just in case. Then, I'll be going. I said, deciding to return to the carriage. Even though this is a mountain village, it wasn't damaged by the demons. Sir Kane, who had come with me, questioned the old man's story with an odd expression. As I walked back to the carriage, I told him, a while ago, we switched the field over to rice paddies as a measure against heavy rain. Paddies? Sir Kane looked perplexed at the unfamiliar word, and I pointed at the water-filled fields around the village. It's a place where crops are grown underwater, the water is drawn from the river. As I spoke, we arrived at the carriage, where everyone else was waiting. In order to confirm my suspicions, I gave them our next destination. I'm sorry, I've taken up so much time, I need to confirm something, so can we stop by the river that the rice paddies are drawing from now? Everyone consented to my suddenly heading for the river, although they looked curious. Author's note. Thankfully, the second volume of Resume of a Reincarnated Girl was released on June 30th. Translator, of 2016. I'm glad that so many people were able to pick it up. With this renewed joy, 
I'll do my best on web updates. As always, thank you very much. 138. Homewardry Journey 10. Demons Across the Barrier. It was very broad, but it looked like a brand new river. Perhaps, in order to draw water for the paddies, they'd used magic to split it off from the original mountain river and direct it near the village. It would be an artificial offshoot. I wasn't sure if the barrier had kept its power. Though it seemed to still be there, I wanted to go a little further up the mountainside and check the main stream, where the barrier had been placed. I told everyone the change in my request and, first, organized a party to head for the main stream. Since the river's primary stream was in the mountains, we could only take the carriage part way. Although there were some questions about whether entering the mountains would be dangerous with demons possibly about. I said that there were no signs of demons after we'd entered Ruby Fallen Territory, and I didn't think there'd be any. So I got everyone's consent. Brother Shell and Azure were scheduled to take care of the carriage, but Shell was bored and said he wanted to walk, so Azure and Minmaku ended up staying with the carriage. Since Brother Sha couldn't ride a horse, he'd always been on the carriage until today, so I kind of understood his feelings. So. With Sir Kane and I and for some reason Brother Show as party members, we hurried up the mountain. Having taken the carriage into the mountains, we weren't that far from the main course of the river. It wasn't a road but rather something like a beast trail, so we went carefully, watching our feet. Sir Kane, leading the way, cut away obstructing trees and plants so we could advance easily. What an influencer. Be careful. There's a bit of a cliff here. Don't slip. As expected, Sir Kane even warned us of dangerous spots he found, so even there we could relax. We hit a large river after walking for a while. I checked the map. It was a rough map, but there was probably no mistaking that this was the river that played the role of the barrier. Since it wasn't raining now, the river flowed gently by. Looking along the banks of the river, I could tell the water level had been quite high. There were traces of mud and so on. But the border of the river on the opposite bank hadn't collapsed. It remained clean. It hadn't risen to a flood. I'd heard that the river barrier that seals the demons comes from the border of the far bank. Much like when a rope barrier stretches and breaks. In the river's case, if the opposite bank of the river collapsed, the barrier would be broken. If you went near the river, you might be influenced by demons, but it's when you crossed over that you'd actually be attacked by demons. When I was a bandit, it was the same the first time demons attacked us. Since the terrain on the opposite side had not collapsed, the barrier was safe. Since the river water flowed into the rice paddies, the paddies played the role of a dam and retaining reservoir. Furthermore, I thought the flow of water might have been especially dispersed because they'd made such a big a new branch of the river. I could only thank the magicians for their powerful construction work. Lucky, really lucky. But it was during my last long vacation that I'd started the plan to turn fields into paddies. There might be areas where paddies hadn't been made or the rivers hadn't been developed. Also, although it was safe here because of the rice paddies, there might be places where increased flooding had ruined the barriers. I could dwell endlessly on bad possibilities, and it would be better not to act as though everything would work out. But at the very least, the possibility that there was no damage to the rice paddies from demons had increased. Knowing that alone, I felt relieved. We walked up the river to see how things were. Although we were walking along the river, its channel deepened and we came to a little overlook. It was getting more and more cliff-like. If the channel was deep enough, it wouldn't be possible to flood, and I could probably conclude that there was no problem with the barrier here. Stop. It looks like this is a dead end, Sir Kane who had gone ahead, called back. He told us to be careful, and walking a little ahead we hit a steep slope of about 7 meters. If we'd gone ahead carelessly, without noticing, it'd have been dangerous. We'd have fallen and just rolled and rolled. Looking down with that painful thought, I saw a forest spreading out under the steep cliff-like slope. There was something there that looked like a rope barrier. The rope intersected precisely with the river. It looks like the barrier switches to a rope right over there. Sir Kane had also seen the shape under the cliff. A holy rope. It was the barrier method I'd seen at the mana sink my freshman year. Holding the demons in with something like a holy rope. Looking at the state of the rope. There didn't seem to be any places that looked swept away or particularly frayed. Okay. 
it looks like there's no problem so far, this place looks safe, I thought, and was about to return to the carriage, brother Shagavan R looking at him, I was surprised to see him looking to where the holy rope was installed under the cliff, and saying, is that brother Jiru? A looking where brother Sha was looking hurriedly, I indeed saw a figure like brother Jiru under the cliff, on the far side of the barrier rope, it was like brother Jiru, but I couldn't tell for sure whether it was brother Jiru because he looked a little more grown up than he did when I was little, and most importantly, the left side of his face looked different, it was like he was wearing a mask that looked like his face with the left side broken off, brother Sha, next to me, headed toward Jiru right at the edge of the cliff, I could hear the ground crumble under his tread, looking at brother Sha, I was startled, brother Sha, you can't, that might be a demon, I remembered how, a long time ago, a demon had taken the form of my mother to lure me in and attack me, for a moment, I, too, had thought it was brother Jiru, but it was probably a demon, because it was standing on the other side of the barrier rope, be but, mew, isn't it Jiru, it looks like, Sha tried to step forward, so I pulled him back forcibly behind me, however, with that momentum, I set my foot on the unstable patch of ground, and it broke, Sir Cain seemed to go into slow motion as he reached for me and shouted, Mew. no good, he was too late, I fell away, knowing I was falling, I curled up so as to get hurt as little as possible, and tumbled down the steep slope, when I'd fallen to the bottom, I opened my eyes, I didn't seem to have any major injuries, I looked up slowly, and saw the brother Jiru standing with a worried look behind the barrier rope, I remembered the fright of being attacked by the demon when I was a bandit, after crossing the river thinking it was my mother, I tried to get up and run as fast as I could, but a dull pain shot through my leg, apparently, when I slipped just now, I'd twisted my ankle, it turns out I hadn't been unharmed after all, I came here feeling nostalgic, I'm happy to see you're the same as ever, the thing like a demon in Jiru's form said in a soft voice, was this demon talking, or was I hearing things, you, are you okay, Sir Kane's voice cut through my confusion, looking up, I saw two worried faces, I was a little surprised at the actions of the Jiru demon, but that was just what demons did, it was better not to think about it, either way, those things couldn't leave the barrier, the holy rope, reassuring myself, I raised my hands to show them I was okay, I'm going to tie my rope to a tree and come down myself now, Sir Kane shouted, and I hurriedly shouted back, I'm fine, I'm not injured, I think I can climb back up by myself, ah, but I'd appreciate it if you could just let the rope down, and I secretly cast a healing spell to heal my twisted ankle and cuts, as usual, I had to endure sting of the healing, once the healing magic was done, I got up and went to the slope, distancing myself from the worried demon, Sir Kane, working quickly, let down the rope right away, all I had to do was climb, as I grabbed the rope, I heard the demon that looked like brother Jiru say, life magic, huh, I haven't seen that in a long time, when I looked back to check on it, the brother Jiru demon had disappeared. 139. Homeward Journey 11. Garagari Village Brothers. Back at the carriage, Mamaku fussed over me, seeing me carried by Sir Kane with my clothing in tatters, but she was relieved to see I had no injuries. Well, I'd cured them with healing magic, Mamaku seemed to have noticed as well, and, whispering so nobody could overhear, scolded me not to be reckless just because I had magic. Was I really being reckless, or just clumsy? Sorry, Sir Kane, who had seen me falling close up, couldn't believe I was uninjured and prevented me from horse riding just in case, so I'd be resting in the carriage. Since Brother Sha was acting as coachman, he gracefully allowed me to lie down in the carriage. After seeing the Brother Jerry look alike demon, Sha seemed a little absent minded in a daze, like he was thinking about something. Are you okay, Brother Sha? I asked from the carriage, and Sha gave me an easy look and turned forward again, ah, I'm fine, that was bad back there, feels like you fell instead of me, I'm glad you're safe, so, that thing was a demon? Probably, I think, demons can take the shape of people you know, well, to lure you inside the barrier, I told him that, but was partly unconvinced myself, demons showed people images of those whom they strongly desire to see, 
It's not that the demon imitates it, it's just a hallucination. A vision of someone close that that person wants to see. When I encountered my first demon, I saw my mother, but I was the only one who could see her at that time. Since the demon hadn't known my mother's appearance, there was no way it would be able to mimic her. Boss said that the demons took advantage of the weakness of people's hearts. But this time was different. Sh Sir Kane, and I all seem to have seen the same figure. Brother Sha and I have both seen Brother Jiru, so that's understandable. But Sir Kane shouldn't even have known of Jiru's existence. Above all, the demon spoke to me. Could a demon not only produce an illusion, but also an auditory hallucination? I thought. I wondered if I'd wanted it to speak to me, so I'd heard the words I wanted it to say. But that thing the demon said at the end. Life magic, huh. I haven't seen that in a long time. Life magic was probably the healing magic I'd used at the time. The demon called it life magic. I'd never heard the phrase before. Then how could it pull those words out of my thoughts for an auditory hallucination? Can demons take the shape of people? That guy's face was Brother Jiru's, but half of it was white. Was that what demons look like? I don't know. There are many things we still don't understand about demons. I've seen that bluish white face somewhere. You've seen that face? Ah, I think maybe I saw it in a dream. In a dream? Yeah, Brother Sha muttered and stirred uneasily. What kind of dream was it? I don't know, I just feel like I see it sometimes. I don't really remember what happens, though. I remember somehow it feels like the ground isn't dirt, but like a stone, and something like a big lump of iron is moving really fast. I watched from behind as Sha turned his face up, trying to remember. I was so surprised I couldn't get my words out, from the vague details she gave. I'd had a flash of insight, the moving mass of iron, the ground that wasn't ground, a car, a concrete road. So, could it be the world? Of my previous life? A anything else? Do you remember anything else? Hearing me speak so impatiently, brother she turned around. His eyes were round in surprise. You, I thought so. Have you also had that dream? Eh? The way he said that. It's like, Brother Sha, are there other people who've had dreams or memories like that? Were there more people like me than I'd thought? Certainly. I'd been born with the full memories of the world of my previous life. So I'd thought there might be other people like me. When magic spells turned out to be tanker poetry, I anticipated that there would be such people. However, I'd assumed that it was an extremely rare thing. Even with all the people I'd met until now, I'd never heard of such a story. Brother Sha nodded at my hurried question. He'd been hesitant speaking earlier, but now that he thought I'd also had the dream, he spoke briskly. I'm not sure who else, but Brother Maru and Brother Sibaru also said they'd seen it. Other than those guys I haven't heard from anyone else. The guys in the village, our parents, and Brother Hajim didn't seem like they knew anything. I never confirmed it with Brother Jiru, but... It was after Brother Jerry left that we started dreaming. He took an apple out of his bag and bit into it, saying he was hungry, as if it was no big deal. At ease, he'd been talking about such strange things just now, and was giving off a carefree feeling. Brother Shun, how can you be so casual? I was so surprised it was making me weak in the knees. His memories of a previous life seemed to be vague, going from what he said. Still. Could he be someone who knew about his previous life? Don't you want to go back to that world? The question came suddenly to my mind. I'd never thought I wanted to return, but to be honest it'd be a lie to say I'd never thought of how to go back to that world at all. To be honest, no matter how I thought of it, it was more convenient over there than in this world. I didn't want to return. But, if someone important to you was in that world, wouldn't you want to go back? Want to go back? That's a weird way to put it. I don't really think about it enough to want to go back. It's just a dream, Sha answered indifferently. If the dream brother Sha was talking about was the world of my previous life, I felt like it was very different from my case. In his case, it really felt like he was just seeing a mysterious world in a dream occasionally. I already had the memories from the time I was born. I was forced into them at full strength. I wondered what the difference was. Besides, why was it just as siblings? Well, Brother Hajim didn't seem to know. I remembered Brother Jiru's face I'd seen earlier. 
How was brother Jeru? Since all my elder brothers except Hajim had the dream, it wouldn't be strange if Jeru had it too. By the way, do you understand Tanka? Are there any Tanka you know? Tanka? What's that? They're old poetry we learned in literature class. Classic poems. Literature? Dunno. Since it was a vague memory from the start, I didn't expect much, but he didn't remember anything at all. I'd thought it could be a chance to get a new spell. In the first place, it was my own assumption that the dream brother Sha saw was my previous world, it might not be. However, having the same dream multiple times had to be something extraordinary. Why were we siblings the only people who had such dreams and memories? Thinking back, as I was pondering how to go about forming a hypothesis, I remembered the original trigger for the topic. Come to think of it, the reason Brother Sha started telling me about the world of my previous life was because he'd seen the left side of Brother Jiru's face in a dream. Just now, you said you'd seen the left half of the face of the demon that looked like Brother Jiru in a dream. Was that in this dream world? I envisioned the left half of Jiru's face at the time. It was a terrible bluish color and the eye was translucent like a rainbow marble, very mysterious. For certain, I didn't think it was something you'd easily find not just in Japan but anywhere on earth. I don't know, I saw something like that in my dream, but I don't remember it well. I just feel like I've seen it before somehow. Is that so? Um, I should tell you. Don't tell anyone who doesn't already know about this. When I did, people acted like I was creepy and called me a liar. It was rough. Sha said and crunched on his apple in irritation. I guessed that was brotherly advice from someone who'd had a bad time after talking about it. That experience was probably why he'd seemed a little nervous telling me about it at first. After finding out that I'd also glimpsed it, he'd relaxed and started eating his apple. Relax brother. I didn't have any plans to tell anyone. Thinking about what would happen if I did, he nodded in satisfaction when I replied to his advice with, don't worry, I won't tell anyone. Suddenly, I remembered the figure of brother Jeru, the figure of that demon whose face looked half like another person. Could it possibly be that it wasn't a demon, but somehow actually brother Jeru? Brother Shah had said that he'd seen that pale left side of its face before, but now that he said it, I also felt like I knew it somehow, it was hazy, but we couldn't turn back now, even if we went back, I didn't think brother Jiru would still be there, even when I tried to climb back up the cliff, he disappeared, anyway, even if I were lucky enough to find the thing that looked like brother Jiru, I wouldn't know what to ask, since Shou's dream was about the world of my previous life, it might have just been taking on the form of something in my previous life from the dream. So what would be the point of talking to it about my previous world now? I was concerned about the magic, but it was better to prioritize returning to the Count's manor for now. I've already decided to live in this world. 140. Extra Chapter 4 Gloria Ruby Fallen. Sometimes, I hate my power. My big brother insisted that this power was wonderful, but the more he tried desperately to tell me that, the more I thought it was a useless power. So I tried to pretend I didn't have this power and studied plant spiritualism. Then, I finally became the magician people needed. I did, but still. Why are you trying to stop me? Not just you, even Galata. I shouted, straining to reach for the door ahead of me. But, as I thought, I couldn't move. Little wonder, my husband was wrapped around my arms, and my daughter clung to my legs. Mother, how many times must we tell you? What could you do? Outside? I glared at my daughter, who was mumbling apologies at my feet. Obviously, I do magic. I know the fields were ruined by that heavy rain, and I heard that demons have appeared in the south, where Sir Seki went. I can at least restore the fields with my magic and reassure the people. My husband spoke harshly from behind me, where he was pinning my arms. You can't. Gloria, you'll ruin your health if you use magic. Sir Seki will do something about contact with the demons, and you can leave the matter of the fields to me. No, I can't trust you. You've been keeping this secret from me until now. I couldn't tell you because when I did, you'd be like this. With my husband yelling at me, I finally ran out of strength right at the door. I dropped my arms. Until about one year ago, I'd had to live most of my life in bed. 
There was no way I could overcome two full-grown people. I allowed my husband to drag me back to the bed. My daughter also helped tuck me in bed and pulled up the covers. I hated it. The two of them were perfectly in sync. I sniffled unhappily, and my husband who'd forced me into bed sat down next to me. Gloria, bear with it. We can't let you use magic. You've worked so hard to recover, and I don't want your magic cues to leave you bedridden again. You're just saying that because you can't rule Ruby Fallen if I die. I regretted my muttering as soon as I'd let it out. I shouldn't have said such a thing. I looked at my husband in fear, but he said, that, too. But not just that. You're important to me, giving me a gentle smile that brought relief. Although my husband was born into the house that had ruled Ruby Fallen for generations, he wasn't a magician. In order to rule Ruby Fallen, he needed a title, and the only way to get it was to marry a magician. So my husband married me, who had been abandoned by my original province, being weakened by my overuse of plant spiritualism. It was something of a political marriage. But my husband loved me. He took good care of me. I knew well enough that being stripped of his title wasn't the only reason my husband was stopping me from overexertion. I'm sorry, dear. It's okay. I fell in love with your tirades a long time ago. You've gotten stronger. Haven't you? I'm glad, Gloria. My husband clasped the hand resting on my knee. But, dear, I am a magician, you know. Being in bed at a time like this, it's painful. I said, recalling old memories. Although I was a magician, I wasn't fit for anything but fire magic. I was incompatible with other magics. I got dizzy just looking at the spells. As someone who could only use fire magic, I felt like there was no place for me. And my brother was in the same predicament. It felt like everyone was cursing us siblings as useless magicians. So, through effort that made me vomit blood, I obtained plant spiritualism at last. And I was finally needed, but that time was fleeting and left me with a weakened body. Gloria, for my sake, you have to endure. I met my husband's eyes, at the sincerity in his eyes, I, too, wanted to promise to endure for his sake, but more than that, I knew my husband cared for the people of the territory. When I'd heard that fields were beaten down by the heavy rains, and the southern barrier was broken, I was well aware that I shouldn't be anxious. For his sake, for this territory's sake, I wanted to use my power. This was the place I had finally found. I was suddenly reminded of my brother. What was my brother doing now? I wondered if he was still sticking to fire magic, the power I threw away. I hadn't used fire magic since I'd acquired plant magic. I tried to pretend it didn't exist. My own husband didn't even know that I could use fire magic. But that was fine, there was no use for it, anyway, and I wanted to be a magician who was needed, I couldn't lie in bed doing nothing, after all, I am someone with magic, I want to do something for my family and my territory, because I have the power. Author's note, this was a short chapter, so I'll upload another chapter tomorrow. Translator's note, but I won't. 141. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 1. Farewell to Sir Cain. Ultimately, we hadn't seen any demons appear since we'd entered Ruby Fallen. The demon's damage might be less than I'd imagined. Of course, looking at the muddy fields along the way, we hadn't escaped the effects of the heavy rains completely unscathed, but I felt like the worst case scenario had been avoided. On the way, I'd asked Kane what he'd do once he got to Ruby Fallen, and he said he'd temporarily change horses and immediately ride back to Rainforest. Although I really wanted him to stay at least one night and rest, considering his desire to return to Rainforest as soon as possible, I couldn't press him strongly on it. I promised Sir Kane I'd lend him the most splendid horse on the estate. I thought Azure would want to head for Rainforest with Sir Kane, but she wanted to stay in Ruby Fallen, so she'd remain with us. Come to think of it, Azure was with that stuffed up Kingdom Knight who wanted the matches. Maybe she was supposed to bring the matches I made here back to the castle. I can't help but be grateful she came with us here, but at the same time, I wouldn't be making high-grade matches for those castle guys. Or so I felt, but if as you wanted I'd give her some high-quality matches. Looking at Ruby Fallen Manor, I didn't see many people to greet us, because of the suddenness of the homecoming. But a few had been hastily assembled, 
and they began hitting their heads on the ground and giving the usual greeting. Stop it. Since Sir Kane was also here, really stop. Looking at Sir Kane next to me, he'd pulled back a little. He was, after all, the godly influencer who never forgot his followers' feelings. I didn't have them do that, they're doing it on their own. I'd rather they stopped. Sir Kane, it's not like that, I didn't ask them to do that, I frantically explained, and he nodded and smiled ambiguously, I'm worried he didn't believe me. Since there was a familiar bald head among the prostrate group, I called out to Gasaku, is Sir Bash home? Yes, he's inside, he's a little busy right now, he conveys his regrets for not being about to meet you, despite this being your homecoming. Please forgive him. No, forgiveness isn't really. Sir Bash has a higher rank than me, so no forgiveness is necessary. Seriously, don't say weird stuff with Sir Kane here. Really, read the mood. I tried to gently admonish Tigasaku, but he just gave the old Tigasaku smile and said something about how merciful I was. Intensely irritated seeing that face. My mercy towards Tugasaku did not feel very deep. Hey, Tugasaku, what are you doing with mud on your forehead? Brother Sha said casually, and after staring at him for a moment, Tugasaku exclaimed, I remember you, you're that cheeky Sha kid. What are you doing in such a place? Sha was considered a cheeky kid even by the other people of the village after all. He he, well, not much. My sister was in a bind and I came running. Sha gave a thumbs up, but if anything it seemed like I'd showed up when my brother was in a bind. Surely he hadn't planned that I'd meet my biological brother at the personal referral office and buy him. For now, I wanted to learn the situation quickly, so I hurried inside to meet Bash. Mamaku, Azure, Brother Sha, and Sir Kane came with me. Sir Kane was planning to leave after meeting Bash. We were guided to a guest room, and after a while, Loud footsteps announced Bash's hurried entrance. You ah, and Kuki came back, too. We're saved. Bash seemed happy, but his complexion wasn't good and I could see his fatigue. I hadn't seen any demons since entering Ruby Fallen, so I'd been a little optimistic, but we might not have been that fortunate. Sir Bash, the situation here in the territory. No, before that, I'd like to give Sir Kane from Rainforest here a horse for his return. Would you mind? He escorted us here. Before hearing about the territory, I thought I should switch topics to sending Sir Kane back. If a kind influence like Sir Kane learned about Ruby Fallen's plight, it might be difficult for him to return to Rainforest. No, I'd actually be happy if he stayed, but saying something like Ruby Fallen's in trouble. It's really bad we need a hero tilde. Batting my eyes in appeal, feels pretty dirty. No, actually. I would like to bat my eyes at him, but, every territory is in pretty much the same predicament. Oh, is that so? You've come all the way here. If you'd like, why not rest overnight? I can see you're tired, Bash said with a friendly smile, but Sir Kane shook his head. Thank you very much. However, notwithstanding your generous invitation, I need to get to my territory as soon as possible and protect my family, so I'd like to leave immediately. I see, it's too bad, but it may be for the best, you have my gratitude for conveying you here. Bash, speaking his appreciation like a true count, ordered his employees to prepare the best horse and provisions in the house, thanking Bash for his kindness and conveying his nightly apologies for the impoliteness of leaving early, Sir Kane left the room, and I followed him out for a final goodbye. Sir Kane, really? Thank you so much. Please let me return the favor someday. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. This was just something I wanted to do. I'm glad I was able to see you safely off. You. I can give a good report to Alan, too. He was as kind as ever. It was honestly tough coming here. Before entering Ruby Fallen, there were so many demons that I'd imagined the worst. But even in such times, I could ease my mind by turning to Sir Kane's gentle smile. In truth. Even Sir Kane couldn't help but be worried about his family and territory. Sir Kane, um, stay safe. Yeah, we haven't encountered any demons so far, and a single rider is even less likely to encounter demons. In the worst case, I should be fine if I run. As he said, Sir Kane should be fine. He was strong, and even if he thought he couldn't win through by strength, 
he could decide to not be reckless and take a detour, his good judgment had manifested at times while he discorded us here. Also, within Ruby Fallen, there weren't really any demons. Sir Cain, give my thanks to Alan, Dame Irene, and everyone at Rainforest. My pleasure. And with that, Cain gave a final reassuring smile all around and left. 142. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 2. The State of Ruby Fallen While I'd been sorrowfully parting with Sir Cain, as your and Brother Shah had finished their introductions with Bash, I was only worried that Brother Shah had done something rude in my absence. As I returned to my seat, I decided to first task Bash about the current state of the territory. The damage to the fields is immense. It seems like the rice paddies are somewhat usable, but this year's yield will drop sharply. Also, ultimately, there's the south side, Bash said, lowering his voice. If anything, the Ruby Fallen Manor was located in the north of the territory and the region where we'd been traveling up until now, which had felt no damage from demons, was on the northern border with rainforest. In the southern area, it seems there's a place where the barriers broken and demons have broken out. It was near where Seki and Ryuki were going to cultivate paddies from fields, so while there they were going to deal with the demons and repair the barrier, but after their report on the demons, we haven't received any reports from them, hopefully they just don't have enough time to prepare them. Sir Bash frowned bitterly and told us the rest of the story. From what Bash said, it seemed the reclamation work on the south side hadn't been done yet, and if demons were coming out on the south side, it was very likely that the river, unable to be released into paddies, had flooded and broken the barrier. By the way, Bash, do you know how much of the rice paddy plan was completed? Bash was puzzled at my sudden question, but unfurled a map. Um, I asked them to begin at the west side of the manor and go around north, east, and south. The last report we received from Seki was from around here, so I believe they've cultivated that far. Bash traced the map clockwise from the western region of Ruby Fallen, his finger stopping in the southern mountains. In the west of Ruby Fallen was a demon forest, and although the north faced the rainforest and Yamato territories, only the part near the trade road to rainforest was flat, with more than half being mountainous. The mountains surrounded Ruby Fallen in a sideways U-shape. Looking at the map, Ruby Fallen was by all rights coastal territory but the sea was inaccessible because of the mountains. Similarly, although the upper right corner of Ruby Fallen, which held Garigari village where Tagasaku and I were from, bordered Yamato territory, there was little interaction because of the steep mountains. I checked the location Bash had traced to see where the barrier was likely to stretch. The barrier basically skirted the mountains and the demon forest. The demons were sealed there. Bash had said the cultivation work had finished around here midway along the mountains facing the Genesis province. Compared to other areas, Ruby Fallen territory was surrounded by mountains, but if I assumed there were no breaks in the barrier in areas where paddies had been cultivated, the most likely place where the barrier was broken and demons got out was in the mountainous southern region bordering the Genesis province where no rice paddies had been made, and in fact, the report from Seki's group came from the southern region where they had yet to cultivate paddies. I was also worried about the demon forest in the west. The demon forest in the west was definitely using a long river flowing from the high mountains of the Genesis province as a barrier. As far as I could see from Bash's tracing on the map, cultivation started due west of the manor, so only the top half had been converted into rice paddies. What was going on in the lower half of the demon forest? or perhaps because the barrier is on the same river, flooding was abated by the rice paddies playing the role of a dam in the middle. But, by the way, it's only around the mountainous area along the border of Genesis province that we're sure the barrier is broken so far, right? Ah, for now, but... How many necromancers have you brought in from the capital, and what are they doing now? We've sent for nine people. Since we were also somewhat worried about areas other than the south, I asked the necromancers to patrol the territory repairing barriers. As expected, Bash, you've already dispatched them. Furthermore, it was reassuring there were nine of them, 
That was one big reason everyone thought Ruby Fallen was helpless when we learned of the collapse of the barriers throughout the country. Because we had very few magicians. Only magicians could repair the broken barriers. Even if you managed to suppress the demon outbreaks. If you couldn't repair the original break, demons would keep appearing with no end in sight. Not to mention that Ruby Fallen was surrounded by mountains and forests full of sealed demons even more so than other territories. That's so many necromancers, it's terrific. If you hadn't started the alcohol brewing business, it'd be bad. If Seki and Ryuki were the only magicians we had to respond to the disaster, there's no way they could handle it. By the way, where are the necromancers patrolling? Mr. Bash pointed on the map, two people at the demon forest in the west, two people in the north and two people in the east. I have three people standing by here at the manor. The truth is I'd like to send Seki's group reinforcements in the south, but necromancers don't have any means of fighting demons. I was hesitant to send them to the south when I knew demons were roaming about. I was waiting until I got in contact with Seki, at least, but nothing's come yet. Furthermore, the guard knights have been largely distributed to escort the necromancers west, east, and north respectively. I can't spare any more knights right now. I see. My feeling that the number of servants in the manor was down was because there weren't any knights errant. However, the image of necromancers having no way of fighting demons isn't quite right. At least, Charlie was capable of dealing a fatal blow to a strong demon. No. Let's drop that for now. There were other things we needed to discuss more. It's likely that the barrier is broken now because the river flooded due to the heavy rain, collapsing the river barrier. Furthermore, even if the river wasn't serving as the barrier, it's possible that the rope barrier was washed away in the flood. Bash nodded. I continued, as a matter of fact. We didn't encounter any demons in Ruby Fallen territory on our way here. We examined the barrier on the way but it was functioning without tissue. I think the reason it didn't break in that area is because of the rice field reclamation work done by Seki's group. They split up the river to draw water for the rice paddies. Thanks to the dispersed flow, the volume of water could accumulate in the rice paddies to some degree. So it seems the river never rose. Indeed. So, you verified the area where the rice field reclamation was completed? Then, together with Seki's report from the south, Perhaps the barrier is broken in the demon forest in the southwest. Suddenly, the door opened with a bang. It was Bash's daughter, Glitter, who'd slammed open the door. Even as the door swung, she cried with a pale face, Trouble, father. Mother's awake and she's on a rampage again. Wah, again? Bind her hands and feet, she'll settle down. They're already tied. But she's trying to get out. As she spoke, a woman with a grinning face appeared behind Gilita. Her bangs were parted neatly and her long hair was bound up in back. You, what did you just say? Why are you trying to tie me up? I'm a magician. I can't lie in bed at such a time. Gloria. Bash groaned, looking up to the heavens. Come on, untie the ropes around my wrists. If I don't go out, our people are waiting. If I don't regrow the ruined fields, they'll starve to death. I know. You've told us many times. You don't have the strength to do any more magic. We want you to quiet down and stay here. Bash and his wife started quarreling right in front of me as I blinked in surprise. Glitter also hugged her from behind, as if to hold her down. What on earth was this? I mean, his wife seemed to be quite healthy. Um, Sir Bash, Madam? I spoke timidly and Lady Gloria gave me a hard stare. Oh, sorry. You must be you and Kuki, and a lot of guests, I'm ashamed you had to see such things. The grimacing woman lamented, surprisingly, she actually remembered me, I was just happy that she remembered me, since we were barely acquaintances, but the lady's face reddened as she noticed the audience, Bash gave a huge sigh and gently held Gloria's shoulder, Gloria, have you calmed down, sit with us, for now, dear dear, I'm sorry, I got upset again, be but, when I think of our people having such a hard time. It's okay, I understand. Bash, holding his wife's shoulder, escorted her to the table and sat her down. The shape is actually that of the Japanese character. 143. Return of the Lord's adopted daughter 3, Madame Gloria and Matches, Madame. 
It was a situation I didn't understand in which the wife, who was supposed to be feeling poorly, was dreadfully lively. But for the time being, I greeted her, although I said it's been a while. When I was first adopted I had given my greetings to a closed door, so it felt almost like the first time meeting her. A, Mew, it has been a while. Or rather, I apologize for not being able to give you a proper greeting until now. I've heard that the people of Ruby Fallen were saved thanks to you, and I'm truly grateful. N no, no. I'm just sorry I haven't been able to greet you properly. Don't say such things, it wasn't your fault. I didn't want to show you my weak appearance, I'm sorry, but after my health recovered, I wanted to see you, but my anxious husband and daughter are trying to lock me up. Madame Gloria crossed her arms and gave Bash and Gillette a dissatisfied glare. Mother, that's because as soon as we relax our guard, you run out and try to use magic. Naturally, I'm a magician, I've relaxed enough. Rather, I've got too much power. Certainly. Guessing from her great proclamation, she seemed to have plenty of energy. I'd heard she was bedridden, but hadn't she recovered too much? Thinking so, I confirmed the situation with the madam, who was untying the ropes that still barely wrapped her wrists. It's superb that your health has improved. Incidentally, madame, what was your plan here? I heard that the fields that had been growing so well under your guidance were ruined by the heavy rain, so I was trying to save the fields with plant spiritualism. And yet my husband and daughter won't understand. Say, you, will you help me convince them? A, Madam Gloria, you could use plant spiritualism. I didn't know that. The rumor was that her body was weak and she could barely do any magic, but looking at her domineering attitude just now, she seems to have recovered well. So should she use it if she could? Bash opened his mouth before I was done thinking. No good. Gloria. You'll get sick again as soon as you use magic. But I'm fine now. The madam threw the untied rope to the floor. That's because you've been trying not to use magic these last few years. If you use it again, you'll get sick. You don't want to go back to being bedridden, do you? That's. We won't know unless I try. Gloria who had been fine until now, turned aside, sulking. From her gesture, I gathered somehow that using magic would harm her body again. It was the action of a lying child. She got sick when using magic? If so, although plant magic would be convenient, I couldn't tell her to use magic. I suddenly remembered the matchbox in my bag, given to me by Vice Principal Thomas. Vice Principal Thomas had said that his sister was a fire magician, but I wasn't sure if the madam could use fire magic. If she could use fire magic, it would be easier to deal with the demons, but if her condition got worse using magic, it might be better not to give her the matches. For now, I should talk her down from trying to use magic for the sake of the people at her own expense. Madame, please rest assured. On the way here from Rainforest, I saw the state of several villages. Even if you don't restore the fields, they should still be able to make it. The rice paddies were alive, so even though the fields were nearly ruined, some of the crops have survived. If we keep taxes down, the people won't starve. Although the situation in the south was unknown, the madam seemed to be hanging on my words for now, saying, Well, is that so? Yes, I've seen it with my own eyes. Please rest easy. I smiled. The madam still seemed skeptical, but she'd calm down for now. So I turned to Bash. As an aside, Bash, regarding the demon breakout in the south. Since Seki hasn't contacted you since then, I think I should head south to check it out. I'm sorry, Mew. The guards are already nearly all in use, and I don't have the capacity to send you there. That's okay. I don't need many guards. And since there's been no contact with Seki, someone has to go see what's happening, I said, pondering new party members. Our hole was bigger than I thought since the super soldier Sir Kane wasn't here. As Yura hadn't gone home and was still around, but she might be planning to get some matches and return to the capital. And what about brother Sha? He might follow if his cute little sister asked. Besides, there's Mamaku. I looked up at Mamaku and sighed in amazement as she smiled at me. To tell you the truth, I'm against it, but if I say that, you'll just recklessly run off alone, right? Bash, would you allow me to go see the situation a little, too? Mamaku was on my side, but Bash still had a bitter expression. What are you saying, 
kooky, there's no way, it's too dangerous, there are demons out there. I kept hounding the worried bash, we understand that, we didn't encounter any demons after entering Ruby Fallen, but before that we encountered them regularly on our way, but we were still able to deal with them, we can do it. Bash's eyes opened wider than I'd expected, there were demons on the way, wait, are the other territories breaking down like we are here? Ah, come to think of it, I was so busy asking about Ruby Fallen's affairs that I'd forgotten to tell Bash how the rest of the country was faring right now. Sorry, I didn't tell you about it properly. I briefly explained what had happened from the time the school was attacked by demons until the present. The more I explained, the paler the pitiful Bash's face seemed to get, but when I finished, Bash finally grabbed his head. The country isn't willing to do anything in this emergency? Apparently, Bash was quite shocked that the country showed no sign of actively defending the territories. Well, yeah, I was also pretty shocked at the country's response at first. Oh well, I was thinking we could wait for help from the country, but if we can't expect any more than the people who are in the territory now, we'll have to deal with it. Then, it's certainly necessary to go see the state of the south right away. Just so. Then Mamaku and I will go. I think we're probably the most knowledgeable about dealing with demons, of the people here at the manor. Bash nodded, though he looked a little sour. From what I've heard of your story, having already experienced them on your way here, that may be so. However, to send you off to such a dangerous region, I just wish we had a magician who could at least deal with demons. In that case, I really should go. Bash put his chin on his hand, in a thinking motion. No, Bash, I think you're better working here, compiling information and issuing commands. Speaking of which, when I was a bandit, Bash was active enough that he took to Gasaku and jumped into agrarian reform on his own. But I think it's better for great people to deign to be composed, and frankly, it didn't seem like he could fight, he honestly felt like a burden. However, as Bash said, I also thought we could have felt more assured if there were a magician who could deal with demons along. Then what about the alcohol brewing necromancers? He'd said that several of them were out dealing with things in other areas than the south, but I'd heard there were three of them waiting in the manor. If they were there, we could have them fix any breaks we found in the barrier on the spot. Sir Bash, I'm sure there were three necromancers here, right? What about taking them? The necromancers don't have any way to deal with demons. That's why they took so many guards with them. The magicians that stayed in the manor are elderly and not fit for travel. They were elderly? But I wasn't convinced that necromancers had no way to attack demons. Having seen Charlie's rot and die, demon. Incident up close. Then again, that seemed to only trigger when in direct contact with the demon so perhaps it wasn't suitable for combat. But I had to convince Bash somehow, if this continued, there was a chance Bash might go south himself. As I wondered what to say, a dignified voice rang out, I should go. It was Gloria who spoke. She continued, by rights, I, as a magician, should be managing Ruby Fallen. I had my condition, so I left it to you, dear. But I've already recovered. I am a lord of Ruby Fallen and a magician. I can't simply do nothing at a time like this. This is why I married you. As you know I've said so many times, you can't. Gloria, are you going to use magic and make yourself bedridden again? I'm worried for you, Bash begged. He seemed quite anxious. Since I've only known his wife after she became energetic, I didn't really get it. But for Bash, who's been seeing his wife laid up in bed for so long, it may be unthinkable for her to go out. I'll be fine. Besides, I can also repair the barrier. If someone is to go south, there's nobody more qualified than me. You're smart enough to know that, dear. Will you use magic to repair the barrier? Then I can't let you go any further. No, I have to go. I am a lord. Anyway, repairing the barrier will be fine. I won't get sick. It's the plant spiritualism that makes me sick. The madam said, and cut off. She made a bitter face hesitating to say the next words, what was it? If it's repairing the barrier, I can do it without any problems, Gloria said shamefully, as if to hide something. Right, 
The vice principal said that his sister was a fire magician, and when we were at school, I'd seen Charlie getting sick when she forced herself to learn plant spiritualism spells. At the time, she'd said, you get sick just looking at spells that aren't compatible with you. Some people even go so far as to ruin their health chanting so hard. Perhaps the madam destroyed her health by using incompatible plant spiritualism. Madame, are you not very good at plant spiritualism? But if it were another magic, it wouldn't necessarily harm your body. Fire magic, for example. I asked hopefully, when the madam gave a gasp, is that true? Until now, I've only seen you use plant spiritualism here, so I thought that was the only magic you could do. Bash said, and his wife looked down. Why was she looking down? If the madam was a fire magician, it'd be pretty easy to go south. Even if demons appeared, she could deal with them with ease. Perhaps, if I can use fire magic how incredibly reassuring. I was about to reply, but she broke in with a furious look. Fire magic. That magic. It can't do anything to help people. I don't know magic that can only destroy. Oh. What's this? Suddenly things got rough. The scenario seems to be that, rather than not being able to use fire magic, she was hiding her ability. How do I put it? I was a little surprised. Since she was the younger sister of the fire magic loving Thomas, I thought that Gloria would of course be proud of fire magic as well. Was she hiding her use of fire magic just now because she hates that magic? Was it a reaction to her elder brother, a man who loves fire magic? But, thinking about the current state of the territory, I was very grateful we had a fire magician. I took a single box of matches out of my bag. A matchbox that parted hair asked me to give to his sister. Madame, um, this is from Vice Principal Thomas. When I said Professor Thomas's name, the madam was clearly upset. T. Thomas? Yes, I've heard that he's your brother. With a slightly trembling hand, she took the matches from me. Vice Principal Thomas told me to pass these on to you. He said you were an excellent fire magician. She frowned and looked disgusted. I said I don't know fire magic. I don't need that kind of power. I met the stubborn lady's eyes. Madame, fire magic is amazing magic. Especially now, since the territory is being attacked by demons, it's extremely helpful. B but, if there's no source of flames, the magic can't do anything and becomes useless anyway. The madam brought up all kinds of weak points to fire magic. It felt strange to hear criticism of fire magic from someone who looked so much like the vice principal, being siblings. As I listened, I took another new matchbox out of my bag. I want Bash to see this, too. As a matter of fact, I've been asking you to collect fire and ice magic stones for a while, right? That was to make these. Watch carefully. Then I took out a match and struck it on the matchbox. Fire blossomed at its tip. With these, fire can be carried around safely and, as long as you don't soak them in water, you can quickly light a fire anywhere. Bash who was seeing the matches for the first time, was probably very surprised. He stared at the stick with the fire at its tip with wide eyes, and a soft, what, I don't believe it, came from Gloria. Then she stared at the matchbox in her hand in awe. If you don't believe it, madame, by all means please try it yourself. It may be a little tricky at first, but you can strike them easily. Watching my striking motion on the matchbox. The madam opened the matchbox she was holding with trembling hands, as she mustered her resolve and opened it. I thought she'd take out a match, but then she gave a look of surprise, staring at the box of matches, and made a movement like brushing out the inside to get a look at the bottom. Eh? What was the matter with her? Gloria suddenly burst into tears and covered her face with both hands. The matchbox fell from her hand onto the table. I couldn't see them well. But letters were written on the bottom of the box, perhaps a message from the vice principal. Just a single sentence of apology had entered my vision, but I thought it would be impolite to see too much and glanced away. Gee Gloria, what is it? Bash put his arms around the shoulders of the suddenly tearful woman. And Gloria leaned in to cling to him. Please, dear, let me go south. Be but, like you said earlier, if you're attacked by demons. Interrupting Bash's words. His wife touched the lit match I held, chanted a spell, and said, dance. The fire flew out from the tip of the match, 
dancing all around the room until it came to rest back on the match's tip. It was amazing, beautiful. Gee Gloria, was that magic, just now? Is your body alright? Bash's wife nodded at him with a smile. I'm fine. Unlike plant spiritualism, fire magic seems compatible with my body. It's completely different. Rather, it feels like my body is in proper shape after a long time. When I managed to learn plant spiritualism, I thought I'd never use fire magic again, so I hid it all this time. She said, and closed her eyes, and when she opened them, her tears had stopped. But it seems like this power is needed, now. Yes, I remember. Fire isn't just frightening, it can be a warm, hopeful light. Yes. I remember my elder brother taught me that when I was little, I'll burn up all the demons in Ruby Fallen with this flame, and make it a beacon of hope. So, let me go to the south. Gloria's eyes were a little red, but she was very dignified. 144. Return of the Lord's adopted daughter for preparing for the rescue trip. To make a long story short, when his wife begged him to let her go south, and I thought he'd probably give her permission. Bash said it was still no good, and rejected her plea. I thought it was probably because of Bash's love for his cherished wife, but Lady Gloria was furious. Gloria went, then we're getting divorced. Gah! And threw such a fit that the flame on the match flared up like a pillar of fire. Thanks to that threat. Ahem, that passionate appeal. She was permitted to go south after confirming a certain condition. And Bash's condition was simple to check whether Lady Gloria's body was really undamaged when she used fire magic. Therefore, we went outside for our experiment. Madame, first, please light a match. Yes, just like that. Good lighting. You're a natural. Now, direct your fire magic this way for the experiment, please. As I called out, the madam cast a spell in the direction I indicated, releasing a jet of fire. The flames shot out with a terrible whoosh and the pile of straw I'd prepared as a target turned to ash with surprising speed. What's this? It's really scary. Wasn't the power and scale of her fire bigger than Vice Principal Thomas's? Next to me, surprised, Bash also gave a wordless, ooh and Gilita said, Mother, how terrifying, in shock. Lady Gloria, is your physical condition okay? Certainly, no problem at all. The madam's complexion also looked quite energetic and ruddy. How about it, Sir Bash? She seems fine, right? I ventured, and Bash, who had been unable to take his eyes from his fire magic wielding wife, trembled slightly and looked at me in surprise. Th that's true. I get it, she can go to the south. Bash, sorry. I deeply regret turning Gloria into an ogress by giving her a murder weapon called Matches. As I lowered my head to the trembling Bash, Gloria, ecstatic that she'd gotten permission, ran up and hugged him. Dear, thank you. I'm so happy. Gloria, you're really all better. I'm glad. I'm really glad, Gloria. Bash's cheeks were red as if excited, and he hugged her back with a happy expression. But was that trembling really from joy? I imagined something a little strange about Bash, who showed such joy at his ogreish wife's aggression that he trembled, but surely he must have been genuinely happy to see his formerly frail wife recuperate. Surely Bash wasn't some kind of massacre. Ahem, ahem, he must simply be pleased to see his wife so energetic. However, if by chance this happened to have some adverse effect on the Ruby Fallen's marriage, I'm very sorry. With an indescribable expression, I gave a quiet bow to Gilita, who was watching her parents embrace, although I myself might have caused the trembling new change in Bash and Gloria's marriage, I decided to hurry the preparations for departure with Gloria and a few of the remaining guards from the manor, I could go south. To be frank, I was already pretty tired just getting this far, but I couldn't slow down. I needed to ascertain the situation quickly. Huh? Tigasaku. What's up with that luggage? Tigasaku had turned up, packing food and medical equipment into the carriage. He had a lot of luggage. I had a very unpleasant feeling. Lady Yu, I heard you were embarking on a rescue journey for the villages of Ruby Fallen and hurried to join. No, Tigasaku, no need for you to join up, please stay with Bash in the manor. But then who will keep a record of the Great Yu's journey of salvation? The manor guards accompanying you are still just night trainees. Even if they can read, 
They can't write. You need someone to keep a record. He asked me who would keep a record with puppy dog eyes, but I don't especially need someone to keep records. Rather, I'm surprised he's treating keeping a record as a matter of course. We don't need to keep records. Besides, Tagasaku, you can't ride a horse or even drive a carriage, so you'd just slow us down on foot. There's a good chance we'll encounter demons, so that'd be dangerous. I said with finality. Because I've already learned that Tigasaku wouldn't change his mind if I didn't tell him emphatically. Ooh, Lady Wu, what boundless mercy. To think you'd worry about little old me. Tigasaku began to tear up, for sure. I was worried about Tigasaku, mainly about his head. Or rather, only about what's in his head. But, Miss Wu, there's no need to worry. Even if I die, I swear to stay with the Great Wu's journey of salvation. Stop. You don't have to stay with us like that, just go quietly to heaven. I imagined the spirit of Tigasaku following me around as a ghost and felt my blood drain as I stared at him. Or rather, glared. Tigasaku, there's no need for you to make a record of the trip. Please understand that, first of all, there's no need. Ha ha ha. No, no, Lady Wu, you're so funny. I deeply admire your generous heart, to make jokes in such a difficult time. No, it wasn't a joke. Also, Tigasaku was trying to climb into the carriage with a smile as he said it. Oh no, I'm getting scared. Why are you trying to get into the carriage without permission? Look, Tigasaku, please go back to the manor. Really? Even if you give me the look, you're not coming. Please get out of the carriage. I ordered him sternly, pointing at the manor. Tigasaku made a face like an abandoned kitten, but he wasn't cute at all so I wasn't fooled. Look, Tigasaku, go home, go home. My resolute manner worked and I managed to get Tigasaku out of the carriage. He looked extremely depressed, but I'd already made up my mind. I had that absolutely not, Tigasaku mentality. Oh, you, what's going on? I heard raised voices from inside the manor just now. Mamaku and Azure came over with their luggage, although I thought they'd be carrying out their luggage along with me. Good timing. I clung straight to Mamaku. Mamaku. No, please listen. Tigasaku was trying to come along by force. He also said things I didn't understand, like keeping a record. I showed her Tigasaku, who was looking at me reluctantly as he got down from the carriage. Tigasaku, you never learn, do you? Mamaku looked at Tigasaku pityingly, and he moaned at her, please speak to her. Mrs. Kuki, the way things are going. The sacred news journey of salvation won't be recorded. Even if they can read, the guards going with Lady Yu can't write. So I have to go. Azure, escort this man to his room, Mimaku said, and Azure put down her luggage. Wah, huh? You understood. Azure looked a little confused, but she answered promptly. All right, Mr. Tigasaku. This way. Azure escorted Tigasaku into the manor with a gentle smile like an experienced caregiver. How kind, Azure was kind. After watching Tigasaku's retreating back, I got to work packing the carriage with Mamaku. I could finally concentrate on my work. All things considered, I was surprised when Azure said she'd come with us, Mamaku said, turning her head as she organized luggage in the carriage. Indeed, Azure, a knight of the realm, had said she'd continue along with us on our tour of Ruby Fallen. I was grateful she'd even accompanied us to Ruby Fallen, and now she was still coming with us. What an angel. I know, right? A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. There really are barely any guards in the manor, and if we have Azure, we can leave the coachman's job to her. What a relief. Nodding repeatedly at Mamaku's words, I recalled my earlier conversation with my brother. So short-handed I was grasping at straws. I tentatively asked Brother Sho if he wanted to come patrolling with us. But he said, you're gonna see a bunch of demons, right? Sorry, but I'm not good with demons, so I'll pass. I'll definitely pray for your safety, though, little sis. And gave me a thumbs up. Although his little sis was rushing toward a place where demons were, he gave a wide smile. I kept preparing while recalling bitter memories about my brother, and finally, we set off. Although a lot happened. Our party ended up being me, Mamaku, and Azure, as well as several guards, and the elite unit called Fianna User Gloria.
I'd asked the stay-at-home Bash to work on mass-producing matches. Bash, the inveterate warrior, who seemed especially worried about Gloria, kept reminding the guards, I'm leaving her to you, but I guess it's fine. His wife seemed like the strongest person I'd met in Ruby Fallen, and so we left the manor with everyone seeing us off. 145. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 5, Mysterious Call to Saruseru Village. Also, a few knights who were in the manor, I was going to ask Kazuya to drive the carriage, but since one of the knight trainees wasn't good at riding horseback, they were assigned to be the primary coachman, there was one carriage, and everyone else went riding our horses alongside. In truth, I'd wanted to prepare another carriage, but I hadn't had the manpower and time to arrange for one. So Madame Gloria got to experience sitting in a carriage full of cargo. I was worried because she wasn't used to traveling in a cargo carriage. But the Madame was quite dignified and didn't utter a single complaint. Besides, the Madame seemed to have practiced riding a little before we left, and apparently could do it without a problem if she rode double with a knight supporting her from behind. She'd practiced it because if demons appeared it'd be easier to cast magic on a horse with a wide field of view than in a carriage. What a wonderful madam. At first, I was surprised when I saw the madam so enraged, but she was basically a devoted wife who put the people of her territory first. Even though I wasn't bash, I'd fallen for her. Though she'd suddenly turn into an ogress if she had a match, I'd ask those remaining at the manor, including bash, to work on making matches. My unemployed brother Sha safely got a job, but whether he'd do what he was told and work properly. Your sister is worried. It had already been several days since we'd left the manor, and our party had chosen for the journey a big road descending south from the western region of the territory. As the west side was near the magic forest, it was an area with a high likelihood that the barrier had been broken. So I'd chosen that path to inspect the villages in the west. However, so far, even when I had some of the knights I'd brought take the fastest horses to the nearby villages, there were no particular signs of any of them being attacked by demons. No demons suddenly attacked on the way, and just as we thought the west seemed to be okay, we met up with a group of necromancers who'd happened to be ahead of us. When I asked, they told us they hadn't found any breaks in the barrier yet. After some discussion, we decided that the group of necromancers would carry out a full inspection of the barrier around the magic forest. While we would head straight to South Ruby Fallen as planned, it seemed the west was probably fine. I'd been worried that the planned rice paddies in the upriver villages hadn't made progress, but since paddies had been constructed in the downriver villages, it was very likely that they'd prevented a rise in water levels and the river hadn't flooded. After that, our only concern was the south. The fast horse recon squad, which had been ranging to the left and right to grasp the situation of the nearby villages, was concentrated to the front. While checking on nearby villages on the way, we headed straight for the southern mountains, and finally arrived in the area from which the report of demon appearances had been sent. It had already been four days since we left the manor. Honestly, I was slipping in and out of physical and mental fatigue. I tended to forget, but I was a lively young girl in my early teens. Occasionally I would quietly recite some recovery magic, but although I managed to push through, it didn't cure my mental fatigue. As I was dozing on my horse, I heard hurried hoofbeats. I turned at the sudden sound and saw Azure on her horse. Azure the knight of the realm who'd thankfully accompanied us on our tour of the territory, was in charge of Recon. The much appreciated Azura had gone to see the village of Saruseru, a little ways off. What's the matter? I asked with a bad feeling. There was only one reason she'd have returned in such haste after going to look at a village. Saruseru village has been destroyed. And the villagers? The village was empty. As far as I could tell, I didn't find any villagers. Hopefully. They were able to evacuate successfully. Otherwise, as you said ambiguously, were there signs of a fight? Did you see any demons? There were some traces of blood in the village. Also, as you lifted a bundle of canvas she tied behind her horse, its bottom was stained red and black, probably with blood. I let out an A, as a sudden grotesque premonition solidified in my mind, but as you laughed and said, It's okay. It's not someone's severed head, it's the corpse of a demon, it fell in the village. 
the corpse of a demon? I mean, as you said it was okay, but I thought it was grotesque either way. I stared fixedly at the blood-soaked canvas bag. Were there any other people who fell there? From what I saw, only the demon's corpse. I couldn't leave the demon's carcass as it was, so I brought it here to have Gloria burn it. Is that so? You casually brought that thing here, that corpse, I said the first thing that came to mind, but as you somehow thought I was praising her and beamed at me. Yes, somehow I feel like I've gotten stronger as I've been on this journey. Oh, oh, I thought so, too. As you you've gotten strong. At first, when demons appeared, she was bound to start trembling. Speaking of which, by the time we entered the Ruby Fallen territory, there had been many opportunities to encounter lots of demons, and along the way, as yours agitation had faded even when demons appeared. She was so used to demons she could even stuff the carcass of one in a canvas sack. Mew, what's wrong? said Mamaku, who came up from where she was riding by the rear of the carriage. When I recounted the story as Yura had told me, she raised her eyebrows and muttered, It's concerning that there was nobody there. Certainly. I was uneasy about there not being a single person in Saruseru village. Furthermore, even though there was a demon's corpse, there wasn't a single human corpse. For now, let's call on Gloria. Mamaku went back to the carriage. I said, please do, seeing her off, and looked back at Azure's blood-stained canvas bag. Since it was the corpse of a local demon, it might be a good idea to see how it had died. Although, frankly, I didn't want to examine it, as you before Gloria burns it, would you show it to me? I may be able to learn something from it. Is that okay? Isn't it filthy? As you asked with surprise, it was filthy, I knew. Rather, I wanted to shout out loud that as you went above and beyond in bringing it here, I'll make do. By the way, does the demon look humanoid? No, it's shaped like a wolf. Good, it was better if it was an animal. I was glad for my mountain living. Understood. The sack, please. I got off my horse, took the canvas bag from Azure, untied the drawstring, and dumped its contents on the ground. It was the head and body of a demon with horns and fangs growing on something like a hairless dog. The neck had been cleanly severed from the body. Even in such a state, it seemed to be alive, and the limbs, tied with string were twitching slightly, as expected of a demon. Impressive life force. At any rate, these wounds are new. Azure, did you bind its limbs with string? Yes. When I found it, its neck was severed and it was flailing its legs around. I figured it was dangerous to leave as is, so I tied it up with string and brought it along. Is that so? You went that far, Azure. Great. It felt like Azure was somehow giving off a proud expression. I wasn't sure what to say and nodded with a vague smile, but Azure looked as happy as a dog who'd been praised. Anyway, this cut was too clean. At the least, it wasn't a wound that could have been caused by the villagers' farming tools. It felt like it had been neatly dispatched with a sword. Were there any knights errant living in Saruseru village? I've never been to this village, but I think some knights errant were deployed nearby. One of the knights from Ruby Fallen Manor replied, I see, if such people took command. The villagers might have been successfully evacuated, and after evacuating the villagers, they may have gone out periodically hunting demons. There may still be villagers nearby. Let's hurry over to Saruseru village. After the remains of the demon were grandly incinerated by great fire magician Gloria, we aimed for Saruseru village with all haste. When we arrived at the village, it was unpopulated and quiet, as Azure had said, the fields were ruined by the rain, they showed no sign of repair. Still, when we reached the rear of the village, we saw signs of people, or rather, people came out. Three people, the man with a small moustache and the largest physique led them in front of the carriage. Are you the relief from the Lord? He asked desperately, looking at his wit's end. At his question, Gloria came down from the carriage. She was the only magician of our group, and the Lord's wife. Though we'd pushed ourselves to get here, she descended with dignity and no sign of fatigue. Yes, that's right. I am Gloria, Lady of Ruby Fallen and a magician. Oh, welcome. You said you were a magician? Even here in such a remote village. And such a quick rescue? We only sent the young people of the village running for the Lord's house the other day. 
so we weren't expecting you to come so soon. Apparently, the villagers were headed for the Lord's Manor, however, they were mistaken that we'd come here in response to their notification. Ah, I forgot to mention, I'm Bran, the Knight Errant tasked with organizing the villages in this area. And Sir Little Stish, who called himself Bran, bowed respectfully. 146. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 6, Saruseru Village Fire. Somehow it seems refreshing. Thank you for your patronage of Resume of a Reincarnated Girl, where our high-spec former high school girl will continue play an active role. Bran, I wouldn't mind if you'd relax. Anyway, what on earth is going on with this village? Why can't we find any villagers? Madame Gloria said to the short-moustached Sir Bran, who was kneeling reverently. Bran answered. Remaining on his knees, the villagers have been evacuated to the Living Way Holy Caverns. However, because there's a food shortage, some of the men from the village have come to gather food and at the same time check on the village. Currently, all the demons that have attacked the village have been small fries. If they're minor demons, the villagers know how to deal with them. So for now we've managed to get by. Living Way? Also, this is the first time I've heard that villagers know techniques to counter demons. Are there any villagers in this pioneer village who've been trained by knights? No. Nothing so official as that, but under the Lord's prior policy, I've been teaching the farmers how to hunt beasts. I've heard it was originally intended as a means to ward off damage from animals, but the villagers were unexpectedly adept at it, and hunting has become a part of life since then in the mountain villages. They're getting rid of the demons the same way they hunt beasts. Since they're only little demons, fortunately, it's not that different from hunting beasts. We had just finished off all the small demons in the village. At Bran's words, as you came forward in a hurry. Were you the one in the village? Ah, you're the one from a while ago. I'm sorry for being rude back then. I heard a loud sound like a horse's whinny and left in a hurry. After all, I thought one of the big demons had appeared at last. When I took in the situation after a while and realized that it was a person, you'd already left, and my call didn't reach you. I apologize. As Yura had said there was no one in the village earlier, but apparently, they'd been hiding or missed one another, that said, I never thought the beast damage countermeasures I gave out a couple of years ago would have this kind of effect, but what about weapons? Then, were you the one who cut off the dog like demon's head, Bran? It seemed like it was cut with a sharp blade. Or do the villagers also have swords? When I interjected from the side, Bran shook his head with a slightly sorry face. I cut up that demon. The villagers are using farming tools as weapons, or the simple bow and arrows they use when hunting, or sharpen tree branches. Basically, the way it goes is that the villagers weaken the demons and I finish them off. If there were others with swords like me, we might have been able to wipe out the demons that settled in the village, but those wouldn't have been distributed to pioneering villages. Ah. It was as I thought, if Alan were here, he'd be able to make swords quickly. No, it was no use thinking about people who weren't here right now. Also, Bran said something about demons that settled in the village just now. I wondered if the small fry demons were associated with some group in the vicinity. While I was thinking, I saw something quick cross the edge of my vision. It had the form of a dog, like the corpse Azura had brought earlier. For a moment I thought it would launch an attack, but it crossed without turning and entered a patch of tall grass. Ahem, as you say, they're still here. Bran muttered was that? Bitterly, staring at the tall grass, that was a demon that settled near the village. They're small and not very strong, but there are a lot of them and they're quick. Even if we try to defeat them, they hide in the tall grass and escape. So those were the demons that settled in the village that I'd just been wondering about? Even though they're demons, demons that look like beasts as a rule act like them as well. Then, what's the difference from other beasts? But since its appearance was the same as always, or perhaps I should say, as gross, because it was a demon, it was easy to tell. Okay, anyway, those grass batches were certainly troublesome. Sure, the demons were small, but once they got into the grass, we were at an impasse. If we chased them into the grass, the visibility would be poor and it would be difficult to move, so conversely, we'd be attacked by the demons. By the way, are those grassy patches weeds? No, they were originally fields, 
they contained land-grown rice, but since they've been left alone after they were ruined, the weeds might be more abundant. R. Then, we should try burning a little of it. Madame, I'd like that grassy area burned. Can you do it? A. That field? Aren't there crops there? Even though it's called a field, it's already ruined. In the state it's in, we'll need to recultivate it anyway. I shifted my gaze to Bran and said, burning it isn't a problem, right? And he nodded confirmation. However, Madame Gloria gave me a bit to look be but. Burning crops. Even though she was straining her body previously, she seemed to have a resistant sensibility as a madam who used plant spiritualism. It's better for the field to burn it. The ashes remaining will be good nutrition, and the crops planted there next will grow well. Besides, we need to do something about the current situation, where it may have become a kind of demon's nest. With my persuasion, she slowly nodded. All right, I understand. What you says is always right. Matches. The madam said, motioning for a match. No, but not everything I say is always right. But since it would get rough if she changed her mind, I quickly struck and gave her a lit match. As the madam took the match she chanted a spell, and the flame flew into the grass, expanding like a vortex from the flame's location. The madam recited the spell again and again. We instantly noticed it. As the grassy patches within sight were engulfed in flame, we heard what seemed to be demons' cries ringing out here and there. It seemed more demons were hiding in the grass than we'd thought, chased out by the flames. A few of the demons emerged from the grass, and I shot them with a bow, stopping their movement and then killing them. Ah, the range of Madame's fire magic, I mean, wasn't it a bit too widespread? So I thought, but the time had passed when anyone could say something to the Madame, who was desperately casting spells. Then, after a while, the flames were all suddenly extinguished with nothing more to burn. The field where grass had been growing a short while ago was only blackened ground. Visibility had become considerably clear. Or rather, too clear. Privately, I'd only wanted to burn the field next to us as an experiment, but she'd burned the next field, and the next one, and the one after that. This was the power of a single match. It's a little scary. I mean, the speed at which she burned it was amazing. Bran was speechless, his mouth hanging open like a fool. Ahem, ahem, I cleared my throat. When I'd gotten everyone's attention, I said, well, it's better to burn them like this, from now on, and explained how the visibility in Saruseru village had greatly improved. Th that's true. Next time we plow the field, it looks like it'll be very easy, a villager said, and although most of the village had gone as bald as a monk, they didn't seem to mind much. Yeah, that's good. Well then, let's make our way to where the villagers have been evacuated. Bran, can you show us the way? Mamaku said calmly, and Bran, who still seemed surprised at Madame Gloria's power, raised his face in a panic. Why yes, everyone will be relieved to learn that relief from the Lord has arrived. Bran, who had bowed time and again, bowed to Gloria with an even more strained appearance than before. We advanced under his guidance, in high spirits, and arrived at the caverns. The men of the village were keeping watch on the surroundings. After Bran called out a word or two to the watchman, we entered the cave. The inside was bigger than I thought, and there were a lot of people. They all seemed to be the residents of Saruseru village. When they saw us, they went wild with joy. While the knights from the manor distributed the food we'd loaded into the carriage, the main countess's party, including me, sat down with Bran's group in a comparatively beautiful part of the caverns. After hurried greetings, Bran immediately gave a summary of what had happened to the villagers so far. After the heavy rains, Bran, who had noticed demons appearing, raced on horseback to bring the news to the village, so they were able to evacuate to the caverns as soon as possible. Bran, great work. However, it seemed that not everyone was able to make it unharmed. When we heard that the injured were lying in the rear of the cave, Mamaku and I offered to treat them. We'd also brought our medical equipment along for such an event. After confirming the current status of the villagers, Gloria gave a decisive nod. I'm relieved that everyone seems to be better off than I'd thought. But in order to truly free you from the threat of the demons, we need to cut them off at the source. I will go to restore the barrier. A. Seriously? 
but it's such a hard thing for the madam. I tried to think of something, but nothing clicked. Among those of us who witnessed the madam's extremely powerful flame magic, there was no one fearless enough to say, we can't let you go to such a dangerous place. I knew that very well, if someone were to oppose what she'd said so coldly, she'd threaten to launch a column of fire at them. Ahem, I'm sure there won't be any strong objections. R. Then, me too. Although I said it in a tone that brooked no opposition, Gloria shook her head. You, you stay here with Kuki and treat those who are injured. I'll have some of the knights accompany me, the madam said, and the knights she'd brought from Ruby Fallen nodded. I thought a little and then nodded slowly. It was true. As Gloria said, it might be better for me to stay here and care for people. The situation was that the injured people were on their own, while Gloria's fire magic was immensely powerful. I, on the other hand, would likely be a burden. Understood. Don't forget your matches. Good luck. Gloria stood up with a nod. It was hasty, but she seemed to be leaving already. I could truly respect Gloria's can-do spirit. She was so powerful that I could barely believe she'd been ill her whole life. I handed over a couple of matchboxes from my bag and the madam dashed out of the cave along with the knights she'd brought from the manor. 147. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 7. The Living Way Holy Caverns. Everyone in the village had heard that we were a rescue team from the Lord's Manor, and smiled delightedly at us but it must have been painful that the village was attacked by demons, after all, their faces looked exhausted and they were feeling down, there were narrow windows in the cave that let in a bit of light, but it was still a gloomy place overall, I thought, thinking such things, and looking at the state of the cave, I was a little worried about the formation of these caverns, it appeared that people had enlarged by hand a cavern that was originally a natural formation, speaking of which, Bran had called this place the Living Way Holy Caverns. Why was it called Living Way? And how long had they been enlarging it? And why, if they hadn't worked on it before the demon attack, it wouldn't have been big enough of cavern for people to live in? Mew, this way. Looks like the injured people are back here. Yes ma'am. Oh, that's right. We had to hurry. I'd think about it later. For now, I was a nightingale. I had to concentrate on saving lives. At Mamaku's call, I trotted to the back of the cave, heading for a section with a simple cloth partition. As the villagers injured by demons gave out painful groans, I steeled myself and peeked inside, but it was more normal than I'd thought. Sure, there were some wounded people, but only a few. There were people who were injured on their arms and legs, but it didn't seem like anyone was paralyzed or bedridden from their injuries. For now. I was just relieved it wasn't as bad a situation as I'd thought. Even saying that, there were a few people with bad injuries, who had been attacked by demons, and even if their injuries weren't bad themselves, the likelihood wasn't low that germs could get in and inflame the wound, turning it into a serious situation. Time to buckle down and treat people. Mamaku started looking at a comparatively serious patient and I was to see a patient with a minor injury. Although everyone in the village had only light injuries, when I saw a scene like this, I wanted to teach everyone the self-healing spell. If everyone was able to cast the spell, they'd all recover right away. But even if I taught it to them, I might just be subjecting them to a different danger with that knowledge. But anyway, it took time for someone to get to the point where they could cast the spell. They wouldn't be able to just, poof kill themselves. Mamaku also said that she was occasionally able to get in the flow and see my spells during our lessons, but she still couldn't memorize them. If that's how it was for Mamaku, it would probably take many months for the villagers, who struggled just to read, to learn any spells. I collected my thoughts and decided to concentrate on the treatment in front of me now. Since it was a man with an injured leg, I took a look at the affected area while listening to the injured man's story. It seemed he'd been scratched by a demon. What? Some kind of medicine had already been pasted on. A green medicine. It was like ground up grass. When I took a dab of it in my hand and smelled it, I caught a unique smell and realized it had to be an herb called mugwort. Mugwort was one of the medicinal herbs often used by healers for stopping bleeding of cuts, etc. I'd likewise benefited from it. As well, was there a healer in the village who'd applied it? I wondered, or was this folk wisdom? No, 
I doubted there was such folk wisdom in the pioneering villages. At least, there was nothing like that in my hometown, Garigari village. As I considered it, I carefully removed the mugwort that had been stuck there, cleaned the leg, and applied Mamaku's special patch. Since the leg wound had already stopped bleeding, I applied medication to suppress inflammation. After that, I sought to the wounds on the other patients, but they'd all been given first aid and coated with the medicinal herb. Although there were people injured by the demons, there was nobody with an infected wound, nor with inflammations or severe symptoms. Thanks to this medicinal herb, everyone had been able to sterilize their wounds using the medicinal herb. Proper first aid was really important. Without this, even if the wound itself was small, it wouldn't be strange for bacteria to enter it and put the person in a dangerous situation. Who could it have been? Somebody with medical knowledge was in a pioneer village. Was it the night bran? Excuse me, is there a medical doctor in this village? Would you say, or someone who knows medical herbs? I asked a woman with a deep arm wound while applying medicine. There was a boy at her side looking at the wound anxiously. He seemed to be the woman's son. There are no medical doctors. But I know a lot about medicinal plants. The woman answered hesitantly, and when I tilted my head, the boy next to her gave a big smile. We have the favor of the great Uoi daughters. He said excitedly. I reflexively dropped the ointment I'd scooped up to apply to the woman's arm. Eh? You oil? Ah, you can't. Boy, we're not supposed to speak of her so casually. Don't worry, we're in the living way holy cave. I know. You oil is so sacred, if I say her name where the sun shines, my mouth will rot, but in the living way holy cave, it's okay because the sun doesn't shine here. Really, this kid. I'm sorry. Doctor, this kid's favorite thing to talk about is you oil. Ah, but is this topic not familiar to the doctors serving at the counts? The woman asked gently, and gave a troubled laugh. Since it would be a hassle, I hadn't told people I was the count's adopted daughter, so they thought I was a doctor serving in the count's manner. Well, that wasn't unreasonable given that I was actually treating them. Even so, even so, this kind of talk about you oil is making me worried. As far as I could tell, Uoi had told them about the variety of wild plants in the village, and it was someone so sacred that you shouldn't speak their name too much outside or else your mouth would rot. I, I is there really such a person? Wow, could such an amazing person exist? I managed to squeak out, and the boy looked at me with sparkling eyes. A, hey, big sister, you don't know about Uoi, want me to teach you? When he found out I didn't know about you oil, he started getting excited. He apparently couldn't help talking about you oil. Wow, certainly. I'm a all yours. Why don't you tell me some more? Great. The boy, who had been anxiously staring at his mother's wound earlier, smiled and immediately grew lively. When his mother's treatment was finished, he tugged my clothes excitedly, leading me to a certain chamber. Inside, there was something like an altar and villagers were surrounding it standing hand in hand with their eyes closed as if meditating. Here, at the boy's voice, the villagers who'd been meditating stared at me in surprise. Th this, you brought the Count's envoy to this place. It's okay. I asked him to bring me here, I said, rushing forward. Because there was something I was very worried about at the back. It was like a simple shelf, but richly decorated. It looked like an altar to something. On the altar were arranged several sheets of paper with various things written on them and some dandelions. I looked at the words written on the paper. This was. I'd seen this sentence before. Tigasaka had written me along with Bash's letters when I'd first entered school. I was sure I'd said not to send me any more and sent them back all crossed out. Why were they in such a place? A shining golden baby. The text on the paper told the story of a golden baby born from a dandelion, who grew mugwort when their hand touched the earth for the first time. Mugwort was shaped like the hand of a golden baby, and after that was written the power of the mugwort that the golden baby gave. Its medicinal properties, it was written that mugwort could be used to stop bleeding and treat cuts. I looked at the other pieces of paper. Other medicinal herbs were written about in a similar manner. It seemed the golden baby Uoil had created a lot of the medicinal herbs in this world, 
Medicinal herbs were something I'd spoken to the villagers about when I was in Garigari village since they hadn't known how to deal with injuries or colds. I used to prepare medicinal herbs for them. More papers held writings concerning things like fields and livestock. All wisdom, bestowed by the golden baby on those who sought it for salvation. My hand holding the paper trembled involuntarily. That dot to Kasaku, i.e. Florence Nightingale, the famous 19th century nurse. 148. Return of the Lord's Adopted Daughter 8, a prayer for Saruseru village. As soon as the boy had gotten to the altar, he'd begun to meditate with clasped hands, so it was an old man nearby who answered my question. It was about a year ago. Before then, we'd heard about the teachings of Uoir, and our village was surviving by following her teachings. About a year ago we were told it was too sacred and dangerous to speak about and received this bundle of papers. Too sacred and dangerous. The boy who'd been praying to Uoir just now looked up at us cheerfully once his prayer was finished. That's right. Lord Uoir is too great. Actually, Uoir isn't their real name either. Their real name is a secret. They decided it was too holy and dreadful. <laughs> it's too holy and dreadful. Is it? Yeah. Not just that. But if you look directly at them, your eyes will be destroyed by the sacred light. How terrible. Seriously? I'm not that dreadful. Isn't this Lord you oil stuff really bad? Is it something to talk about with a smile? If you say their name, your mouth will rot, and if you look at them, you'll be blinded. Isn't that more like an evil god? Is that okay? If they use the word sacred they might think of it that way, but if you listen to the details, it's kind of a curse. I put the papers back on the altar with trembling hands and held my head. A. Eh? What was this? Why was this happening? At one point, yes, at one point I had caught the scent of the dubious religious organization Yeoi's teachings, and I'd raked the founder, Tigasaku, over the coals, and so I'd forbidden him to speak it out loud, or without my permission. We were good, maybe that's where this story about your mouth rotting if you talk about them? No, well, that's one thing, but if I was right, why had this paper shown up? It was true I'd allowed for it to be spread via writing but I was supposed to be managing the spread via writing. So far I hadn't granted Tigasaku permission. In fact, when I was at school, we'd had several exchanges. I marked up the stories Tigasaku wrote in red and sent them back, writing that the suspicious parts were no good. On the other hand, Tigasaku sent me the corrected ones back, with red lines on them. Think back on that. I thought again about what was written in this document. This was not the story Tigasaku had written after I banned him from speaking. It was a story that had been sent to me when I was in school. I'd crossed it out and told him not to send it to me anymore. Then returned it. Come to think of it. When he responded, he'd written a completely different story and sent it to me. But surely, surely not, Tigasaku. Did he think when I said, please don't send me this again, I meant, it's perfect. You don't need to send it to me anymore? No, it's already happened. So the cause didn't matter right now. It was already out in the wild. If this paper has spread even to this mountain pioneer village, it had probably spread to most places. However, since the villagers in the pioneer villages hadn't received education, they couldn't read the letters. Even if the letter was circulating, they shouldn't be able to grasp its contents in detail. Hey, hey, big sis. Can you read? Should I read it to you? A. You can read the letters on this paper? I asked fearfully. The reason I gave permission for Tigasaku to distribute written stories about Uoi was because the villagers couldn't read letters. I figured it would be difficult for it to spread with the same momentum as before. And if Tigasaku's dangerous delusion started to boil over on paper, I could quash it and stabilize his mood. But even such a little kid could read letters? That wasn't the pioneer village I knew. Of course, I can read. The boy stuck out his chest happily. His mother also came up behind him and chuckled in embarrassment. It's not perfect, but this story is a teaching we use to hear verbally, so the details are still in our heads. So it feels like we can read the letters somehow. Is that so? My understanding was naive. In my heart, I thought nobody would seriously listen to such a foolish story. After all, a golden baby, born from a dandelion, 
Wouldn't such a thing ordinarily be thought of as impossible? First off, mugwort was supposedly made by the golden baby, but it was already there. It originally grew by the roadside. I had underestimated Tigasaku's brainwashing ability. Also, everyone's extreme faith. Scary. Sooner or later they're going to start buying pans or something. As indulgences, don't go buying expensive pans, okay? Ah, for now. What should I do? What do I do with this altar? Or rather, this magnificent cave. Was this cave? This altar? Perhaps originally made to enshrine these pieces of paper? Yes, that's right. It's forbidden to touch on these teachings under the sun. We developed and enlarged these caverns that originally existed naturally. Because we really wanted to create a place to experience the teachings. Thinking about it carefully. It's thanks to maintaining the cave that houses this altar that we were able to survive and hide here from the demons. I should have expected it from Yuoi's teachings. They told us that so we would make places to protect us in times like these. The old man nearby told me cheerfully. No, I don't think Yuoi was thinking that far ahead. Okay, I was getting a headache. What should I do? This was really troublesome. As far as I could tell, my only salvation was that Yuoi was a mysterious person, and it wasn't being spread around that I was Yuoi. But if I left it like this, someday things would get serious. Supposedly your mouth would rot if you told the story of you or under the sun, so at least it wouldn't be able to spread into a big to-do, but I was sure the royal family would find out someday, what would the government think of the current religious situation, since I wasn't a magician. Right this instant, should I forbid them from spreading the teachings of you or I might be able to do so with the count's authority. For instance, I could light these papers on fire? I looked at the faces of the people around the altar once again, people praying earnestly, thankful for this refuge, villagers happy that they ended up with few victims, people offering tearful prayers of gratitude for Yuoi's guidance in sending the rescue from the Lord so quickly, children eagerly decorating the altar with dandelion flowers. It felt like the people who were chased from their village by the demons were somewhat at peace only within this room. I couldn't in this strange atmosphere. I couldn't just say, okay, okay, you oil is prohibited, no more, break it up, break it up. Or rather, if I said that, I was scared of what would happen next. Because, thanks to the teachings that Tigasaku spread, the village had been saved in an emergency. Also the existence of this cave and the teachings useful for treating injuries. Above all, the villagers relied on the existence of you oil in their hearts. If I took that away. I swallowed the saliva that had built up in my mouth, and gave a long sigh. I'd overlook it this once. At least until the furor over the demons caused by these heavy rains calmed down. Otherwise, after all, otherwise, it wouldn't be too late to reconsider you or again after this turmoil had calmed down. No, to be precise, it was already too late, but it should still be barely okay. It wasn't the time for the country to keep a close eye on these kinds of things. They'll overlook it in this troubled time. Once things are calm, I'll tie Tigasaku up and manage it somehow. Before the country becomes aware of it, I'll hide it. So for now, thanks to the evil god like Savior you or who'll rot your mouth if you speak their name, I'll just accept the good luck of Saruseru village escaping the worst case scenario. Let's do that. I mean, that's the only thing I can do. End of block 3.